Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Clark. Clark. Government Business Notes Motion Number One relating to hours of meeting. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Question is, uh, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't want to take up a long uh, period of the Senate's time, but I do think it does need. Uh, uh, it does need uh, some explanation. The government, what it uh, proposes to do is to provide extension of hours for Tuesday night till 10 uh, with a dinner break, plus Thursday night uh, extension of hours, which seems to suggest an open-ended Thursday night until we finish the legislative program as outlined, which consists of uh, a considerable number of bills. It is assumed that the, and the government may want to expand on that, that at, at a particular late point on Thursday night we may then adjourn and resume on Friday. Uh, we do need a clear indication from the government about uh, Friday. People do have matters that they need to arrange for travel. They do have appointments that they need to keep or abandon, as the case may be. The question, though, is so early in the legislative program we are now sitting additional uh, and extended hours uh, to deal with legislation, and therefore uh, the question uh, has to be answered. Uh, at asked and answered by the government whether and why all of these legislation, legislative items are of an urgent nature that do require to be completed in this week, or whether they can reasonably be with, uh, held over to the following sitting pattern, unless the government uh, does say this is the last week that we are going to sit, and it is an end of session uh, period. The government has been treating each week up to now, uh, it seems, as a uh, last week. Of sitting, we did that in the last period, and the government uh, uh, hasn't been able to say that it's business as usual. What we now have is a case where the government has got a significant number of bills with uh, to be uh, requested to be put through by uh, presumably Thursday night or early hours of Friday morning or Friday. And when you look at each of those bills, the, the government does need to make a case as to whether they are in fact urgent for this week and whether they do have a start-up date that requires those matters to be addressed. I do understand there is one, uh, the ACC, which we have received a briefing on, uh, but in respect of the others, uh, it could be said the Quarantine Commission of Inquiry Bill is one such bill, but the government does need to make a case for the remainder of the bills. If you look at the legislative package, even a Conservative estimate could put the hours somewhere between uh, 21 to 30-odd uh, hours of government business time to deal with that legislation, uh, providing uh, there is no hiccups, as the case may be. When you look at an ordinary uh, or a less than ordinary week of the Senate, government business takes up about 51 per cent of the time, which means that, roughly speaking, you're looking at uh, something in the order of 15-odd uh, hours of government time to be able to deal with legislation. It seems to suggest then that there is a, a huge gap between uh, what the government uh, expects and what the government wants in terms of the legislative program and the hours that are available to do that within. It's not a case that this Senate should be treated as a rubber stamp. Each bill needs to be considered carefully, needs to be debated and put and amendments made, uh, either argued for, carried or lost, as the case may be. But if the government is going to, be, uh, to maintain its position that all of these bills are required to be passed by 
Friday uh, without a justification as to their urgency and without a full explanation of why they then uh, are going to treat the Senate like a rubber stamp, then the government uh, in fact has treated the Senate, whether it wants to admit it or not, as a rubber stamp without ensuring the proper debate has uh, been undertaken. If you look at uh, the particular uh, issues, then, what the government has indicated is that, uh, if not in actual words, then in substance, it has got a program that would otherwise be an end-of-session program. And therefore, the government needs to make clear whether it is saying this is, in fact, the end of the session and that it doesn't expect that the Senate will resume in October. The, uh, what the government also should undertake to do is to prioritise the legislation, because the other question arises if, through the ordinary course of work on Friday, whether or not if the bills have not been completed, whether the government intends to continue to sit through Friday night or abandon the remaining uh, bills, uh, and if so, which ones. In other words, are they going to prioritise it or simply work through in seriatim in the way the list is dealt with? The opposition uh, has always taken the view and continues to take the view that we will work diligently with those pieces of legislation in this Senate to ensure that they are properly scrutinised and dealt with, and, where, uh, and we will not, uh, what others might argue, is uh, filibuster the legislative program. But it does seem to me that the government in this instance has bitten off more than it can chew when you look at that requirement of those bills that need to be dealt with, and without, may I say, a clear justification for every one of those bills. Without more, the uh, government does seem to be in a position where a less than desirable position. It either is not managing the program very well, or it is in fact treating it like an end of session. That's the position the government needs to explain to the Senate today. Thank you, Senator Brown. Acting Deputy President, this is the uh, government clearing the decks for the election, but uh, being rude and um, non-communicative um, in the process. There ought to have been an explanation from Senator Abetz at the start of this debate, not at the end. Um, Senator Ludwig's very right. We should know what the program is for Friday, if, if that's the intention. And uh, if it's not the intention, the Senate ought to have been given the courtesy of being told that. One would expect that um, from the government, but we don't get it. And if ever you needed a further example of why the government deserves to lose its uh, majority and its ability to uh, treat this Senate with contempt, here it is again. And so clearing the decks for the uh, election, that's written into this motion. Um, when we come back, uh, I expect the government will be on this side and in, and in smaller numbers. And we'll get back to discussing again uh, properly the programming uh, of Senate sitting so that the public gets the best out of them. And at the same time, senators are able to plan um, the, uh, tr the, the way in which we uh, are able to deal with legislation. Might I add, there's 33 pieces of legislation on this slate. Um, one or two have already been dealt with. The uh, role of the Senate as House of Review is to be able to go to the electorate and talk about uh, legislation and to come back uh, better informed and with amendments and uh, with a government that's able to take them into account. None of that's happening here. This is just a directive from the Prime Minister's office which says clear the slate on Thursday night or Friday and get us out of here so we can get ready for an election. And there's this uh, list of bills. The ministers are competing. They all want it through. And so this is the roughshod uh, way in which the government rides across uh, this a uh, very important part of the democratic system, this Senate, this House of Review. No, nothing about review in here. The public's locked out. The input uh, that we should have is not going to be available. There is no excuse for this. We have sitting days in October, November and December. 
if um, the government's of a mind to uh, wait that long, but of course it's not. And well, um, Senator Betts asked me when the election's going to be. It shows you how much out of the, uh, out of the uh, Prime Minister's circuit he may be. Uh, maybe that's because he mucked up so much the pulp mill motion yesterday. Um, I suppose uh, uh, acting deputy pro he, pro he protests about that, but um, we all know how badly he went yesterday. The, 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 but the point here is uh, this is a failure of the government to treat this Senate with the respect it deserves and to treat the public uh, with the consultation, to give the public the consultation they deserve. It's a pretty poor show for the last uh, sittings in this three year period of government, which began with the Prime Minister saying he would not treat the, ma the uh, majority he'd uh, so unexpectedly gained in the Senate. Uh, with hubris. We have seen hubris, contempt and dis uh, dismissiveness about the ability of this Senate to ad adequately uh, deal with the legislation it has. We will be dealing with it. We are ready. We have got no concerns about that. The government can bring on what schedule it likes. But, um, uh, well, Senator Abetz says, uh, what is the complaint? He has got a very, very short attention span. <laughs> acting uh, deputy president, but there you go. Um, the, uh, we might have begun with a little bit of um, common sense and decency here with an explanation from Senator Abetz about whether there's any intention to sit on Friday. We're not going to get that. We'll get a bit of bombast in a minute. But um, here it is uh, in this motion for everybody to see the contempt with which the Howard government has treated this Senate. And, uh, and another reason as to why it should lose its majority in here, and will do in the coming months. Thank you. Senator? Uh, thank you, Mr um, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Democrats wish to speak to this motion before us as well. Uh, as has been explained, it expands or extends the hours of sitting this week uh, so that we sit late tonight as well as a uh, open-ended adjournment on Thursday night and requires the Senate to consider 30 pieces of legislation that are listed here in the motion, uh, 30 bills, uh, only one of which I think has already been passed. We have had, as has been mentioned by previous speakers, uh, pretty much this um, attitude or treatment of the Senate since we came back in August that every week has been treated as, as almost like a de facto final sitting week, uh, just in case the government wants to call an election. Uh, so even back in that first fortnight in August, uh, we had uh, uh, extended sitting hours uh, to assist the government to push through things. Um, and of course, last week as well, we had extended sitting hours. This week, uh, even more extended sitting hours. Uh, we do have, of course, the Senate scheduled to sit in, uh, after a three-week break on the 15th of October. And we could sit uh, that week and indeed the next one and still have an election uh, before the end of the year on the, the 1st of December or the 8th of December, and certainly some people speculate that may still happen. Um, I'm one of those that have the view that it won't, but it doesn't really matter. It's not my decision. It's not Senator Abetz's decision or anybody else's. It'll be the Prime Minister's decision. Uh, and that, to me, brings up uh, a pretty key point that, that really should be made far more often, which is that we wouldn't have this continual, maybe we will, maybe we won't. How do we manage our business? Uh, do we need to rush through all this stuff now? Uh, have we got more time? Uh, if we had fixed terms, like we do now in a number of Australian states, uh, like they do in many other democracies around the world, uh, if we all knew when the election date was going to be well in advance, then we wouldn't have uh, this continual abuse of process using the possibility of an election uh, coming down the line as a reason for having to push things through or extend sitting hours or do all those other things. Uh, it is a cut and dried example of why it's in the public interest let alone the Senate's interest, uh, it's in the interest of good governance to have a fixed term uh, so that we know when we're going to be having the election, we know when the parliament will be prorogued, uh, we know how much longer we've got to deal with the business before it. Now, I, I don't blame, to some extent, the, the manager of government business in the Senate for, for wanting to get through uh, all of these pieces of legislation before the end of the week because um, it is quite possible that it will be the final sitting week. And 
the government, uh, manager of government whose business doesn't know. Uh, nobody knows in the government, I'm sure, of that, except possibly Mr Howard, and even he may well not have made up his mind yet. Uh, so in, in that very uh, narrow construct within uh, which the government manager of government business has to operate, it's good practice for him to push us all through, and I'm sure that's what he's being uh, directed to do in any case. Uh, but the key question is, is it good practice for the public? Uh, we are, with these 30 pieces of legislation that are listed here, uh, making laws. Uh, we're not just passing through some point scoring opportunities uh, or some things that you know, the government can tick on their resume saying we did this to help them with the election or for each of the rest of us here on the other side of the chamber to, to use as positioning opportunities to say we supported this, we opposed this, we tried to amend this. Uh, the key thing we're actually doing is passing laws and considering laws that affect people's lives directly. Uh, and it is simply bad process, bad governance uh, to be pushing through 30 pieces of legislation in three days uh, uh, on the Thursday night, some of them through, uh, at least under this motion, uh, probably well into the early hours of Friday. Uh, that is simply bad practice. And I, I just um, do not believe that any credible argument can be put to say that that's a good way to make laws. And it is worth noting that you know, this isn't just a one-off just for this week, putting through 30 bills in, in the space of a few days. Uh, I'd draw the um, public's attention, if not the Senate's, to uh, the very useful information that's provided by the Department of the Senate and the statistics of a uh, number of sitting days and number of pieces of legislation passed uh, each, um, uh, each sitting week and each year. And uh, the most recent edition of that going up to the um, end of last week, the 13th of September. Uh, we'd had just 37 sitting days uh, this year so far, not counting this week. And in that time, we'd, the Senate had passed 154 pieces of legislation. Now, I, I haven't done the maths precisely, but I think that's about four pieces of legislation a day. Uh, that, um, and of course, not all day, every day is spent considering legislation. So according again to the statistics there, uh, 85 hours and 53 minutes is the total amount spent on government business up to the end of last week. Uh, 85 hours and 53 minutes for 154 pieces of legislation. Now on top of that this week, uh, we'll add to those 37 sitting days with another four. So that'll be 41 sitting days and we'll add another 30 pieces of legislation. So that will go up to 184 pieces of legislation in 41 sitting days. Uh, and that most probably will be it for the year. Uh, outside chance that we might come back again after the election uh, if there's one early or an outside chance that we may come back again in three weeks time or three and a half weeks time uh, if the election isn't held till December and we'll potentially go through this again. Although quite what legislation we'll have left to deal with if we do come back in three weeks time I'm not so sure which is why I'm not terribly convinced we will be coming back, but uh, as I said, that's a bit of an academic debate. Uh, so the, the Democrats' core objection uh, isn't to any specific piece of legislation in the list. We can outline our objections in the debate on the pieces of legislation. We can move our amendments, as we will do. Our core objection is it compounds what is already a very poor record in terms of proper governance, due process and uh, good public administration. Uh, we will now have 184 pieces of legislation put through this chamber uh, in 41 sitting days. And that, uh, I believe, is not adequate. Now, of course, there's been Senate committee inquiries that have looked at some of them as well. Uh, and, uh, it's a matter of public record that some of those inquiries have been grotesquely inadequate and, frankly, um, contemptuous in themselves. Uh, but the simple core matter of uh, this Senate as a legislature and as a House of Review uh, is that its role is being debauched uh, by the politicisation, the political motivation, the uh, abuse of the Senate majority that the coalition now has. Uh, it shouldn't be any surprise that they're doing that. It was, of course, predicted that they would do that, and that's not a particular slur on the nature of politics uh, for people who uh, follow the Conservative parties. That's a natural commentary on human nature and the, the nature of politics. Any time you give a government control of both houses of parliament, they'll uh, use it to suit their own interests rather than look at the interests of the community. Uh, that is human nature. That is something that history shows us has happened many times before. It will continue to happen again uh, if the government maintains control uh, of the Senate after the election or uh, any government down the track of any particular political persuasion uh, doesn't have 
a House of Parliament such as the Senate that's able to provide some check and balance, some form of review uh, over what they're doing, uh, however imperfect it may be. And I certainly don't suggest that it um, has operated perfectly in that regard in the past, but it has certainly provided some uh, mechanism for improving legislation. And that, I think, is the key word, not just uh, reviewing and <coughs> holding up and examining it for an intellectual exercise, but improving the laws that we pass, uh, laws that I once again remind the Senate and the community uh, affect them directly and sometimes quite enormously and comprehensively, often for the good, which is why we do it. And I hope um, in an ideal world it would always be for the good. Uh, but uh, we would improve the positive impacts of the laws we pass uh, if we actually did our job properly and allowed proper times for scrutiny. Uh, you don't get that when you pass 184 pieces of legislation in 41 sitting days. You don't get it when you're passing 30 pieces of legislation in a week, and you don't get it when you're doing it at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, basically just shoveling through um, all of the leftovers so everybody can get the hell out of here and get back onto campaigning again. Uh, it's, it's not adequate. It's a compelling argument for uh, restoring the Senate back to being independent of the government at the, the day. And I should say, once again, it's also a compelling argument for why we need fixed terms. Um, something the Democrats have called for for many years and uh, certainly will continue to do so. The question is, Senator Betts. Uh, oh, did, did you? No. Senator Campbell. Sorry, you shut that a bit, Minister. Just briefly uh, to indicate that as far as the opposition is concerned, we don't believe the government has made a case for this proposed resolution or for these extended sitting hours this week. Uh, it has not demonstrated why there is urgency in respect to many of these bills, and one has to assume that the only reason we will, sitting, we will be sitting late tonight, we will be sitting late on Thursday night, and we will be sitting till Friday afternoon, is there is an intent to call an election between, sometime between that Friday and when the Senate is due to sit again in the middle of October. Otherwise, why the necessity to push through? many of these bills that do not have an urgency tag on them. The government has said to us that they want to finish Friday afternoon. Now we know, we know it is not possible on the basis of the hours allocated for these bills for those bills to be completed by Friday afternoon. Yet they have not identified to us which are the priority bills that they want to have dealt with. They're simply saying all of them are in the net and their intent is to finish all of them. What that will mean, if that's pursued, is that there will not be sufficient time to give these bills proper consideration by the Senate. Now, we have indicated we are not going to be steamrolled into passing legislation. We will deal with each bill on its merits, and we will deal with it in a considered way. We are not going to be steamrolled just to ensure that the government meets its objective of getting these 30 bills by Friday afternoon. As I have indicated, we do not believe that the government has made a case for these additional sitting hours, nor indeed has it attempted to make a case for these additional sitting hours. It is simply putting this resolution in here because it knows ultimately it has got the numbers to force it through and the forces to deal with these, bill these bills in that way. And I just wanted to make it clear on behalf of the opposition that we will be opposing the motion. Senator uh, Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy <coughs> President. Mr Acting Deputy President, anybody listening into this debate could be forgiven for thinking that uh, the Howard government has in fact steamrolled legislation through this Senate. Can I remind senators and all those that have contributed to this debate that have made this allegation that this is in fact a motion to extend the hours of sitting of the Senate. It will allow the Senate extra time above and beyond that which is usual. If the Howard government was so determined to use the Senate as a rubber stamp, not to listen to debate, why on earth is the government having to move and use its numbers against the opposition to give the opposition the extra hours of sitting. And that's the sort of humbug that unfortunately continually gets reported to the Australian people that we are treating the Senate as a rubber stamp when in fact we are the ones agitating to give the Senate more time to consider legislation. 
and indeed the Howard government's record is very instructive, Mr Acting Deputy President. Since 1901, in the 106 years since Federation, there have only been 30 packages of bills that have taken more than 20 hours in this Senate. 30 packages of bills or um, programs that have taken more than 20 hours of debate. Do you know how many of those packages have been under the Howard government in the past 10 years? 15 of them, half of them. So you see on the objective evidence that we as a government, the coalition, have been more than willing to allow the Senate time to consider matters which are of concern to it and to the Australian people. Half, half of the measures out of the 30 that have taken more than 20 hours to debate in this chamber have taken place during the 10 years of the Howard government. The other 15 <coughs> took place between 1901 and 1996. 95 years. That is how we as a government, coalition government, have treated this Senate with the respect that it constitutionally deserves, but of course democratically deserves as well. And so it is a very bizarre argument when those on the other side assert, we want more time, we need more time, but then come in here and say, we will vote down the government's motion to give them more time. And that is what they need to explain to the Australian people. In relation to the quite bizarre contribution, and we've become used to that, of Senator Bob Brown, I noticed Senator Carol Brown in the chamber, so I hasten to uh, make that very important distinction. <laughs> and uh, yes, indeed, you are right, Senator Birmingham, having given his spray, he now has left the chamber. Uh, and that is what we have come to expect from him. But uh, he has made some quite uh, bizarre uh, commentaries in, in relation uh, to this about the rude and non-communicative nature of uh, the government in relation to these measures. He knows, as well as anybody in this chamber, that the unsuspecting public listening in would not be aware of this that we have a very regular meeting of leaders and whips that includes the Greens, the Democrats, Family First, Labor Coalition, and we seek to go through the measures and the management of the Senate. And what has happened here is we had such a meeting, the Greens were represented, they were given a list of the bills, and we did discuss why the government wanted these measures put through. And so to mischievously suggest to the Australian people that we have just dumped this motion in without explanation, unfortunately, is misleading. I am not allowed to say deliberately misleading, but, but I know that he knows the procedures and he hopes that the Australian people listening in, in fact, don't. The bills that we have given notice of now some days ago and in this motion, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, contain a lot of budget measures, and uh, most senators both sides would agree that it is important to get budget measures through. There is a substantial amount of non-controversial legislation as well. And it was instructive, and uh, Senator Bartlett uh, did avert to the fact as, I think, a weak point, but I accept that he at least had the integrity to mention this, that nobody in the debate averted to a single piece of legislation that required urgent or detailed consideration in the list that we had provided and uh, provide objection to. So, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, we as a government are not treating the Senate as a rubber stamp. We are, in fact, proactively moving to give the Senate more time to consider the legislation. See, on the one half, the Labor Party says it's a government that's run out of puff. On the other hand, they say we're putting too much legislation forward. Well, make up your mind which is it. 
we are still uh, legislating for the benefit of the Australian people, and all the arguments we heard this morning or this afternoon are exactly the same arguments we heard about a fortnight ago when exactly the same considerations were uh, being put forward. So, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, I would encourage all senators to vote for this motion, which will in fact give the Senate more time, I stress, more time to consider the legislation that's before us. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Betts relating to the hours of sitting of the Senate be agreed to. Those opinions say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Ring, division required? Ring the bells. Betz's motion relating to
Lock the doors. The question is that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Parry teller for the ayes and Senator Campbell teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division, there being 34 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Um, Clark. Government business notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Abetz for the introduction of the bill and for its exemption from the provisions of Standing Order 111. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to notice, I move that a the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes, and b the provision of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill, allowing it to be considered during this period of sittings. Question is the question is that that mo sorry, Senator Bartlett. Uh, Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, just wanted to speak briefly to this motion as well, and particularly Part B of it. Obviously, I'm not objecting to the minister introducing a bill. He can introduce whatever bill he likes. Um, but Part B of it is to exempt it from the cutting or cut-off order so that it can be considered during this period of sittings, which, as we've just been debating, means considering it during this week. And it, it has, is amongst the list of 30 bills that um, has just been covered by the previous motion. Um, I did want to speak to it singly as this single motion just to make the point uh, or reinforce the point that I was making previously. Uh, I'm not passing comment on whether the legislation is a good bill or a bad bill, not least because I haven't seen it yet because it hasn't been introduced. I've just been given a 30-second uh, rundown by uh, my colleague Senator Stott Despoir about uh, um, what may or may not be in it and some of the issues that may or may not be raised in it. But obviously, with the Crime Commission Amendment Bill, it deals with criminal law and uh, there are some important issues of due process uh, that can be involved there. So I again, just simply raise the point that um, however completely sure the government is that they're doing the right thing, and this is fabulous stuff and completely necessary, um, to be uh, introducing a bill to be uh, exempting it from the cutoff forthwith so that it has to be debated um, within the space of a couple of days on an issue that um, uh, could well be uh, or containing issues that could well be ones that, that do require uh, some degree of more careful consideration, if only for no other reason than to ensure the stated policy intent uh, is actually what will incur and there aren't unintended consequences. Because I think that's the aspects of pushing things through this chamber that's often not given the focus it deserves. It's not just about those of us uh, in the opposition party saying we don't like this bill being rushed through because we don't like this bill or we don't like the policy behind it. Um, I'm sure that happens from time to time. It is also about 
uh, and it often is. We fully agree with the stated intent here. Uh, we're not sure about what's being put forward will achieve that ends, or even more frequently, we're concerned that alongside achieving that ends, there may be some other unintended consequences because it hasn't been thought through, and thought through enough. Um, we haven't had enough time to examine it and particularly haven't had enough time to hear from people with expertise in the community. Um, all knowledge and wisdom doesn't reside in this Senate chamber, even though we all may talk like it does from time to time. Uh, there are many people in the community who do have expertise in a range of areas, including the areas covered by this legislation, and uh, to not allow ourselves the opportunity to uh, properly hear from those people uh, is, again, I think a, a dangerous process to follow, just in terms of good public policy um, and ensuring that uh, the, the public, the, the people who we're meant to be doing all this for, uh, aren't inadvertently um, negatively affected by what we're putting through. So I, I raise that concern on behalf of the Democrats. Uh, the cut-off motion itself uh, is uh, a creation of the Democrats initially. Uh, my predecessor from Queensland, Senator Michael Macklin, back in the 1980s, uh, and it was agreed to back then uh, by the Liberal opposition as a good idea, uh, as a bit of a safeguard against this sort of thing happening, unless there was uh, good enough reasons put forward as to why it's desirable, and oftentimes good enough reasons are put forward. Maybe there are good reasons on this occasion, and the, the Minister thought they were so overpoweringly obvious that he didn't need to outline them, but uh, I um, think it would be uh, beneficial for those sorts of reasons to be outlined before the Senate gave that sort of open-ended um, tick, even though I accept in effect we sort of already had with the previous motion being passed. Thank you, Senator Bartlett. So the question, Senator Stop the Spire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise also to uh, endorse the comments of, uh, of uh, uh, Democrat Whip Senator Bartlett in relation to this debate. There's a couple of key issues here, not only the alacrity with which we are dealing with this uh, important, um, arguably urgent, certainly from the government's perspective, clearly, uh, legislation. This legislation, and I say this based on uh, the fact that, yes, the Office uh, of uh, the uh, Attorney-General has kindly organised and offered a briefing uh, this morning uh, to my office. Um, that's uh, still relatively short notice, I might add, uh, for the record, because we are dealing with a piece of legislation that is being introduced. and exempt from the cut-off and probably will be debated today. The first minor office was uh, aware of this legislation was this morning, uh, my leader's office uh, around 8 o'clock last night. I acknowledge and I just uh, uh, believe that there's been a statement of uh, reasons tabled in this place uh, yesterday, I believe. But regardless of this time frame, I think the chamber can agree this is a very fast process. Now, that would be okay on Perhaps two grounds. Yes, one, if urgency is put forward and um, and accepted, and and secondly, depending on the complex or other nature of a piece of legislation. Now, a cursory look, um, and with the benefit uh, only now of a briefing, suggests that this bill is quite controversial, has huge legal implications, not just for cases that uh, may or may not be underway, but it also deals with a fundamentally controversial and debatable principle in this place, certainly, Mr Acting Deputy President, from the perspective of Australian Democrats, and that is the issue of retrospectivity generally and retrospectivity specifically in relation to criminal law. Now, we have put on record many times in this place our concerns with, in fact, downright objection to retrospectivity in legislation. We've often considered it also a fundamental human right not to be subject to retrospectivity uh, in uh, retrospective criminal sanction. And that's what my understanding of this legislation, that's what this legislation is about. So when we're talking about these broad-ranging, fundamental, complex concepts, there is a very strong argument for the parliament taking some time to analyse to scrutinise this legislation. And to me, that is not being informed yesterday, or indeed this morning, having a debate about exempting that bill from the cut-off provision now—and when I say debate, so far there have been uh, two speakers 
in this debate, myself and Senator Bartlett, uh, in, in terms of uh, concerning the exemption. I'm not sure what the, um, the official position is of the, uh, the opposition. I think, like us, they're still getting their heads around what is quite uh, a controversial piece of legislation. But then, Mr Acting Deputy President, I look on the notice paper and it's, it's what, the third bill up. So we're going to essentially be debating this legislation today. Now, I know that's been put forward in the debate that's occurred previously through the minister, certainly Senator Abetz, uh, and, uh, and more generally, publicly, by the government, that there is, uh, you know, that the Senate mandate, that the dominance of this place, that the numbers are being used wisely, and, and uh, you know, that it's about putting forward a, a, a policy agenda. This is not putting forward a policy agenda. This is ramming through legislation. We're back in sausage factory mode. And it's unacceptable, Mr Acton Deputy President. And it may be that we're all wrapping up because we've got an election that's about to take place. But, and, and through you, I'll take any interjection, Mr Acton Deputy President, from Minister Abetz, because I don't know if he's read the bill. It may be a seven-page bill, but it has huge ramifications. It's removing safeguards that are not only procedural, but form part of the substantive process in an examiner being satisfied that a summons or notice to produce ought to be issued. They're fundamental legal concepts, people. Oh, mutter, mutter, mutter. Through you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The minister may mock and belittle me if he likes, but I actually care passionately about the role of this place. Well, I was I was not. <coughs> point the point. first conversation was with the the government whip, and point the other order. one was with one of the advisers. No point of order. And, and no what is happening order. is, unfortunately, the record is going to There's be no misleading. Senator Stott Spoyer. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm happy to accept and indeed withdraw that uh, that allegation against the minister if he indeed was in, uh, as he says, deep conversation with the whip. But maybe he could stop interjecting or talking while other members of the Senate are speaking, because I'm not sure if he and others on his front bench. And there are some learned you know, legal minds on that front bench. I can see one standing up right now, who, um, and that is meant as a compliment. Notice he took it too. <laughs> but there are minds on that front bench, as indeed there are on the other side, that will recognise that we are dealing with some complex issues that have wide-ranging obligations. Now, I understand that the government's going to put forward or will put forward a case of urgency in relation to this bill. Well, then let's have some time to debate it, not just on the floor of this chamber now in this cut-off debate, not just in the committee stage of the bill. Give us some time to consult. Give us some time to consult with the legal brains out there. And of course, my office has been doing that hurriedly, specifically dealing with the uh, uh, the, the, the case that uh, has brought about this uh, this so-called uh, uh, necessary and urgent change of law. But there are other organisations. I want to know what the law council thinks. I want to know what other learned and community minds are thinking about this legislation. And anyone who has been in this place, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, and dealt with uh, whether it's Crime Commission law or the act that precedes it, or even been on, uh, organisation, uh, been on committees like the NCA committee, as I was for a period of time, will understand that even the basis of, of that legislation, the basis of those acts, have some fairly vexed and controversial principles uh, in them. And this builds on, this deals with one of those very sections that is quite that is quite, uh, quite concerning. So, Mr Acton, Deputy President, uh, I appeal to the Senate now. In fact, I'm happy to move uh, on my feet an amendment that the bill be considered later in this week. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to move that on behalf of uh, the Australian Democrats. We're not seeking to delay this process unnecessarily. We're not seeking to prevent the legislation being debated. I understand that we need to deal with the cut-off provision uh, motion, but I'm appealing to senators on all sides now in the interests of scrutiny, fair debate, ensuring that this legislation is looked at properly, that we all have the opportunity to consult with relevant authorities, consult with relevant community groups, consult with relevant legal avenues. Would you consider that this legislation is delayed to a later hour of not this day but another day because it is third on the notice paper for today, third on the red? That is unacceptable given that we have just had briefings and just been informed in the last less than 24 hours really 
of, uh, of, of this piece of legislation, less than 24 hours seeing this legislation. So I appeal to my colleagues uh, and I'm happy to take sorry, your advice. Chair. Order, order, Senator Dr Spoyer. Uh, the chair nor the whips have a copy of your amendment and that is necessary for us to proceed. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. I only wanted to speak on the exemption from the cutoff. Uh, in terms of the exemption from the cutoff, uh, Labor has been dealing with the legislative program as, uh, as, uh, as ordinary pieces of legislation. It's not unusual for the government to ask for an exemption from the cutoff in relation to a bill that they can justify is urgent. I understand that the government has been able to make a case uh, that this is a, an urgent uh, a bill that should be put on the legislative program for this week, as I understand it. I'm not going to gavel with that. The uh, exemption from the cutoff is to ensure that the program is not uh, unduly uh, loaded up at the end of a session, uh, and, it's, and it allows, uh, in this instance, bills to be able to be dealt with in the ordinary, ordinary way. Uh, if I take that uh, broad view, then what the government is asking for is that this bill be exempt from the cutoff, so it can be dealt with that way. Uh, therefore, it's not an uh, unusual process. The more unusual process is, of course, the one motion we just lost uh, a little while ago, but I won't need to go there uh, in any substantive way other than to remind the Senate that this does add one more bill to the program uh, that, needs, that the government uh, does see a need to finalise this week, it appears, but uh, Labor has indicated that it will continue to deal with the bills in the usual way and address them on their merits as they arise. I won't go to the merits of the ACC bill itself. It is a matter that will come up in due course where we can address uh, the substantive issues that are associated with the bill itself. It's not appropriate uh, or not needed. I should, perhaps I should more qualify in this debate to raise those matters. It is uh, broadly a bill that deals with, as I understand it, a, uh, a, uh, an amendment to ensure that there is uh, that the uh, Australian Crime Commission can deal with their usual summonses processes. The EM explains that uh, adequately, it appears, and the government will obviously support uh, their position and demonstrate the need for urgency for the bill. On that basis, uh, Labor won't pay, oppose the exemption from the cutoff. Order. Senator Dr Spoyer, having discussed your amendment with the clerks, do you still wish to proceed? Mr Acting Deputy President, I think that my amendment is not going to go very far. I think I should probably seek leave to withdraw my uh, verbal amendment, only because I don't think there is a form of words that would satisfy the Senate. Um, perhaps I could suggest that now the onus is on government to see if they could accommodate my very reasonable request. Uh, otherwise, it may be possible for uh, a fellow colleague to perhaps move to adjourn this debate, but I'd rather see an outcome that uh, relies on discussion and negotiation. So I'm not sure if the minister has something he can offer us, but I will withdraw the amendment that uh, I made on my feet. Thank you, Senator Stockbot. Stop this boy. Is leave granted with the withdrawal? There'd be no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Abetz. If I might make a, a brief statement by leave, I understand having moved the motion, I'm not necessarily entitled to speak further. But uh, if I am Is provided with leave, I thank granted. the Senate. Can I uh, quickly granted. indicate it to Senator Stop to spoil that, as Senator Ludwig indicated, this is a matter of some urgency. I understand that some, one, some hundreds of summonses uh, could be impacted uh, by uh, the potential difficulty that is being confronted, a lot of investigations, etc. That is why it is urgent. There is an urgency in relation to it being introduced here, going to the House of Reps and then back here. Having said all that, what I will undertake to do is to uh, seek how we can change it within the legislative timetable uh, to give some more time um, uh, to the uh, senators that want more time. So, uh, without making any promises, I do undertake to uh, approach the attorney and uh, the Minister for Justice to see what can be done. So, effectively, you are closing the debate, Senator Abetz? Yes. Thank you. So, the question is the motion moved by Senator Abetz to be agreed to. Those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Abetz. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and 
be now read a first time. Question. Does that motion be agreed to? That opinion to say aye. That's against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes. Senator Betts. I table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? The question is that motion be agreed to. That opinion say aye. That's against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Betts. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Question. Does that motion be agreed to? Those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Betts. And uh, finally, I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Does that motion be agreed to? Those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business order of the day number one: Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill Number One, 2007, in committee. Okay. The uh, committee is considering the Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1 2007 and Amendments No. 7 and 8 on Sheet 5324R, moved by Senator Murray. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, I uh, wish to withdraw Amendment 8, and I have spoken to uh, Amendments uh, 7 and 9. Um, so I would ask that uh, those be put um, consecutively. Um, I, I'd remind the, the chamber, although I'm sure uh, they're aware of it, uh, Amendment 7 uh, referred to unfair contracts uh, and uh, Amendment 9 uh, related to the um, recommendation arising from the effectiveness of the Trade Practices Act 1974 in protecting small business. That's the Economic References Committee uh, report of March 2004. Order, uh, Senator Murray, you require leave to withdraw Amendment No. 8? I, I ask leave, yes. Yes, is leave granted? There have been objection, leave is granted. Senator I, Murray. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I just remind the um, Chamber that uh, the um, Amendment 9 refers to that Senate report's recommendation 7, um, which was that subsections 51 AC 9 and 10 of the Act be repealed. Um, I don't need to say any further on those, those amendments. Senator Murray, do you wish to move them separately because you haven't moved number 9 yet? Uh, I'll move both 7 and 9 and I'll move them separately. Thank you. So the question is the amendment number seven, the Senator no, Minister. I want to speak to uh, number nine. Yep. No, we're dealing with seven at the moment. So, so the question is that the amendment number seven, moved by the Australian Democrats, Senator Murray, be agreed to. That, that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no, no. I think the noes have it. No. Senator Murray, could you now move nine? You have moved num num number nine. Thank you, Senator Murray. Do you wish to speak to it, Senator Murray? I uh, well, just uh, to explain uh, briefly, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I said, it arose from uh, recommendation uh, seven of the Senate March 2004 report, uh, and I won't uh, recap uh, all the arguments in its in its favour, uh, but. Um, it dealt with unconscionable conduct, uh, and the uh, ACCC uh, agreed with the view that uh, the present uh, limit of $3 million um, was too low. Uh, and uh, I'll quote from the, the report, uh, the ACCC agreed with this view, saying that subsection 51 AC3A already stated that the courts may have regard to the relevant relative strengths of the bargaining positions of the companies, so no threshold is necessary. Uh, the committee noted these arguments and further noted that subsections 51 AC1 and 2 exclude publicly listed companies from the protection of the section. The committee agrees that the removal of the thresholds will not reduce the current protection for small businesses and will enhance protection for businesses involved in transactions over $3 million who are nevertheless subject to unconscionable conduct within the terms of Section 51AC. Uh, the government senators uh, rejected that view, but accepted the view that uh, the uh, threshold was too low. Uh, and I'll quote from the government senators' uh, uh, remarks. Government senators not persuaded of the need to lift the ceiling so as to extend the protection of the section to all firms, irrespective of size, 
On the other hand, we are concerned that the current statutory ceiling may be unrealistically low, given the size of transactions which some small businesses undertake. Accordingly, we recommend that the government consider prescribing $10 million as the relevant amount for the purpose of the section. Now, that is a good advance. Uh, we accept that's a good advance. Um, and the government itself has accepted the recommendation of the government senators, uh, but we still hold to the view of the original committee recommendation. Senator Sherry. Yes, thank thank you. you. I'll be brief. Uh, Labor will be supporting a Democrat amendment. I gave my reasons last night. We're under time pressure, so I won't repeat myself. Thank you. Minister uh, Senator Brandis. Mr Chairman, the government uh, does not support the amendment uh, because it loses sight of the fact that the particular purpose of Part 4A of the Trade Practices Act is to provide a code of protection for small businesses. And if there is no ceiling on the value of transactions to which the unconscionable conduct provisions of the Act apply, then it entirely loses its character as uh, a set of provisions uh, which is particularly concerned with the problems of small business and uh, dealing with issues like inequality of bargaining power and so on. So, uh, as Senator Murray has rightly pointed out, the government senators did recommend, and the government has adopted the recommendation, the ceiling be lifted uh, very substantially to $10 million. And you can always have a debate about how high a ceiling should be, but that's, this is not that debate. What this debate is about amounts to uh, saying the, uh, the proposition that the provisions of Part 4A of the Act ought to be of general application, whether it's to the biggest multinational company in the world trading in Australia or the local garage. We think that loses sight of the purpose of the provision and therefore we don't support it. Thank you, Senator Brandis. So the question is that Senator Murray's amendment on behalf of the Democrats number nine be agreed to. That's been to say aye. That's against saying no. no. I think the no's have it. No's have it. Senator Murray, Democrat amendment number ten. Thank you, sir. Um, I move uh, Democrat Amendment number 10, which is on sheet uh, 5324 revised. Uh, this uh, amendment uh, relates to uh, divestiture uh, provisions for the abuse of market power, uh, and it's been drafted to deal with uh, section 46 because that is the direction of the majority Senate report, which I referred to earlier. Uh, the uh, chamber is well aware uh, because they have heard me on the matter before, uh, that I, I do in fact admire the general intent of the American antitrust um, and divestiture provisions. I think as a reserve power they've been extremely effective uh, and act uh, to, to uh, allow for circumstances where great power uh, is used for anti-competitive or monopolistic purposes. Um, to be uh, reduced, uh, and I think that's, that's an appropriate um, tool for the ACCC to have. The Senate report said that divestiture powers are powers which enable a court to order the dominant corporation be broken up into several smaller corporations in order to prevent the anti-competitive domination of a market by one player. Such powers are currently available under Section 81 of the Act, but cannot be applied to creeping of acquisitions nor to offences under Section 46. And that, as a reminder, my amendment deals with Section 46. The committee considers that the application of Section 81 should be expanded so that divestiture becomes a remedy for other breaches of the Act, including Section 46 misuse of market power and any new section introduced in line with the committee's recommendation 12 relating to the regulation of creeping acquisitions. As divestiture is quite a severe, uh, is a quite severe remedy. Sorry to quote them accurately. It is appropriate to provide warning mechanisms to ensure that a corporation which is, is expanding its business is able to comply with its obligations under the Act. A suitable warning mechanism could be based around a trigger market concentration. This trigger should not operate as a de facto cap on market share. Rather, it would require companies proposing acquisitions in concentrated industries to notify the ACCC. The Commission would then assess whether the acquisition would result in a substantial lessening of competition. The Committee notes that this already occurs in the retail grocery industry. And then the recommendation of the Committee was recommends that Section 81.1 of the Act be amended so that Section 81 can be applied where a corporation is found to contravene Section 46, Section 46A or any new section introduced to regulate creeping acquisitions. I have attempted to move towards 
uh, fulfilling the, um, the, the legislative environment which that recommendation anticipates. I so move. Thank you. Senator Sherry. Thank you. Labor does not support this amendment. Labor believes the current penalties for a breach of the anti-competitive provisions of the Trade Practices Act are adequate, other than the lack of criminal penalties for serious cartel conduct, which were promised by the government back in February 2005. These penalties include fines of $10 million for corporation or half a million dollars for individuals for each breach. In addition, sanctions against company directors and officers of a company for example, disqualification and a prohibition on indemnity for financial liability and legal costs may also be imposed by the court. Thank you. Minister Senator Brandes. Um, Mr Chairman, the government doesn't support this amendment. The issue um, uh, was considered uh, by the Dawson report and uh, uh, Mr Dawson um, uh, recommended against it. I should point out, though, to Senator Murray, well, to the Senate, that the Act does contain divestiture powers in section 81. But those divestiture powers apply expressly to section 50. And the reason or the logic of having divestiture powers for section 50, which deals with anti-competitive acquisitions, but not having divestiture powers for section 46, which deals with misuse of market power, is that by, uh, by um, committing a breach of section 50, what the corporation does is ex hypothesi to acquire an anti-competitive market share and therefore there is a logic in having a power to require it to divest of though that additional acquisition because the acquisition itself is the very uh, conduct um, which uh, the Act um, in, the, in the relevant circumstances stipulates against. But in section 46, what one is looking at is not the anti-competitive acquisition of market power, but the anti-competitive use of market power, which is not the product of an acquisition, but the product of conduct in a given market. And it's the government's view, as it was uh, Mr Dawson's view, that the existing sanctions regime, which you'll remember, Senator Murray, was very significantly tightened uh, by the so-called Dawson amendments. Uh, um, is a sufficient deterrent and corrective for misuse of section uh, a, a misuse of market power, which section 46 um, would um, render unlawful. May I remind you that the um, uh, that the penalty that can be uh, imposed upon a corporation for a section 46 breach includes a fine of up to 10 million dollars per breach. 5% uh, of the corporation's turnover or three times the economic value of the transaction which is attacked in the section 46 proceedings per breach. That's in addition to the remedies under section 80 uh, for, an in for injunctive, injunctive relief uh, and the various other ancillary remedies um, in part 6 of the Act. So for all of those reasons, we, uh, the government's view is that the, the, the armoury of sanctions in relation to section 46 is, is sufficient and indeed very strong and for the other reason I gave earlier in these remarks there is a certain illogic in applying beyond the, a breach of section 50 the divestiture powers. Thank you Senator Brandis. So the question is the amendment number 10 moved by Senator Murray on behalf of the Democrats relating to divestiture be agreed to. That those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Murray, amendment number 11. Thank you, sir. I uh, move uh, item 11, uh, which is the last of my amendments on sheet 5324 revised. Uh, this too uh, relates um, to a theme of mine which I have uh, pursued over time uh, in this place um, and uh, relates to uh, some uh, com competition law uh, which uh, I admire uh, in other jurisdictions. I am, of course, uh, referring uh, to the device used uh, in the Fair Trading Act of the United Kingdom, uh, whereby they use uh, trigger concentrations of market power 
to institute a process which could be colloquially uh, described as market watch. Uh, they uh, are alert to the fact that uh, great power, great commercial power, when accumulated, uh, may not uh, be illegal. Uh, it may not, uh, in fact, be contrary to the interests of the society or economy, but it deserves to be watched in, in a manner uh, which allows uh, for uh, the competition authorities to be fully uh, informed uh, in greater detail than is available uh, through um, through the normal market processes of market disclosure, uh, particularly for publicly listed companies. Uh, the amendment, as uh, I have attempted to, to design it, uh, as usual with uh, legal assistance, um, only applies to state, territory and national markets. That's an important consideration because, of course, uh, the market definition was quite properly changed in our uh, competition law uh, following a joint house inquiry, I think, in 1997, uh, which recommended that markets in Australian competition law no longer be defined as national, uh, but as, as applicable um, mm -hmm. in, in uh, a regional as well as uh, a, a larger market sense. In, in practical terms, I would anticipate that the companies involved would provide disclosure of relevant information to the ACCC uh, and the ACCC Triple C would assess that information to identify trends which may suggest uh, areas where um, greater care uh, should be taken with respect to competitive activity. And if such trends were identified, then a more detailed scrutiny may occur, uh, much in the same way as, the, uh, as ASIC uh, monitors particular trends uh, under its jurisdiction. It's essentially an ACCC watching brief over highly concentrated markets uh, that I am recommending. And uh, I think that would be uh, to the advantage, not the disadvantage, uh, of our economy. Uh, it would obviously need the ACCC to uh, take note of how other jurisdictions, such as the United Kingdom, operate. Uh, it does seem to be a practical, effective uh, and uh, responsible market measure uh, as used in the United Kingdom and I am suggesting it could uh, be useful in our own legal concept. I so move. The Senator Sherry. Thank you. Labor does not support this amendment. Um, Labor believes these amendments are just too onerous on the ACCC and may result in unnecessary monitoring of markets without a competition problem. Mm -hmm. Labor believes that price monitoring should be focused and occur where there is a problem in a particular market. Minister. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, before I begin, can I mention, I, I think I misspoke in my last contribution when I said that the, one of the pecuniary penalties for Section 46 breach was 5% uh, of turnover. It is, of course, 10% of turnover. So, so allow me to correct myself. 10%. Um, now, the government doesn't support this amendment for much the same reasons as indicated by uh, Senator Sherry. Um, I, I might point out, uh, Madam Chairman, that uh, the uh, amendment is not limited as to jurisdiction, so that any market, no matter how uh, small by value or turnover, uh, would appear to be caught by it, so long as any corporation operating within that market attained a market share of 25 per cent. Uh, the markets are, um, uh, to which the amendment is directed uh, down to state and territory markets. So theoretically, uh, you might have um, uh, the market in Alice Springs for um, for um, uh, um, snack bars, uh, in which one snack bar had more than 25 per cent of the uh, market share, and uh, under the terms of um, this amendment, uh, the ACCC would be required to monitor it. In fact, it would be required to monitor any market in which there was any reason to believe that any corporation trading in it would pass the threshold or trigger point of 25 per cent. It would constitute the ACCC. It, it would so vastly expand the. Um, obligations of the ACCC uh, as to be, um, with respect, nonsensical, and uh, we regard it, uh, as does Senator Sherry, as not a workable proposition. And we uh, do consider that the powers of the Minister to direct price monitoring, monitoring under Section 95ZF work well. Thank you. The question is that Democrat Amendment Number 11 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Sherry. 
Thank you. By leave, I'll move four, five, and six on sheet five, three, four, four together. Is leave granted. Being no objection, leave is <coughs> granted. Senator Sherry. Uh, thank you. Uh, Labor's amendment deals with the issue of the 10 million threshold for Section 51AC unconscionable conduct. Um, Labor's amendment, to, oh, sorry, the the, uh, the three million thresholds abolished for Section 51AC unconscionable conduct, and the bill proposes to increase this to 10 million. The 2004 Senate Economics Committee majority report into the Trade Practices Act recommended that the three million limit be abolished. Labor agrees with this uh, recommendation as a threshold is arbitrary and unconscionable conduct should be illegal regardless of the size of the transaction or the businesses involved. Labor's amendment ensures that all small business transaction will be covered as there are circumstances in which the transaction may be more than $10 million. Hence our amendment to remove it. Minister. Madam Chairman, this is substantively the same as uh, the Australian Democrat amendment, which was deliberated upon a few moments ago, and for the same reasons the government uh, does not support it. The question is that opposition amendments four to six be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Senator Sherry. Um, I'll move. Uh, for the record, just mention the Australian Democrats support those amendments. Thank you, Senator Sherry. Good. Thank you, Madam. Uh, <coughs> and thank you, Senator Murray. Um, <coughs> amendment seven. I'll move Amendment seven on sheet five three four four. It's the final amendment. Uh, Labor's amendment does two things. Firstly, it allows Section one five five powers to remain following the commencement of an action seeking an injunction, and only cease when the substantive case commences. Uh, Labor's amendment will allow the ACCC's information gathering powers under section 155 to remain following the commencement of an action seeking an, in an injunction and only cease when the substantive case commences. This is vital to ensuring that the ACCC has the information gathering powers for as long as possible to ensure it can act to protect small business and consumers from anti-competitive conduct. Secondly, it provides the Federal Magistrates Court jurisdiction over section 46 and section 83 cases. Uh, the amendment will provide the Federal Magistrate, Magistrates Court jurisdiction over section 46 and section 83 cases. Currently, the Federal Magistrates Court can hear certain matters under the TPA, most notably section 51 cases. The Magistrates Court cannot hear section 46 matters, however. This means that small business wishing to bring an action under section 46 must commence in the federal court. The federal court is more expensive than the magistrate's court. The magistrate's court also provides a conciliation process that would be of particular use to small business. In addition, under section 83 of the Act, a company can bring an act action for damages based on findings of fact in another case. For example, if the ACCC brings a successful action against a company under section 46, small business can bring an action for damages based on the findings of fact in the case. However, this section 83 action must be brought in the federal court. This amendment would provide small business with better access to compensation and justice when they suffer from anti-competitive conduct. Senator, <coughs> Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting. Sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, this, these amendments uh, comply with the thrust of recommendations uh, in the Senate uh, March 2004 Economic References Committee report, uh, and recently there was uh, an inquiry by the Senate Economics Committee into another trade practice bill that's on its way uh, to uh, uh, address the issues of a small business with respect to the secondary boycott provisions and representative action. Uh, and evidence to that committee indicated uh, that small business continues to support the view uh, that the federal magistrate's court should be uh, uh, available uh, for uh, actions to be taken um, on, on account, uh, on two counts basically, uh, a lower cost and speedier access to justice. Senator Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Madam. Um, Chairman, um, in relation to opposition amendment uh, number seven, the government doesn't support this amendment, although I find myself a little embarrassed because um, the government senators in the um, 
2004 report um, were rather persuaded to that view. But nevertheless, nevertheless, that it, it, it does really um, involve a very, very narrow point. You don't, um, uh, through you, Madam Chairman, define substantive proceedings, Senator Sherry. But what I take it you mean by substantive proceeding is the proceeding um, from the time after which an action has commenced by the filing of an application. And as you'd be aware, Senator, the Federal Court held as long ago as 1980 in Bramble's Holdings and the Trade Practices Commission that once an action had been commenced um, under um, uh, Part 4, then that was the end of the Section 155 powers. There's a reason for that, and that is because there is under the Federal Court rules a suite of uh, interlocutory uh, uh, proceedings, including discovery, uh, um, uh, interrogation, uh, the exchange of witness statements, um, uh, and, and so on, which deal with the matter. So um, the only occasion to, to, on which uh, your amendment might operate is in the very, very narrow and limited circumstances contemplated by the ACCC at paragraph 5 point, in the submission quoted at paragraph 5.27 of the 2004 report where the ACCC were seeking in a very urgent case an interim injunction, that is an injunction sought before the substantive application had been filed um, and sought to augment that with section 155 powers as well. Uh, that very seldom happens uh, and one would imagine that in a, the only case in which one would seek an interim injunction as opposed to an interlocutory injunction after the filing of an application would be in circumstances of such extreme urgency that there wouldn't be time for there to be a section 155 examination usefully to be conducted in any event. So uh, um, I think theoretically uh, you may be right, Senator Sherry, but it's the government's view that given the narrowness, the almost theoretical narrowness of the circumstances in which the amendment would have any operation, um, it, is, it is scarcely worth doing. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Sherry. I should have replied to, uh, to you as well on uh, your final amendment, uh, the amendment to include matters arising under section 46 within the jurisdiction of the Federal Magistrates Court. Now, um, can I tell you, Senator Sherry, the reasons that you advance um, uh, that um, this would make uh, proceedings uh, much under section 46 much less expensive uh, for small business uh, is an illusory re re reason. Section 46 proceedings, can I tell you, are extremely complicated proceedings. They involve not only a, degree, a, a large amount of factual evidence, but invariably involve a large amount of expert economic evidence as well. There have only been a few dozen Section 46 cases in the 33-odd years since the Trade Practices Act has been in operation. And uh, you don't get more complicated litigation than a Section 46 case, frankly. And uh, you would need the same evidence, the same witnesses, the same experts to prove up a Section 46 case in a magistrate's court as you would in the federal court or in, a, in the federal court. So uh, you wouldn't save any money at all. But what you would have is um, this, this extremely complicated sort of litigation being adjudicated with all due respect to federal magistrates by less senior judicial officers. And that is why, as well, the government is of the view that Section 46 cases uh, should only be dealt with by the senior federal judicial officers, that is, in the, trial, um, in the Federal Court of Australia in its um, sitting as a trial court. Um, the point you make about um, uh, recovery of damages under Section 83, um, Senator Sherry, is a fair point. However, I don't think that your amendment would achieve that either because you see what you say uh, in your amendment is that it has to be a matter arising under Section 46. And there is a great deal of, of, of rather arcane law about whether a, recover, a, a proceeding to recover damages based on findings of fact under section 83, a proceedings under section 46, or fresh proceedings under section 83. So for those several reasons, um, I, I don't, with respect, think uh, your amendment number um, seven uh, meets the mischief that you identify. Senator Murray. Uh, my question to, to the minister through the chair is this. Uh, I think one of the weaknesses of uh, Section 46 have been that it has been so difficult to access and so little, um, uh, so few cases have been concluded. Uh, 
without going to the fact that uh, I and uh, uh, the opposition uh, believe that Section 46 could be strengthened even more, my belief is that the amendments uh, in the government's own bill actually improve the opportunity for Section 46 uh, cases to be successfully prosecuted and would therefore make it uh, less difficult than it has been in the past. And it is one of the reasons why the magistrate's court option could be considered now under the new regime as opposed to the old. Minister. So I don't want to prolong things, but um, I thank you for that sentiment, Senator Murray. I, it is the intention of the government to, with this bill, to breathe, more, breathe life into Section 46, which has been rather moribund since the Borrell case. However, that doesn't mean that the issues of proof are going to be any easier. I mean, the problem with the Borrell case is not that it changed the mode of proof, but that it changed the threshold legal tests in one particularly important respect, and that's what's addressed by this legislation. The complexity of the trial process is not going to change, but the thresholds that an applicant has to meet, um, uh, it's the government's intention, um, uh, should be uh, less onerous than they have been since Section 46 has been construed by the High Court in Borrell. The question is that opposition amendment number seven be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against aye. say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Um, Madam, uh, 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 Madam Chair, um, I'd like to thank honourable senators who have taken part in this debate on the Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007. Might I pay uh, particular thanks to Senator Murray and Senator Sherry for their um, sorry, penetrating observations. Sorry to interrupt you, but I have to actually report the bill. Oh, I'm sorry. If I, for you. I premature, I'm sorry. I will. Um, The committee has considered the Trade Practice Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007 and agreed to it with amendments. The report of the committee be adopted. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill be read a third time. In doing so, might I thank honourable senators for uh, their contributions in the committee stage of the debate. And can I in particular thank um, Senator Murray and Senator Sherry for their very penetrating contributions and observations. Um, it is, as I said a moment ago, the, the intention of the government that as a result of this bill, um, the provisions of Part 4 of the Trade Practices Act and Part 4A of the Trade Practices Act um, will be significantly uh, strengthened uh, and that the, the Australian competition laws uh, will be restored to the reputation they have had in the past prior to uh, judicial intervention that narrowed their operation uh, to world's best practice. We believe the right balance has been struck between maintaining freedom of competition uh, in a competitive um, uh, market and protecting the legitimate interests of participants in that market. Thank you. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Get say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Trade Practices Act 1974 and for related purposes.
was ready to Thanks, Linda. Oh. You're right. Order. Uh, questions without notice. Senator Sherry. Thank you. My question is to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Does the minister recall stating yesterday that, quote, interest rates today are at the highest they have ever been under the Howard government? And in case not everyone heard it, he repeated it a second time when he said the, that interest rates are the highest they have ever been under us. Didn't the minister also say that, quote, they are at record lows? They are indeed record lows. Given this totally confused and repeated uh, and contradictory answer from the minister yesterday, can he explain how it is possible for interest rates to be, quote, the highest they have ever been under us and, at the same time, at record lows? Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, um, just, just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that the, uh, uh, the senator opposite is confused. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify the record for him. Uh, uh, I was simply making, I was simply making a comparison, since the question given to me referred to the record, indeed a comparative analysis, which is what this place is about, and I made the point that. The very best, the very, the very best that Labor could have, could, could come up with, was 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 marginally above our very worst. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the, the the notion of the question yesterday uh, is that uh, if they, if those opposite would like to again to reiterate uh, relative benefits about the economy, and I think that's the substance of the question, Mr. President. We are we are proud, Mr. President, to Order. have. We are proud, Mr. President, to have led a government that took this country from an appalling state of affairs in 1996 when we took government, and the appalling state of affairs was reflected by an unemployment rate of 10.9 per cent at the peak of Labor, Mr. President. We now, Mr. President, and Australia now enjoys 10, a 4.3 per cent unemployment rate, Mr. President, 4.3 per cent, the lowest in 30 years. So I I'm certainly enjoy any question from the other side that seeks to genuinely compare uh, the performance in government uh, uh, over, over the years, Mr President. Uh, home mortgage rate, and that's been mentioned a number of times, and there is a concern in the Australian, uh, amongst the Australian people about what's going to happen under Labor miss, miss, uh, should, they, should they come to power, Mr President. And what will happen, Mr President, I think all of us know, there will be a repeat of history, Mr President. <laughs> A repeat of history. You can be sure of that, Mr. President. So today we have a home mortgage rate of 8.3%, and Mr. President, under Labor, it peaked at 17%. Mr. President. So 22% for business loans. I'm informed, Order. Mr. President. But Mr. President, so for those people. Order, Senator Scullion, resume your seat. Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, so, Mr. President, uh, when we're having this, this interesting comparison about the performance of government, again, it comes down to two things. First of all, the capacity to provide an economy to provide fantastic growth in jobs, low interest rates, uh, all of those aspects that make up an economy, including inflation, are those are the fundamentals of a good economy. And of course, when you have those fundamentals of a good economy, you can run a government that everybody in Australia enjoys. They are enjoying the good governance of a good economy at this moment, because right today there's 2,183,000 Australians who have a job today who didn't have a job in 1996, Mr. President. And they come into this place and saying, but but what about the people who are having some difficulty with uh, with buying a home, Mr. President? And I've been to great lengths to inform the Australian people and to inform those on the other side that whilst the Australian government has done a tremendous job by giving everybody a job and ensuring that interest rates are far lower than they ever were under Labor, well, there, there is more to do. And Mr President, we have ensured that we continue to implore the states and territories 
the Queensland branch of the Labor Party, the New South Wales branch of the Labor Party, the West Australian branch of the Labor Party to do their bit as well. So instead of actually ripping off the people of those states and, and indeed of, the, of, of, the, of, of the, the territories, what we need to do is to ensure that the relationship with the Australian people and the Labor Party in those places reflects their need to stop taxing the people. We've done the right thing. We have a fantastic economy, and what we need is the Labor Party to talk to their mates in the other jurisdictions to ensure that the full benefits Order, of our Senator economy Scullion, your flow time to all has Australians. Expired. Your time has expired. Supplementary question, Senator Sherry. Thank you. Given the minister's interest in history, isn't he aware that uh, when Mr Howe was last treasurer, interest rates hit 22 per cent? 22 per cent, minister. And doesn't the minister's complete confusion yesterday and again today just couldn't answer the contradictory uh, questions that he, he gave, answers to questions he gave yesterday, highlight the fact that the government broke its explicit 2004 election promise that it would keep interest rates at record lows? You've broken your promise. After nine interest rate hikes in a row, adding $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage, how will our kids ever afford to buy their own home when you break election promise after election promise on interest rates? Order. Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr President. This government, and I am very proud to be a member of a government that has allowed people the position to have a job and to buy their own home. And I'll put beyond doubt. There is no doubt about the comparison between those opposite and ourselves, Mr President. They, they're happy to come in this place proud of the fact that they had 17 per cent, 22 per cent in terms of business loans. Those people are the ones who sent small businesses out, they sent them broke, they put people on the dole and they, they hurt Australians, and those Australians still remember. And those Australians who don't remember, let me tell you this. You think about the comparison between interest rates, 17 per cent under Labor, 8.3 under the Coalition. Order. Senator Eggleston. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, Senator Scullion. Would the Minister advise the Senate of the latest developments in the Australian Government's intervention in the Northern Territory? Senator Scullion. Uh, uh, Mr President, I, I, I thank the Senator for his question. And I know he has a long-standing interest in, in, uh, in Indigenous affairs and certainly has been informing me on the, on the need to move the, in, the intervention in the Northern Territory, particularly in his state of West Australia. I'm delighted, Mr President, uh, uh, to inform the Senate that uh, today we have announced a $740 million plan in new, involving a range of new initiatives. And this is to, be, to move beyond the stabilisation stage of the Northern Territory intervention. Now, these new measures are as follows. $540 million to repair and build housing in remote communities over the next four years. You see, Mr President, it's not good enough just to go and do the inspections and do evaluation. You need to be a government with some credible policy that moves ahead and actually does the work that it exposes. $100 million for more doctors, nurses, allied health professionals and specialist services, uh, uh, Mr President. Again, we've done over 2,000 health checks in 30 communities, as has been on the public record. That has exposed an unacceptable level of, uh, of serious health conditions, particularly in, in, in the youngest of those, of those expected. We'll be investing $100 million to move around the Territory to ensure that we ameliorate those conditions. 78.2 million over three years, Mr. President, to convert the CDEP uh, positions to real jobs, and I'm delighted to say up to 30 million to be matched dollar for dollar by the Northern Territory government. And it's rare that I would uh, normally uh, select the Northern Territory uh, government uh, out in this, but I'm tremendous to see that they have taken a, a very sensible approach in a partnership approach. Uh, we recognise the difficulties uh, with such a, a low tax base, Mr. Mr. President, to, ta to take over their responsibilities in terms of CDP. So we have uh, made an offer to match them dollar for dollar to ensure that people move from an effective training position to real employment, Mr. President. To real employment, we're providing um, 18.5 million over two years for 66 additional uh, federal police, uh, Mr. President, and that, of course, is to provide continuing 
uh, continue the provision of the shield of law and order that so many Australians take for granted. Now, this funding uh, Mr. President, will be provided uh, to the Northern Territory Government on the basis that they agree to certain conditions, including a radical overhaul of the way that we're going to deliver Commonwealth funds uh, to housing programs in the Northern Territory, and that they will ensure that sufficient classrooms, equipment and teachers are available to ensure that as the welfare to reform packages uh, become effective uh, and that uh, clearly the uh, uh, school attendance will increase, we want to make sure that the level of amenity is there to ensure that they have uh, the same education we take for granted. Then this provides an enormous opportunity to Indigenous communities to move forward in a safe manner, Mr. President, with an economic future for those, for those areas. And it demonstrates again, Mr. Howard, uh, that, that uh, the Howard government is here for the long haul in relation to the critical issues such as uh, health, housing uh, and, and policing. We have a call of rubbish from the other side, Mr President. I'll tell you what I'll tell you. If, they, if they're happy to go and engage themselves, Mr President, what I'd call on Labor to actually enforce these initiatives, not to play this little double game of saying we support this initiative in Canberra, when they're back home in Darwin, they're sort of slowly undermining it. Right. And not to follow the, the law of you know, the member for Jagger Jagger, the member for Lingiari, and a local uh, Labor member, uh, Carl Hampton, who was reported by a man in knew and move, is going out there before the intervention team and saying, when they get here, just say no. Just say no, Mr President. So I don't appreciate interventions from, interdictions from the other side. This is an intervention that all Australians stand behind. And I'm again very proud to be part of a government who has provided so much change for our first Australians. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Coonan, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. President, can the Minister confirm that this week the government signed Australia up to the US led Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, joining the great and glorious Kakistan in this group? Hasn't the government committed Australia to joining a group that will see nuclear fuel leased to countries? then returned to fuel suppliers for reprocessing and then potentially stored in other members' countries. Isn't that why Canada, another major uranium supplier, declined the invitation to join the group? Can the minister also confirm the Federal Liberal Council in June this year overwhelmingly voted in support of establishing a nuclear waste dump in Australia to take spent fuel from other countries? Mr President, how can voters trust the government on this issue when its own party members strongly support Australia taking spent nuclear fuel from other countries to be, to be stored at a high-level waste Come on, time, dump? Senator Bishop. That question was very long, Senator Bishop. Senator Order. Order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President, and uh, thank you. Uh, to the Senator for the question. The Global uh, Nuclear Energy uh, Partnership, of course, um, Mr. President, uh, is, a, is a US initiative which seeks to develop a worldwide consensus allowing for expanded use of nuclear energy while strengthening the nuclear non proliferation regime. And, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, we uh, we, in fact, welcome expa the expanded civil nuclear cooperation with the United States. And Australia has joined the United States-initiated Global Nuclear Energy Partnership at uh, a meeting, of course, in uh, Vienna on the 16th of September. And uh, we've concluded a joint nuclear energy action plan with the United States on the 3rd of September. Australia uh, supports the Global Nuclear Energy Plan goal of enabling expanded use of nuclear energy while strengthening nuclear non-proliferation. And Australia has clear interests as a major uranium producer and strong supporter of the non-proliferation regime. The uh, Global Nuclear Energy Partnership is still evolving. And, uh, Mr President, uh, I would have thought that it makes uh, eminent good sense for Australia to become involved early in the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership's development. Australia-US uh, Nuclear Energy Action Plan helps ensure that Australia stays abreast of the latest civil nuclear energy developments, and of course it includes cooperation on uh, research and development, 
non-proliferation, civil, nuclear, energy, skills and technical training and uh, regulatory issues. Uh, and it also, uh, Mr. President, provides the framework for Australia's technical involvement in the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership and uh, the Generation 4 program to develop advanced nuclear reactors. Now, uh, Mr. President uh, claims that uh, joining the Global Nuclear Energy Plan requires Australia to accept other countries spent nuclear fuel or endorse their programs uh, or indeed um, to accept radioactive waste are in fact dead wrong. There is no such requirement. Government's policy is and will remain not to accept other countries spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste. The policy recorded in our nuclear energy action plan. This policy, of course, is recorded in our nuclear energy action plan with uh, the United States. Um, now, uh, Mr. President, the government's policy on the, in this matter is both long-standing and well-known. Australia does not accept nuclear waste from other countries, and this prohibition is enacted in law. Order. 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 Senator Bishop, uh, thank you, Mr. Question. President. Supplementary question to the minister arising out of her response. Mr. President, can the minister confirm the government has been in discussions with companies interested in setting up an, enri an enrichment industry in Australia, which under GNEP would commit us to taking back nuclear fuel used in other countries? Didn't the director of one such company state recently that its plans would go only ahead under a coalition government? <coughs> under GNEP, won't Australia be an ideal fuel supplier country, enriching our uranium and then taking back the spent fuel from other countries? Senator Coonan. Mr. President, well, I thought I'd uh, very explicitly answered that you question, very well. and in fact I'll repeat it. Uh, our policy of, is long-standing and well-known, and we do not accept nuclear waste from other countries. This is uh, a prohibition that is enacted in the law, and I don't think I can put it in clearer terms than that. Order. Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I, I also direct my question to the Minister for Communications, Information Technology and the Arts. Will the minister update the Senate on the government's nation-building broadband rollout? What is the government's response to the use of the court system and Auditor-General process by Telstra and the opposition? Senator Coonan, order. Order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank uh, Senator Chapman for his question. And uh, as he is, I am concerned about Telstra and uh, the Labor Party working together to frustrate and delay the rollout of a new high-speed broadband network in Australia. While the government, of course, is focused on extending high-speed broadband out to 99 per cent of the population, it's clear, Mr President, that Labor and Telstra have been working hand-in-glove to try and prevent any independent broadband investment from proceeding. Now, Mr President, embarrassing Telstra documents released in the federal court in the past few days show that Telstra's and Labor's tactics included a plan to influence an investigation by the Auditor-General and to commence court proceedings in the hope the rollout of the new Opal high-speed network build would be delayed. Internal Telstra strategy documents from November 2006 and June 2007 said, and I quote, the bid for funding will be non-compliant for a range of reasons. Ah. A better option than not participating may be to have the government reject our offer. Oh, and we are for. taking the view that so long as we have claims that are arguable and will not be laughed out of court, we should run them even if the prospects of success are not great. Oh. Now, Mr President, these this documents also family. show that the Labor Party was complicit in Telstra's That's plans right. to derail the That's OPEL right. proposal. Pride of place in Telstra's strategy to influence the Auditor-General is a letter in draft form from the Labor Party to the Auditor-General. And who was this unsigned draft letter from? 
None other than Senator, Senator Conroy. Conroy. Hey, got yes, everyone. thank you. And you have to ask, Mr. President, what was this draft letter from Labor to the Auditor General doing in a Telstra strategy manual oh, about influencing an independent oh, auditor's Stephen. review? Was it for a bit of technical tweaking or was it to give them that notice? That's but, right. uh, Mr. President, the snag in this plan by Telstra and Labor to Stephen's influence no the snag. Auditor General is that the Auditor General torpedoed their arguments when he found, and I quote, it was open to government to agree to negotiations being pursued with the preferred applicant and to commit to increase the program's funding. And so, Mr. President, here we have it: a Telstra plan to deliberately submit a bid that it knew was not compliant and was doomed to fail, to get the Labor Party to seek to influence the Auditor General. To try to delay the rollout order, of the new order, high competitive order. Senator high Kernan, speed broadband Senator Kernan, network. You want to say, Senator Conroy, you will withdraw that comment. I withdraw that she's an idiot. The, and draw unconditionally. <laughs> Senator Kernan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I know that Senator Conroy is desperately embarrassed by being pinned here. But, uh, so Labor has tried to delay the rollout of a new competitive high-speed broadband network by Opal and then to publicly attack the government in international forums and uh, in seats all around Australia by talking up the Labor Party. Well, Telstra's disgraceful behaviour is on display for all to see, and the Labor Party's cynical, sneaky and opportunistic part in trying to delay the Opel network build has been shown for what it is. Yeah, yeah. Labor has no plan for over three million premises in rural and regional Australia that will simply miss out under its sham plan. Regional and rural Australians know you can't rely on the Labor Party. The only true friend of rural and regional Australia is the Coalition, yeah, yeah, who will continue yeah. to deliver the services yeah. they need and want. Order. Your colleague is waiting to ask a question. Senator Hutchins. Uh, Mr. President, my uh, question is to Senator Coonan, the Minister for Communications. I refer to the letters the Minister has sent to 500,000 Australians telling them that they are not currently able to access wireless broadband. Can the Minister confirm that her letter was sent to both the Tumut and Bega telephone exchanges? <laughs> Can the minister now explain why she sent a letter to the Bega and, tele and Tumut telephone exchanges to tell them that they have no broadband access? Order. Isn't it the case that both of these exchanges not only have broadband access, but they actually help to provide it to the local community? Is the minister really so desperate to sell her second-rate network that she is reduced to sending letters to telephone exchanges? How could the minister be so out of touch and, frankly, incompetent? Order, order, order. We will not proceed until there is order. Senator Coonan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, what I could say about that question, of course, is that uh, it seems that Senator Hutchins has gone to the NIDA school for overacting. That's but uh, That's quite right. apart from that, uh, what I also can say is that uh, I'm absolute, I've been Order. absolutely delighted. Order. Order. Senator Faulkner. Senator Faulkner. Senator Coonan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And of course, what this uh, really does show is how desperate the Labor Party is that information about the government's comprehensive broadband plan doesn't get out to rural and regional Australians who want these services and who won't get one under the Labor Party. Right. And they certainly won't get no one in Australia will get one until 2013. So, uh, Mr. Uh, President, 
Uh, the mail-out, of course, simply informs consumers about new and affordable broadband services coming their way. Now, surely, if, uh, if the Labor Party was interested in providing Australians with access to fast, affordable broadband, it would have supported this mail-out. I'm absolutely delighted that my department wrote to over 500,000 householders across rural and regional Australia to advise them that a new wholesale broadband network is now being rolled out. And, uh, this new network will provide fast, affordable broadband to all Australians regardless of where they live. Unlike Labor, which needs an inquiry to even get out of bed, it's a wonder right. they haven't yeah. had one That's just right. to decide yeah. where they can uh, roll out uh, broadband. The Howard government is about making decisions in the best interests of all Australians and then getting on with the job of making these decisions a reality. A fast, affordable broadband uh, service for all Australians, regardless of where they live, is a reality that this government has committed to, has costed, and is currently rolling out. And uh, the Labor Party, of course, wants to shut down the good news. And uh, we all know that their response lacks credibility. It's a sham plan. It's uncosted, provides no coverage, and it only covers 75% of the country. So no wonder people in rural and regional Australia look forward to getting letters that inform them not only of the availability of services, but the fact that they will be affordable and, we, and will be available to them before 2013. Uh, it's no wonder that the Labor Party wants to stop consumers being informed. They have desperately tried to shut down the Opal network. They've conspired with Telstra to try and influence quite improperly the Auditor General. They have tried without, uh, without success to criticise every opportunity to tell consumers about services that are available regardless of, uh, of where Australians live. And it's not just uh, Labor who wants to keep consumers in the dark, of course. Telstra, who only has itself to blame, has gone on a capital strike, has failed to provide fast broadband, which it could at the flick of a switch, and then has the temerity to criticise an alternate provider who steps up to the plate and says, if Telstra won't do it, we will. <laughs> Mr uh, President, uh, I think it's, a, it's uh, an indictment on the Labor Party and an indictment on Senator Conroy, an indictment on all the people over there who he gets to ask his silly questions. Uh, the important thing is that all Australians can get fast broadband under the Coalition's plan, regardless of where they live. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Senator Hutchins. Yes, Mr President. Uh, does the minister know how many of the 500,000 recipients of her letter either already have broadband or are in fact telephone exchanges? <laughs> how much public money has been wasted on this propaganda campaign, the sole purpose of which is to help cover up the minister's incompetence? Senator Coonan. Well, uh, gee, uh, Mr. Mr. President, um, I must say I'm hardly shattered by that penetrating question. The government is strongly committed to extending high-quality, affordable broadband as far as possible across Australia. That will include a mix of technologies uh, that does include wireless, that does include ADSL 2+. And uh, it will extend, of course, also the subsidy uh, for satellite uh, service and tells people about the $2 billion communications fund that the Labor Party wanted to knock off for a, res for a metropolitan That's service. Right. Uh, right. Mr uh, President, I'm very pleased that the people of Australia know that there is at least one party, and that is the government in Australia, that actually stands up for consumers, understands what they need and is getting on with delivering them, ignoring the sideshow from the Labor Party. Uh, Senator Lightfoot. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Abetz. Will the Minister outline how the government has effectively balanced the role of employees, employers, and unions in Australia's workplaces? And is the Minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Abetz. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can I thank the distinguished and elegant uh, and eloquent Senator Lightfoot for his question? Mr. President, the Howard government's industrial relations laws do strike a balance. Employees are given the ability to negotiate working conditions that best suit them, underpinned by a strong safety net and the fairness test, which ensures conditions can't be traded without fair recompense. Employers, the people who, may I remind those opposite, actually create the jobs, are given the same ability to negotiate flexible working conditions with their workers. They have also had the job-destroying shackles of Labor's so-called unfair dismissal laws removed. And despite what Labor and the unions say, the ability of unions to represent their members in the workplace has been retained and, indeed, enshrined in law. But what have we done, Mr President, is to put in place a sensible law to prevent unions from simply barging into workplaces on any pretext to stand over workers and employers. Mr President, it is significant that our laws, which have seen the creation now of over 400,000 new jobs, 87 per cent of which are full-time, and further real wage increases, are so balanced that the Labor Party now pretends they would keep some aspects of work choices. The problem is, Mr President, Labor's position is just that, pretense. Does anybody seriously think that with 70 per cent of Labor's front bench and 80 per cent of Labor senators for being former union officials, and might I add some of whom in their former trade union life were part of the rabble trying to break into Parliament House before our first budget, and some of those will remember and know who they are. They found it easier to get in by getting Labor Party endorsement and are now sitting in this chamber. And might I add, Mr President, would be senior ministers in a Rudd Labor government. Do you think that they would stand up to union thuggery? Of course not. And Mr President, there's the scary and very real prospect of the extremist Greens gaining the balance of power in this place and making Labor's retrograde IR policies even more extreme. And here's some of the Greens' extreme IR policies, a union wish list if ever you've seen one. An absolutely unfettered right to strike, an unfettered right for union representatives to enter the workplace, and the reinstatement, lock, stock and barrel, of Paul Keating's so-called unfair dismissal laws. No wonder, Mr President, that the unions are now pouring hundreds and thousands of dollars into green coffers. Mr President, a few weeks ago, Green Senator Rachel Seward promised that if the Greens won the balance of power, they would keep, to quote, a hand on the shoulder of a new government, particularly on the IR legislation. And today her hapless and interjecting leader of the Greens said they would harden Labor's IR position. We'll be negotiating very strongly. I predict we'll Order. improve Order. Labor's Order. position. Order. Would you resume your seat? Resume your seat. Order. Point of order, Senator Brown. Yeah, President, um, the minister heard the question. He should What's be showing. What's your point of order? The point of order is that he's not giving us the detail about the exclusive there is preference no point exemption of order. Resume your the seat. Prime Minister on Resume work. your seat. There is no point of order. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. There is no point of order. Senator Betts. What a silly point of order from a very silly leader of the Australian Greens. But, Mr President, what we have here is that the Australian Greens will line up with the Australian Labor Party and bring into this country industrial relations laws worse than were under the Hawke-Keating regime. It will be job-destroying, it will be economy-destroying, it will be family-destroying. And so, Mr President, Order. what I urge our fellow Australians Order. to Your do time is expired. to support the balance of the House. Order, Minister. Se Senator Stott Despoyer. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is addressed to the Minister representing the Foreign Minister, Senator Coonan, and I ask is the Minister aware that on 14 September this year it was the 60th anniversary of the United Nations, the first UN peacekeeping mission, 
Uh, I asked, is the minister aware of reports that Australia now ranks 67th in the world in terms of commitment to troops for UN missions? Can the minister outline why the government uh, can justify or how the government can justify committing some 1,575 troops to Iraq among the approximately 160,000 troops, coalition troops there. Yet the government is not willing to commit troops to Darfur, where the uh, presence of professional, professional Australian troops could make a significant dis difference. Senator Coonan. Uh, well, thank you uh, to Senator Stott Despoia for the question. And, um, uh, no, I'm certainly not aware of the statistic that, uh, that Senator Stott Despoia has mentioned in her, uh, her question, but uh, she does in fact uh, refer specifically to uh, the situation in Darfur. And uh, I have to say that, um, of course, Australia welcomes the United Nations Security Council's establishment of uh, peacekeeping operations in Darfur, the UN African Union Peacekeeping Operations, UNAMID, uh, to take over responsibility for peacekeeping in Darfur from the African Union mission in Sudan uh, by the 31st of December 2007. And Australia has also welcomed the Security Council's authorisation for UNAMID uh, to use force to protect civilians and humanitarian workers and to support implementation of the Darfur Peace Agreement. Uh, Australia is encouraged, of course, by recent UN-AU discussions with uh, Darfuri rebel groups and by the prospect of negotiations between these groups and the government of uh, Sudan. Australia recognises, of course, that there are substantial obstacles to a settlement. Now, Australia has, and, uh, has made and will continue to make significant efforts to relieve uh, the crisis in Darfur. Uh, since mid-2004, we've provided uh, more than $71 million in humanitarian aid to Sudan and almost $11 million to address the spillover effects in neighbouring countries. Australia um, certainly has offered to provide uh, doctors and nurses to assist the UN uh, with this peacekeeping force. So, um, Senator uh, Stop Despoir, obviously aid and uh, efforts in peacekeeping can take uh, different forms. Australia considers that uh, it's very willing to step up to the plate in tragic situations such as uh, those that we've seen uh, in Darfur uh, to do our bit well and truly. And uh, uh, if there's some further information that, uh, that uh, the minister, Mr Downer, can uh, give me to add to my question, I'll most certainly uh, convey it to uh, Senator Stock Despoyer. Some supplementary question, Senator Stottis Boyer. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for her answer, and certainly acknowledge the uh, aid provided by our government uh, to Sudan. But I do ask the minister to get more information about why the government won't specifically commit ADF personnel, not to Sudan generally. I understand that uh, uh, that's slightly different in southern Sudan, but in Darfur specifically. Why won't Australia provide? peacekeeping troops as part of that UN mission that we have welcomed so strongly. And given our proud reputation in contributing to peacekeeping missions, uh, something like uh, 67, uh, sorry, 64 countries, 73 deployments since that first mission. But how does the minister explain the decline in under 10 years? We've gone from seventh in the world in 1999 to 67th this year. Can the minister explain that decline in contributions? Order. Senator Kernan. Uh, yes, thank you to Senator Stott de Spoyer for the, uh, for the supplementary question. And uh, I reiterate the fact that uh, Australia takes very seriously our role in relation to uh, stepping up to the plate with assistance and just to continue uh, with uh, the uh, case that I was uh, previously engaged in with Sudan, I note that we have uh, also provided, apart from our $71 million in humanitarian aid since mid-2004, almost $11 million to address the spillover effects in neighbouring countries, we have also provided 15 specialist ADF personnel to the United Nations mission in Sudan, established in March 2005, to support implementation 
of North-South well, Comprehensive plan. Peace Agreement. We have a very proud record uh, of sending our AFP officers on peacekeeping efforts, uh, certainly in Cyprus, just to mention one mission. We've uh, had 40 over the past years. Uh, Mr Andy Hughes, a former AFP officer, was appointed head of a UN uh, police recently. Uh, I'll get some further information for Senator Stop to Spoyer, but the thrust of her question I don't think is made out. Australia steps up to the plate and takes our responsibilities where we should Order. in the those particular situations. Order. Time's expired. Senator McGoran. And my question is to uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Minister for Finance and Administration, Senator Minchin. Will the Minister inform the Senate of the latest report of the Australian economy from the International Monetary Fund? And what lessons can be taken from this report, Minister? And is the Minister aware of alternative uh, approaches? Right. Senator Minchin. Thanks, Mr President. Thanks to Senator McGoran for that question. Indeed, uh, last week the International Monetary Fund, probably the, the most uh, prestigious International Economic Agency, released its Article 4 report on the Australian economy. The IMF's executive board commended the Australian government on what it described as exemplary macroeconomic management, which it said was widely recognised as being at the forefront of international best practice. The report described Australia's fiscal position as very strong, noting that we'd run surpluses in nine out of the ten uh, years preceding. The IMF stated that sound fiscal, monetary and structural policies had created the conditions for a continued expansion supported by high employment. There are uh, Mr. President, several policy implications from this report. The IMS, IMF has expressed confidence that the government would continue to implement the reforms needed to spur efficiency, enhance productivity and face long-term challenges relating to uh, population ageing. Uh, secondly, the IMF has stated that, and I quote, additional revenues from the terms of trade boom have been managed prudently, a statement that Mr. President, completely ref refutes claims that uh, have been made by Labor that the government has somehow squandered the proceeds of uh, the increase in resource prices. The accompanying staff report noted that although the government's management of additional revenues from the strong terms of trade had been prudent, there would be inflationary risks if fiscal policy was loosened. It is worth quoting from paragraph 16 of the staff report, which says, and I quote, another stimulus that raises concern comes from the Australian states. The states are collectively forecasting a fiscal deficit of around half a per cent of GDP in 07-08. This constitutes a reversal of the surplus position that the states have been in until 05-06. The states point to the need for infrastructure improvements as the main reason for the deterioration in their budgets. The catch-up in infrastructure spending comes at a time when there is already strong competition for human and capital resources from the private sector. As a result, this is putting more pressure on resources and could begin to bid up prices. So the International Monetary Fund is clearly warning about the inflationary impact brought about by state Labor governments' new borrowing. We know that state Labor governments and their business enterprises are going to increase their combined debt to no less than $80 billion by 2010 to fund projects which do risk cost blowouts, project delays and economy-wide inflationary pressures. So, Mr President, that is the risk this country faces if we end up with wall-to-wall -wall Labor after this federal election. Mr President, we also know that, of course, Mr Rudd doesn't actually have an economic plan. All he has is a long list of reviews and inquiries, an armada of new bureaucracies, quangos, task forces and commissions. He's promised no less than 67 new bureaucracies and 96 new reviews if he's elected. So Mr Rudd's going to promise to govern just like his state Labor counterparts, inflating the bureaucracy at a great cost to taxpayers and endlessly looking into things instead of getting on with the job of delivering outcomes for the Australian people. Uh, Mr Rudd is, of course, a career bureaucrat whose uh, only experience is implementing the ideas of others and none of his own ideas. We've seen Mr Rudd uh, have his policies dictated to him by the ACTU, the Labor premiers, and now, of course, as Senator Abetz has said, Senator Brown is telling everyone how he's Senator going to amend Evans. Labor's industrial Senator relations Evans. policies to make them even more union friendly. Um, they're simply filling the vacuum led by Mr Rudd's complete lack of ideas. All his ideas are to be friendly to the ACTU and raid the future fund. He has no policies to keep this economy strong and people in jobs. Order. Order. 
Order. Senator Sherry. I will not call your colleague. Order. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Minchin, the minister representing the Prime Minister. Can the minister confirm that since the last election, the Howard government has spent more than $800 million on advertising? Isn't this spending five times the amount the government will spend on the mental health program this year and six times as much as it will spend on rural health services? Can the minister confirm that the advertising spend includes $93 million advertising the government's extreme industrial relations changes? $27 million advertising private health insurance and $52 million on climate change spin, including $23 million worth of advertising. How much public money in total has the Howard government spent on advertising since the start of this year? And how much more will the Howard government spend on advertising before the election? Senator Minchin. Uh, Mr. President, well, these are rather tired old uh, arguments from the Labor Party about government advertising. The, uh, the Labor Party well knows that all governments of all persuasions naturally and legitimately are able to advertise government programs Order. and policies. We always get criticism from the other side if people are uninformed of government policies and programs. It is, in fact, the job of governments to inform their citizens of the policies and programs which they are implementing uh, on their behalf. And of course, the fact is, all that the Labor Party is reflecting is the fact that we are an activist, reformist government. And it is our proper role to inform the Australian people of the many exciting programs and policies that we have brought to bear during our 11 years in government. And it is our job to let them Order. know of all the good things that we're doing for them, of all the jobs we're Order. creating. Senator Minchin. The Senate will come to order. Senator Minchin. Mr. President, as I was saying, um, they don't want to hear about the fact that it is our proper prerogative and responsibility, indeed, to let the Australian people know about all the exciting things we're doing on their behalf. And that's why they have elected us on four consecutive occasions to govern this country. And we have no shame whatsoever in ensuring that the Australian people, in ensuring that the Australian people know exactly what we are doing Order. for them and on their behalf. And how dare the Labor Party? Lecture us about government advertising. Have they seen? Do they go and watch the television when they go back to Adelaide and Sydney and Brisbane and see the shameless behaviour of state Labor premiers who appear in all these government advertising campaigns run by the state Labor governments? No, we don't get information when we turn on our TVs back in our capital cities. What we see is Mr Beattie or Mr Rand or Mr Brax puncing around on screen telling the people what great guys they are. It's outrageous Order. what the state Labor premiers have been Senator doing Wong. with their taxpayers' money, so we're not going to listen to any lectures from the Labor Party about government advertising. When, when the senators come to order, I will call Senator McEwen. Supplementary question. <laughs> Thank Senator you, McEwen. Mr President. I do have a supplementary question. Is the minister aware of the Prime Minister's view in 1995 that, and I quote, in a desperate attempt to find an election life, life raft, the Prime Minister is beginning an unprecedented propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money? Can the minister confirm that the cost of the unprecedented propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money the in the year leading right. up to the 2007 election order. will be more than five? Hundred million dollars. Why should taxpayers have to spend half a billion dollars of their money on the Prime Minister's election life raft? Order. Order on my right. Senator Minchin. Well, uh, Mr. President, I'm not sure where um, the Senator gets her figures, but uh, the information to me is that for the 2006-07 financial year. Uh, total advertising placed through the central advertising system was $171 million. 
Um, if we look at what the state governments are doing, I always think that's quite relevant. Um, as I said, uh, in uh, the course of uh, 2006, state governments, whose total budgets are about half of what ours is, actually spent $354 million. So the state governments are not only spending twice as much as we spend, but they're only half the size. And they're not doing anything anyway. What have they got to advertise? The state governments do absolutely nothing except fail completely to supply their citizens with public transport. They can't supply them with Senator water. Wong. What do these state governments do? Order. 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 Sen Senator Carr. A senator is seeking the call. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Minchin. I ask, uh, does the minister recall that when scientists were warning this time last year of extreme drought and fires for the summer, the Prime Minister said that he was sceptical about a lot of the more gloomy predictions about climate change. Does he further recall that the Prime Minister said in February of this year that the jury is still out on the relationship between climate change and drought? If so, does the Prime Minister and the government still believe in the face of ongoing drought and terrible crop failure predictions today that the jury is still out on the correlation between the intensity of drought on the one hand and the higher temperatures, higher evaporation rates and changed rainfall patterns of climate change on the other? Senator Minchin. Uh, well, Mr President, um, we know better than most because we do represent rural Australia just how severe the drought is. Uh, we take that extremely seriously. And uh, just this week, uh, we announced an extension of exceptional circumstances relief for uh, Australians who are suffering uh, one of Australia's uh, most prolonged periods of drought. Uh, and we have ex extreme concern for the position of uh, farmers and other communities affected by what is a very serious drought. And I accept that there is uh, bipartisan concern for the consequences of what is clearly uh, one of Australia's uh, most severe droughts during the period of uh, European settlement in this country. Uh, but uh, the fact is that scientists have made clear that there have been periods of drought of this order uh, in previous history in Australia. Uh, this is not unique. There have been other prolonged periods of extreme drought in this country. Uh, Peter Cullen, uh, a, a significant uh, scientist who has spent much time in my home state of South Australia, um, just recently made the point that indeed Australians may have been uh, unfortunately led to believe that uh, the good seasons and the good period of the sort of 50s and 60s and 70s uh, would go on forever when much of the irrigation licences were issued in the Murray-Darling Basin on the uh, now clearly a misapprehension that uh, the good periods through that time uh, would simply continue. And as he pointed out, uh, what seems to be occurring is a return uh, to the sort of conditions which prevailed prior to those three decades of uh, exceptionally good conditions. I think it is fair to say, that, objectively speaking, uh, that from a scientific point of view, the uh, period of prolonged drought which Australia is currently experiencing has not yet been proved to be directly linked uh, to global climate change. Um, that is not to say it is not linked, uh, but I think it is proper for the Prime Minister to objectively state, based on uh, the many scientific statements to that effect, uh, that it is not yet clear that this prolonged period of drought is a direct consequence or directly linked to overall global climate change. That does, of course, not derogate from the responsibility of state and federal governments to do their utmost uh, to deal with the reality of this drought, uh, to seek to ameliorate its um, significant effects upon uh, rural Australians uh, and those dependent on rural communities. Uh, on the other hand, it also is a fact that we take seriously Australia's role as part of the international community to do what we, we responsibly and sensibly can uh, to deal with global climate change. And we are, and we have detailed on many occasions in this place 
the billions of dollars and the significant number of programs and the extent to which we are seeking to engage the international community in responsible, sensible, pragmatic, effective programs to uh, deal with and to ensure that the world can adapt to uh, the reality of global climate change. Uh, but if the question is, uh, is the Prime Minister right to continue to say uh, that it has not yet been proven that this period of uh, drought is directly uh, caused by or linked to global climate change, he is quite right. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the minister for his uh, frankness about the ongoing climate change scepticism in the government. But I do ask the minister, and I do ask the minister, to apologise to rural Australians for <laughs> ongoing misleading uh, those people into the view that climate change is not real or urgent and that weather patterns will return to something of the past, does the government believe that we need to do more than just band-aid checks for drought relief, flood relief and fire relief? Does the government believe we need a new strategy for a transition in rural Australia to adapt to the realities of climate change? Senator Minchin. Uh, well, Mr. President, I think, um, with respect, Senator Milne has completely misrepresented the government's position on this. Um, she asked me a question about the uh, assertions of a link between this drought and global climate change, which uh, it is asserted is anthropogenic. And, and I was answering that question. The question was not about the issue of climate change per se, and I've detailed to her the extent to which we are taking seriously our responsibilities as <laughs> members of the international community to address uh, the reality of climate change. Um, of course the climate is changing, and of course this country has the least reliable climate in the world. We've known that from the outset of European settlement, that this is the driest inhabited continent on the planet, uh, and I live in the driest state in this uh, continent, and it has the least reliable climate. And it is right to say that we must all, in our farming practices, ensure that we continue to live with that reality. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Scullion, the Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and, in and Indigenous Affairs. Does the Minister recall Minister Brough's promise on the 25th of July that bilateral agreements with Western Australia, the Northern Territory and the ACT under the Commonwealth State and Territory Disability Agreement would be completed very soon after that meeting? Given it is now two months since Mr Brough made that promise, can the Minister explain why no agreements have been signed? Can the Minister confirm that none of these three jurisdictions has, has even received a written offer? from the Commonwealth. When does, the, when does Mr Brough intend to deliver on his promise to complete bilateral agreements under the CSTDA, and how much longer will Australians with disabilities have to wait for Mr Brough to get his act together? Senator Scullion. Uh, uh, perhaps I can take the, the last aspect of uh, that question first. Uh. Uh, Mr. President, I, I think it is, is quite misleading to this place to say that uh, Minister Brough has uh, somehow not provided for Australians in regard to disability. Uh, this, this is a minister who has, because of the failure of the Labor states, had to provide the $1.8 billion package outside of that arrangement to ensure that Australians with a disability get a fair go. Get a fair go, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, in, re in regard to the, to the three offers, uh, uh, Senator, uh, through you, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, the offer was made on the basis that we, if the states and territories come up with a submission to identify, so each of the states and territories then identify the particular amounts that they are going to have, then the, uh, and, 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 uh, and, Mr. President, um, I understand that that is the case. No, no, no. They have been uh, at certain times. The minute interjects with July. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to have a conversation without going through, Mr. President. But, but um, at different times, those particular states uh, and and territory, that particular state and territories have responded. Mm. I, I, I understand that is under active consideration. They responded at different times under active consideration, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. President. And I, I, underst I understand that that those negotiations are of a most amicable nature uh, and are done in, a, in the expression of a partnership. Now, I do understand also, uh, uh, Mr President, uh, 
that uh, Queensland wasn't amongst those, Mr. President. Uh, the Queensland government wasn't one amongst those. When we've had an offer, uh, we've had an offer that uh, should anybody identify unmet need in areas of respite and supported accommodation, the two most fundamental areas in the areas of disability. Of course, there was no offer from Queensland. There was stark silence, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and that's why this government moved to, uh, to, to have a partnership with those states and territories who were fair income about this. And I have to commend West Australia, who has a long, uh, a, a long, uh, a long history of, of, uh, of setting the pace in terms of disability, the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory. And I think they've, been, they've done very well in that matter. In terms of the, uh, the CSTDA, uh, 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 Mr. President, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, there, were, there were a number of issues that we had to deal with outside of the CSTDA. As part of the CSTDA, uh, we have a requirement in the, in the existing CDSTDA that the states and territories provide us with, with, with an evidentiary process about where is the unmet need. We are a government that just doesn't throw money around. We want it prioritised. And we know there is unmet need and supported accommodation and respite. And so when we said to the, to, to the states and territories, can you provide us with that over time, it simply hasn't been provided. And so, on the, with the support of industry, we have said, well, we'll certainly go out and do it ourselves. So we have, in terms of helping older carers and their children, provided uh, $962 million in terms of supporting accommodation. That's $562 million. And, Mr President, we are rolling that out at the moment. I announced uh, about three weeks ago I was in Townsville, the first start of the consultation processes. So the money goes where the need is most, Mr President. We then helping families with disabilities and their families is 744.8 million. Child, child disability assistance is 721.2. Children's services is 23.6. Mr. President, I could go on and on, but this 1.8 billion is above and beyond the Commonwealth State Disability Agreements because this government is about a government who leads. We wouldn't be able to make this investment without a fantastic economy, and we wouldn't be able to make this investment, Mr. President, if we had weak leadership. We're not prepared to muck about. Labor is weak on leadership, Mr. President. John, the Howard government is strong on leadership, and we have made a decision. We are going to help all those people in need of disability, Mr. President. Order. Time has expired. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. I note that the minister could not explain why no agreements have been signed some two months after. Uh, the minister indicated that it would be very soon that these agreements would be reached. Can the minister confirm that Minister Bruff is in fact raiding the disability assistant pack assistance package announced in June in order to fund the bilateral agreements? Is, if the funding for the bilateral agreements is coming from the disability assistance package, does this mean that non-government providers from Western Australia, the Northern Territory and the ACT will be frozen out, out of frozen out of any additional funding to support older carers of people with disabilities. Senator Scullion. Uh, I reiter reiterate, uh, uh, Mr President, uh, as part of my initial answer, it was quite clear. In, in terms of the three agreements, this is, this is a partnership approach, uh, and the, it is an amicable agreement, and announcements in, in terms of that partnership approach will be made shortly. In terms of uh, the so-called raiding of the, of, of, of the extra funds that the Commonwealth put in, the $1.8 billion that we put in, this is a, the $1.8 billion is in fact not directly going to be spent on the ter state and territory government. It's quite the contrary. We are engaging with all the NGOs and all the service providers across the, the disability community, community to ensure that those dollars are spent in the very best way. And, uh, and frankly, Mr. President, this is a frustration because of the inability of the Labor governments to be able to provide for this. Again, the simple message is this, Mr. President: we need strong leadership, which the Howard government gives, instead of the weak leadership that is provided by the Labor government. I ask further questions to be placed on the notice paper. Senator Coonan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wish to add to um, an answer that I gave earlier to uh, Senator Stott de Spoyer concerning the United Nations Association of Australia first annual report card on the Australian government's performance at the United Nations. And, uh, Mr President, I wish to inform the Senate that we are the 13th largest financial contributor to the United Nations and contribute $100 million to the United Nations annual peacekeeping budget. 
that's US dollars. In 0708, Australia will deliver an estimated $3.2 billion in official development assistance, 20 per cent of this through multilateral funds, including 10 per cent through UN agencies and programs. We are, of course, an active and respected participant across a wide range of core UN functions, and we're strongly committed to the ongoing reform efforts. And just also to add, uh, Mr. President, that uh, in relation to Australia's commitment in Cyprus over 40 years, I'm uh, informed that the Australian Federal Police have served in Cyprus with distinction, and the number of officers serving there have exceeded at least, or are at least, 1,100. Senator Ellison. Uh, Mr. President, uh, yesterday Senator Ellison asked me a question without notice. In relation to a report of the United Kingdom, uh, study of the impact of the British nuclear tests carried out in Australia. Uh, that report has yet to be presented to a parliamentary committee, but nonetheless I have obtained further information on that, and I table uh, that further information and seek leave to have it incorporated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Now, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Carr. Yes, uh, Mr Deputy President, I move to take note of all government uh, Answers, to, and in particular to those to Senator Minchin regarding government advertising. Today, Mr. Deputy President, we were told by Senator Minchin that he has no shame. He has no shame when it comes to the question of the wanton waste of public monies when regard to government advertising. We now have a situation in the run-up to this election where $500 million will be spent by this government in a desperate attempt to secure a life raft in the, in the face of what is becoming increasing levels of public dissatisfaction with the, this government. A situation where we've got now some $2 billion has been spent on public advertising since this government came to office. This is a desperate attempt by this government to avoid public accountability. This is a government that is seeking to pump out hundreds of hundreds of millions of propaganda to hide from the public and, of course, in a period when they should have called an election. We all understand this is one of the longest-running parliaments in the history of this Commonwealth. This is a government that has desperately running from the Australian people. This is a government that has sought to abuse public advertising in such a manner which goes to the heart of the nature of the deceit and, and the contempt, the deception that this government shows to the Australian people. We, of course, saw in the last year's uh, annual report of the Prime Minister's Department where they even avoided reporting on government advertising. And a whole series of sums, including $209 million for the year 0506, were neglected from being reported. And, of course, this year's figures will not be reported until well after this election. It's $500 million that this government is spending in the run-up to this election. We now have a situation where this government's deceit, its dishonesty, has been visited upon its own ranks. We know, as the situation arose some years ago, when Shane Stone pointed out to us that this is a government that has a reputation for being mean and tricky. We now have a situation where this government has been in a period of total turmoil as it has visited upon its own ranks this deceit and deception. We have a situation where Mr Costello, we are now told, will take over from this Prime Minister at some point in the future, on the condition, of course, that the Liberal Party agrees. Now, this, of course, is now about the fifth time that promises have been issued by Mr Costello by Mr Howard. And, of course, going back to 1994, Mr Costello was told that uh, the Prime Minister would serve only two terms and then hand over. Mr Ian Macdonald, of course, was a witness to those discussions and kept a note in his, in his wallet for 13 years. He kept the note. He kept the faith for 13 years, the poor, hapless fool that should only provide advice about this Prime Minister's capacity to tell the truth. We have a situation back in 2003. Uh, this order. Se Senator Macdonald. I've been uh, misrepresented. I didn't keep a note of anything, uh, and Senator Carr seems to have confused me with someone else. On the point of order, Senator Carr. No, but it's... 
No, there's no point of order, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Senator, Senator Carr. Bree, Mr Deputy President, of course we had the Athens Declaration, where the Prime Minister yet again reneged on a promise to Mr Costello, where he said, of course, that he would uh, hand over when he was 60, 64. We now discover what a deception that was. We now, of course, being told that there was uh, further promises made and that Mr Costello would be the first to be consulted about the future uh, of the, the Prime Minister's plans. We discover just in the last fortnight he was the last to be consulted about the Prime Minister's plans. Of course, we all understand who was the first, and that was Mrs Howard. We all understand who made the decision. It wasn't the Liberal Party. It was Mrs Howard. We all now understand that the, the, the uh, Deputy uh, Leader of the Liberal Party was deceived yet again. And now we are told, of course, that sometime in the future, some indeterminate date, if the Liberal Party agrees and if the Prime Minister hasn't already organised another candidate, then maybe Mr Costello will get an opportunity to serve. Well, of course, we have a situation where this follows a whole series of pattern, a pattern of deceit by this government. We see it on foreign debt, where we are told, of course, the promise that was given. I promise you, said the Prime Minister in 2005, we will follow policies which will bring down foreign debt. What has produced the exact opposite? We were told no worker would be better, would be worse off in, in January 1996. And of course, how ridiculous that proposition now looks. We were told on interest rates, who do you trust to keep interest rates low? As the Prime Minister said in the 2004. We were told on Iraq. I can definitely say we won't be uh, uh, adding hundreds of millions. Of course, we went to war on a lie. This is a government that has been founded Senator on Kate, one your lie time after has another. expired. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, it's interesting hearing Senator Carr talk about deceit and deception and things that happened in the past. Um, one could draw to attention what's happened in the past, possibly in Queensland, where on the 5th of March 1990, um, documents pertaining to uh, a rape at a correctional centre were shredded uh, with other matters. That is uh, the ultimate deceit and deception when people um, decide to party themselves to actions like that. Uh, but, however, moving on to other things, uh, the inter in all answers, interest rates in this government show an incredible record of good management. Interest rates in this government show that one of the, the greatest records of closeness to other benchmarks in the world, especially the US benchmark. It's interesting today to note that. Uh, our official interest rate is at 6.5 per cent. The interest rate in the United States is at 5.25 per cent. There's only, there's only between those two one and a quarter per cent. Um, that is a management figure. That is a management figure. That is the capacity of the government to manage. What we can note, however, is that when the Labor Party were in power, uh, the US interest rates and the differential between our US rates and the US rates was around about 8.3 per cent. That also is another management figure. That is a management figure that shows that in, they are in excess of about seven times the differential of what we've got now. And that comes straight down to the capacity to manage a domestic economy. Now, one of the fundamental aspects of a domestic economy is having people with the expertise to manage that economy. See, what we have, and I've said this before, we are, we're on a, a political 747 here, and it's the capacity of how it's going to fly is determined by the people who are in the cockpit. Now, the Labor Party, we have left the door open on their cockpit, and we're having a look inside. And the question has to be asked, has any of them ever flown a political 747 before? And the answer, obviously, is no. In fact, none of them have ever flown before. I don't think there is one person on the Labor front bench who has ever managed a business. Not one. Not one have they gone out and sourced a person with the capacity that would be required to run the economy. They haven't even gone close. If you want conceit and deception, it's the conceit and deception to be um, completely errant in getting onto your front bench those with management expertise in business. It's quite obvious that you're not going to be able to uh, have any um, credentials in running a trillion-dollar economy uh, when there's 
no one that's run so much as a corner store. Uh, what are they relying on? Divine providence to find these people. That the, the skills in, in managing an economy will sort of descend upon them. And then to hear this, um, to hear that their, their espousal towards uh, management expertise. Well, I suppose all you'd have to look at is the states. The states are the best reflection on what Labor Party management's like. And our my state, Queensland, is probably one of the best ones. At the moment, there are, I think, about $16.4 billion in, in the government in debt. That's what they've chalked up on the state's credit card. And they're moving. They're moving towards, I think, approximately now between 40 and 50 billion dollars in debt. Now, the person who was responsible for that, the treasurer of Queensland, well, who was at the time the treasurer, what have they done to her? Someone who has been so uh, completely devoid of any any management expertise. What do they? What prize do they present her? She is now the premier. She is now the premier of Queensland. But I would counsel. Senator Carr very strongly when he talks about deceit and deception and all those things that are involved in it and things that have happened in the past and things that should be addressed and the truth that should be tabled because there's some truths that have never been tabled and I hope someday they might be tabled in here because there are a lot of answers that are required and maybe this government only has another four or five days to go maybe but it would be an absolute, another travesty of justice if those people who are involved in the, who have been suffering for so long from so many acts have to once again put aside any hope of those acts ever being dealt with. Senator Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I wish to take note of uh, the answers given today by Senator Minchin, but before I do that, I I detect, uh, as maybe you do yourself, Mr Deputy President, in the comments that are being made about the backgrounds of Labor Party minister or shadow ministers and members of parliament, that there's some sort of uh, inverted snobbery about what our backgrounds might be. It almost appears, from what Senator Joyce just said, that we should be born to rule and that they are born to rule and they are better at it and we should just get on with it and go back to serfdom, where our forebears came from. I just remind you, Mr Deputy President, that even the House of Lords now has been reformed. Even the House of Lords, Senator Joyce, is elected. Mr, Acting Deputy, or Mr. Deputy President, <coughs> Senator Minchin gave a pretty hysterical response to questions in relation to government advertising. And I suppose that reflects really the degree of desperation that the government is experiencing at the moment, particularly with its senior levels of management. Because I've always, and I've expressed this before, I've always had uh, a lot of time for the integrity of Senator Minchin. But today I thought he was quite shameless in his uh, hysterical, uh, un unfounded attack on the uh, state Labor governments but indeed trying to defend the position that uh, is clearly indefensible. I'm assuming that uh, Senator Minchin was a member of the Shadow Cabinet uh, before 1996. And unfortunately, I was going to play the uh, who said this game that Senator Abetz does, but Senator McEwen mentioned it in her question to the minister. Let me just quote from a press release on the 5th of September, almost now, 12 years ago, by then Leader of the Opposition, John Howard. Let me just pull out from that press release, Mr Deputy President, some quotes. Of course, Senator McEwen has already mentioned this first bit, but I'll go again with it. Let me start with this. In a desperate attempt to find an election life raft, the Prime Minister is beginning an unprecedented propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money. Now, I've already alerted to you, Mr Deputy President, that that was, in fact, John Howard said that. He further went on to say this. They don't want their money—this is taxpayers—they don't want their money wasted on glossy advertising designed to make the Prime Minister feel good. He went further. He said, there is clearly a massive difference between necessary government information for the community and blatant 
electoral government propaganda. And finally, Mr. Act Mr. Deputy President, he said this. The problem for this government is not communication. The problem is that it is tired. It has broken too many promises. It has hurt too many people. This propaganda blitz will make the electorate feel even more angry. Now, aren't those prophetic words, Mr. Deputy President? They could well be the, last, the dying words of the government that uh, we are preside, presiding over Canberra at this moment. We could well mention that, as has been highlighted by Senator Carr, that almost since this government has been in power, nearly one and a half billion dollars has been spent on an election on, on advertising blitz. It appears that in the next uh, period, it's up to $500 million is going to be spent on advertising. Let me make this point, Mr Deputy President, because I know my time is going to uh, expire shortly. If we applied the money that has been used for blatant electoral propaganda by the government, we could have paid for 28,000 secondary school teachers. We could have paid for 32,000 nurses. We could have taken steps to fix the skills shortage. Yet, all we've seen, and just two examples, Mr. Acting, Mr. Deputy President, we saw that shameless advertising on the GST that unchained my heart, and even uh, now they're planning a climate change uh, advertising blitz for a group of people Senator Hutchins, that don't believe in it. Senator Hutchins, your time has expired. Senator McGoran. Uh, Mr Deputy President, there's something very phony about the Labor Party this, this week, uh, even previous, but especially most this week, as we most likely have the last week of the parliament but before an election, is something very phony, and it came out in the last two speakers. Because uh, two days into this week, they have feigned a concern a connection, they say, with the households of Australia in regard to housing affordability and the pressures households are feeling with the increased prices in the area of groceries, etc. Now, they have not, on a Tuesday afternoon, in what is a most valuable debating period on air, been able to sustain that debate. They have gone right off the economics and back to what they know best, and that is personal abuse, an attack, a personal attack on the leader. Of, uh, of the Senate and no less the Prime Minister led by Senator Carr. Now, if you're going to allow Senator Carr lead your, uh, question, uh, take note of questions, then you're not serious about the economic debate. And if there was one message given to the Labor Party at the last election in 2004, which they ought to carry into this coming election, that is establish your economic credentials. Well, they are so phony they can't even sustain the economic debate for two days, which we will always welcome. They are so phony, the Labor Party, in calling themselves economic conservatives now, when we know throughout the past decade of this government there was not a reform that brought the economy to its sound state it is today, not a reform that the Labor Party did not, uh, did not reject. And now they wish the Australian people to accept them as economic conservatives. It was not so long ago that the leader of the opposition, Mr Rudd, declared himself a democratic socialist and said there ought to be a red line through every policy of government. Red line through every policy of government. There's something phony about a leader who says that no less than eight months ago and now is wanting to be called an economic conservative. There's something phony about an opposition here in the Senate that can not sustain an economic debate for two days, feign, uh, feign a concern for the, uh, uh, the mortgage payments of the households, but can, will not get up in this chamber and debate it on air. There's something very phony about an opposition who will not recognise the fundamentals of this economy, which they say they would support its government's policies, they, they, they will not, not accept the fundamentals of this economy are in good, sound order. And, our, and the leader of the uh, uh, government uh, quoted the I IMF in declaring Australia's economy as sound and one of the best in the world because 
of the hard decisions made to bring about that, those reforms. Here, here. There's something very phony about the a Labor Party that, that, uh, that, that itself presided, when in government, over 17 per cent interest rates in housing mortgages, 24 per cent in small businesses, presided over a million unemployed, $96 billion of debt and so on. You know the story. There's something phony about a Labor Party when in government instituted those policies and now want to be called economic conservatives. And as I say, well, that's what they did in government. If you want to know what they did in opposition, they voted against every single reform this government introduced Shame. so as to bring about the sound economy that is now being praised by the International Monetary Fund. And as I say, there's something phony about uh, the Labor Party when their leader tells us he's a socialist democrat not some eight months ago and now he wants us to believe He's a, 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 an economic conservative. And there's something even more phony when you make the potentially the Minister for Industry, Mr Kim Carr, who runs on trust. That was his debate today. Trust in the Prime Minister. His own side don't trust him. And you know it yourself. And, and to, to, to think that he is the potential Minister for Industry must send a shiver up industry's spine. I can't believe if by chance you're elected, you'll ever make him minister for anything. It's a disgrace you've got him on, on the front line. There's something phony about Senator Carr being uh, the minister for industry, and you know it yourself. It's as laughable as Rasputin in the, uh, and his credibility in the Tsar's court. There's something very phony about the other side. When there's something very phony about the other side when they say they're not run by the unions, yet 70% of the front Magoran, bench your is time made up has of expired. unions. Uh, Senator Kirk. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers uh, given today um, to questions asked by the opposition, uh, particularly those asked of um, Leader of the Government, Senator Minchin. Mr Deputy President, the Howard government has wasted almost $2 billion on government advertising since it came to power in 1996. In fact, since the last election, it has spent more than $800 million on government advertising. In fact, $126.3 million of um, advertising was uh, spent just in the last financial year. We've heard today, Mr Deputy President, from uh, other speakers that the estimated cost of this government's propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money in this election year, 2007, is estimated to be more than $500 million. That is half a billion dollars, Mr Deputy President. Meanwhile, of course, Australian working families continue to struggle not only with interest rate, rate hikes but also the increasing price of food and petrol. This demonstrates just how completely out of touch the Howard government has become with the plight of Australian working families. It also shows the government's arrogance, which appears to view taxpayers' money as its own to spend however it sees fit. In the short time I have available, Mr Deputy President, I'd like to take the Senate through a few examples of the government's expenditure on advertising campaigns in key policy areas, beginning first with the government's extreme IR laws. This government has spent $93 million advertising its extreme IR laws. The Howard government's changes to work choices have been Another, a further extravagant excuse to spend more of taxpayers' money on advertising these unfair laws in an election year in the lead-up to the poll later, later on this year. These laws, as we know, have shown themselves to be exactly what the Labor Party said they would be, that is, unpopular, extreme and unfair, and they have hit working families very, very hard. No amount of taxpayer-funded advertising will change the substance of these laws, Mr Deputy President, yet this doesn't stop the Howard government trying to fool the Australian public with its taxpayer-funded advertising. $20.5 million alone was spent on the campaign to, prom to promote the Office of Workplace Services and the Office of the Employment Advocate. 
A further $40 million was spent on promoting the Employee Advisory Program, a program designed to encourage employers to promote work choices. Mr Deputy President, when Australians see these ads on TV, they should shudder at the expense because every tax dollar that the government uh, spends on advertising is one less dollar that can be um, spent by, by Australian families on clothing, children's education, groceries and other essentials of life. Moving now to climate change, the government has recently launched a $52 million campaign on climate change, including $23 million in advertising. The campaign includes an expensive series of television advertisements and a booklet to be mailed to every household in this nation. The government has consistently, as we know, overpromised and underdelivered when it comes to climate change. Since 1996, the Howard government has failed to deliver on almost $460 million of funding it promised to climate change initiatives. As a consequence, Mr Deputy President, less than 0.05 of percent of the $245 billion federal budget is being spent on climate change initiatives. Mr Deputy President, 0.05 is a blood alcohol limit, not a climate change strategy. I could go on, Mr Deputy President, uh, to talk about the money that's been spent on superannuation advertising—$69 million. Private health insurance. The government spent $27 million on advertising private health insurance. It spent $6 million on advertising regional telecommunications, and $20 million has been spent on advertising government internet policies. Mr Deputy President, a Labor government, a Rudd Labor government, will end the abuse of taxpayer-funded government advertising. A Rudd Labor government will cut spending on government advertising and ensure that all advertising campaigns costing more than $250,000 will expired, be time has expired, Senator Kirk. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Stott to Spoyer. Deputy President, I wish to take note of the answer provided uh, to me today from Minister Coonan, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, in relation to my question on Sudan and uh, the issue of peacekeeping uh, for forces. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I know that, especially with an election looming, we're all very focused, understandably, on key uh, and pressing domestic issues. But I just wanted to raise the issue of peacekeeping in this place, especially when we're dealing with is not a looming international crisis, but is uh, an international crisis in uh, Darfur in Sudan. We commemorated in this uh, nation last week, September 14, uh, the anniversary of um, the first UN peacekeeping mission, the 60th anniversary it was last week. And indeed, uh, Australia has a proud history in peacekeeping missions. Uh, four Australians were the first personnel of a multinational force deployed to Indonesia to monitor a ceasefire between the Dutch colonialists and Indonesian republicans uh, so those 60 years ago. And since then, I'm proud to see that our country has uh, uh, provided huge contributions in, to peacekeeping missions—73 missions we've participated in in 64 countries. Uh, I note today, Mr Deputy President, there was an interjection from at least one senator. Remember East Timor? Of course, the Democrats uh, more than most remember East Timor because of our long and proud uh, support for uh, East Timorese independence over a long period of time. But we commended not only the government role, but the role of our troops in that particular peacekeeping force. But that was 1999, when Australia was ranked seventh, seventh in the world in terms of our contribution to peacekeeping missions. Where are we now, Mr Deputy President? Well, as of last weekend, reports suggest 67th. Our world ranking is 67th. Now, that's completely inappropriate uh, for a nation um, like ours, a nation that is committed to a number of conflicts, a number of theatres of war at the moment. And I use the figures in my question to the minister today, the fact that we have 1,575 uh, personnel uh, deployed to uh, Iraq. Obviously, that's, uh, uh, that's the, uh, the big, biggest single deployment that Australia has in terms of a theatre at the moment. Um, where that number is part of 160,000 coalition troops. Now, I'm not suggesting, Mr Deputy President, that we can't or aren't making a difference there, but think of the difference. A comparable or even a few troops or personnel, uh, a sum of that number, 
being deployed to a UN peacekeeping mission such as that in Sudan, what significance that would have. So, Mr Deputy President, I would like the government to answer more specifically, and I note that the minister came back with additional comments today, but why have we declined? Why is our world ranking so comparatively bad, given our proud history, given the resources we currently have? And I acknowledge the ADF deployment uh, around 15 troop, uh, uh, 15 personnel in southern Sudan. But please remember, colleagues, that this is a different conflict. There may be some overlap, but this is a different conflict uh, in relation to um, uh, uh, Operation Azure that uh, is, is currently deployed in Sudan. I'm talking about Darfur, where we know we know that there is a crisis that is unfolding. We know that we should be playing a bigger part. We have anything from 200,000 to more than 400,000 people died, two and a half million people displaced. I'm not sure, Mr Deputy President, if colleagues are recently aware of, of well, the most recent fighting, uh, despite negotiations between warring parties. Um, but even uh, in the last couple of Days, the last couple of weeks, certainly September 10, uh, September 11, uh, resulted in a number of civilian deaths as well. Recent attacks by helicopter gunships, um, of course, uh, Sudanese government uh, and ground forces. These resulted in many civilian deaths. And I'm not sure, Mr. Deputy President, if our country is aware of its obligations. We've all said not another Rwanda, not another Rwanda, but this is the situation that is happening in Darfur. And I plea, I urge this government, in the midst of all this electioneering, please spare a thought for what is going on in Darfur. We have a proud history of peacekeeping, Mr Deputy President. I want to hear from this government why we aren't heeding calls to support what is a UN-backed mission, as opposed to Iraq, which, let's remember, was not. Why are we declining in terms of our peacekeeping contributions? And secondly, why specifically are we not involved in Darfur? Because we shouldn't have that blood on our hands as a nation. I hope that we do not. I don't want to see another Rwanda, and I urge all colleagues uh, to find out what on earth is going on with our government's deployment strategy in this regard. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Stott to spoil be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. It is uh, with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 16th of September 2007 of Peter Robert Cleland, a member of the House of Representatives for the Division of McEwen, Victoria, from 1984 to 1990 and 1993 to 1996. Petitions, Clark. Petitions have been lodged in accordance with the list circulated to senators. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion? Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Pursuant to notice given on the last day of sitting, I shall now withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for today, on behalf of the Standing Committee on Regulations and All Users. Further notices of motion? Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, Deputy President. I give notice that on tomorrow I will move that the Senate notes a that the Australian government has announced an additional one million to help the people of Lebanon, one million dollars to help the people of Lebanon clear unexploded cluster munitions. B notes that the Australian government describes itself as taking a leading role in negotiating a new treaty to limit the use of cluster weapons. And C calls on the Australian government to show real international leadership and delay the impending purchase of new cluster weapons until after the Oslo process negotiations to limit the spread of cluster weapons. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate notes that the Tasmanian government is moving to water down its firearm laws, that the proposed changes in clear breach of the National Firearms Agreement would allow minors 12 to 16 years of age in Tasmania to use powerful weapons in the bush, providing their under adult supervision. Three, under the National Firearms Agreement, states resolve to implement laws requiring genuine reasons for owning, possessing or using a firearm. Notes that until the National Firearms Agreement and the gun buyback in 1996, guns were the weapon of choice for suicide in Tasmania. Notes that Tasmania has a rate of suicide 65 per cent higher than the rest of the country. 
and calls on the government to intervene and insist that Premier Lennon and the Tasmanian government uphold the undertakings that were agreed under the National Firearms Agreement negotiated after the Port Arthur massacre. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you again, Deputy President. Um, I'll move, I'll give notice that I'll move tomorrow that the Senate endorses the Prime Minister's comment that, and I quote, the final decision to go ahead with the project, Guns Pulp Mill, would be subject to all environmental considerations being fully satisfied. End of quote. Senator Nettle. Thank you. Um, I give notice that on Thursday I shall remove that the Senate notes recent statements by the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation that ANSTO cannot give a firm time as to when the Lucas Heights nuclear reactor would be operational and calls on the government to use the reactor's closure as an opportunity to permanently close this nuclear white elephant. Further notices of motion. Further no Senator Nettle. Thank you. I give notice on Thursday I shall move that the Senate notes the tragic loss of over the 90 lives in the devastating bushfires that have raged across Greece in the last month, the loss of livestock, native fauna and flora and thousands of acres of mature trees, that the Australian government has donated $3 million in aid to Greece via the Greek Red Cross and that the, Australian, and that the government has further promised a number of Australian bushfire experts to assist Greek authorities and calls on the government to investigate expanding the scope of Australian aid to Greece and to pledge Australian aid support for appropriate replacement tree planting programs. Further notices of motion. Further notices of motion. There are none. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? The clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of General Business Notice number 897 to the 19th of September and General Business Notice number 911 to the 19th of September. Further postponement or rearrangement of the business? If not, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion number 3 relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Abetz. I move the motion. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I ask the general business notices of motion numbers 904 and 905 relating to committee meetings be taken together as formal. Is there any objection to these motions being taken together? And as formal, there being no objection, I call Senator Parry. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move the two motions. The question is that those motions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Nettle, we'll thank deal you. with your privileges matter. Yes, I ask that um, business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in my name for today, relating to the reference to the Committee of Privileges, evidence concerning um, Mr Mumdu Habib be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Nettle. Uh, thank you. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Abetz. Yeah, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a brief statement in relation to this matter. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Abetz. I thank the Senate. At the outset, I feel obliged to inform the Senate that there are legal proceedings before the courts on related matters. As Senator Nettle well knows, the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee wrote to a number of officials seeking clarification of evidence given in relation to Mahmoud Habib's uh, detention. Those officials have responded in detail, confirming the accuracy of their evidence. In addition, though, those officials have offered to address any outstanding concerns the committee may have in relation to their evidence. Rather than identifying a specific concern, Senator Nettle has elected to stand up in the Senate with this motion. One can only assume that her real concern is not in resolving a real issue in a practical way, but rather to grandstand in this place. Nevertheless, we do not oppose the reference and will support due process being exhausted. Senator Nettle. Thank you. I seek leave to take note. 
or to make or a short to statement. Make a short statement. Yes. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Nettle. Um, thank you. This is a matter that I've been following for some time now, what Australian government officials knew about the rendition and the torture of Mamdou Habib in Egypt. It is a matter that I have followed through all of the proper processes with the Senate. Um, with the President and with the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee to try to get to the bottom of that very important question about what Australian governments knew, what the Australian government and its authorities knew about the transfer of Mamdou Habib to Egypt and what he experienced there. Um, I wasn't intending on going on public record now to talk about the discussions that have occurred in the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee where I've been putting forward the view that I have put forward in public as well that there needs to be an inquiry so that we can get to the bottom of this matter. That's the view that I have expressed consistently in the public, to this Senate and to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee because I think it's a really important matter that the public need to, needs to understand what did Australian government know about the rendition and the torture of an Australian citizen, Mamdu Habib. And I still want to know the answers to those questions, and I'm going to continue to pursue it. Yeah. Senator Stott Despoir. Thank you. I seek leave to make a very short statement on behalf of the Democrats. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Stott Despoir. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I just want to put on record that the Democrats supported this reference and that uh, regardless of what some people may think of the motivations uh, in relation to this, uh, uh, this reference, uh, I'm satisfied that Senator Nettle has pursued due process. Um, in terms of getting it to this point, the particular issue. I also think there are some incredibly important outstanding questions and I'm absolutely confident and I'm sure that colleagues are, those who've uh, read the Hansard or looked at uh, Senate estimates and other proceedings, that there are some stark and clear contradictions that need to be resolved and I look forward to seeing those contradictions resolved. And uh, yes, for that reason we gladly and a bit more graciously than some supported the motion. All right. Uh, we now move on to 906. Um, Senator Lynn Allison, I believe that's yours. Sen Senator Lynn Allison. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I ask that General Business no a notice of motion number 906, standing my name for today, relating to the Nuclear Safeguards Agreement with Russia, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Lynn Allison. I move the motion, standing in my name. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Speaker. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Allison be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Campbell, Senator Campbell teller for the ayes and Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order the result of the division there being 32 ayes and 34 noes. The matter is resolved in the, in the negative. I'd remind senators there may be further divisions. Um, Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 907, standing on my name for today, relating to public transport in Australia, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Allison. I move the motion, standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, and against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Allison be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Bartlett teller for the ayes and Senator Parry teller for the noes.
Order the result of the division there being nine ayes and 53 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Um, Senator Seawitt, do you have a motion? Senator Seawitt. Mr President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number um, 910, standing in my name for today, relating to the National Close the Gap Day, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Seawitt. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order the result of the division, there being eight ayes and 54 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Seward. Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 908, standing in my name today, for today, relating to housing affordability, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? 
There being none, I call on Senator Seward. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes, Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order. As a result of the division, there being nine ayes and 50 noes, motion is de declared in the negative. I think that concludes formal motions. I present a response from the 
former Premier of Queensland, Mr Beattie, to a resolution of the Senate of 13 August 2007 concerning Queensland local government. Um, Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I'd like to seek leave to move a motion to take note of that response. Is leave granted? There, there being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, this response from the now former Premier uh, of Queensland, Mr Beattie, responds to the Senate resolution um, of uh, August 13th, uh, which was supported by the Democrats and the Coalition uh, and was actually originally moved by Senator Boswell, the National Senator for Queensland, uh, which criticised the BD government for their forced amalgamations in Queensland local government uh, expressed concern at the decision to impose fines on councillors who put the amalgamation policy to local citizens by referendum and uh, noted the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which states that every citizen should have the right and opportunity to take part in the conduct of public affairs. Uh, the Democrats supported that resolution, which was opposed by the uh, ALP, uh, and we're particularly pleased to see uh, the government and indeed Senator Boswell. Uh, draw on the International Convention of Civil and Political Affairs and the importance of people having the right and opportunity to take part in the conduct of public affairs, particularly affairs that affect them directly. Uh, the response from the Queensland Government, whilst um, partly redundant because the Senate has now passed legislation addressing the issue of uh, the potential for people to have fines imposed on them uh, for putting a question to referendum about the amalgamations. Uh, and also because the state government has subsequently uh, reversed the issue, they reversed their position, so they will no longer take action against local governments who wish to uh, hold a plebiscite. Uh, so that that aspect of the resolution is is basically redundant, both by actions of the Senate and the actions of the Queensland government. And the letter or response from Mr. Beatty himself says that the um, state government in Queensland has. Uh, reconsidered their position and are no longer going to take such action. But it does still leave the issue of the forced amalgamations, uh, which uh, the Queensland Government is still pressing ahead with, I believe, uh, without any change in stance at all, despite a new Premier now coming uh, into the position in Ms Anna, Pli Ma Ms. Anna Bly. Uh, there are a couple of aspects of the Premier's response, therefore, that do merit comment. Um, firstly, that uh, the letter or response says that the reform, so-called, of Queensland's local government to amalgamations uh, occurred in light of um, reviews conducted by the Queensland Treasury Corporation, which, I quote, um, demonstrated that a significant number of local governments are in a financially precarious position. Now, I firstly note that that assessment, at least in part, is seriously disputed by some councils and by the Local Government Association of Queensland. And secondly, that uh, I think it's less than the full story, if not misleading, for the Premier or former Premier to state that the decision to implement reform came about solely because of these reviews conducted by the Queensland Treasury Corporation. There was, of course, already a, uh, an ongoing and comprehensive reform process that was about a lot more than just amalgamations uh, that covered a wide range of issues going specific t specifically to improving efficiency and uh, also uh, increasing the um, uh, opportunities for uh, um, made, enabling uh, financial stability uh, through a range of measures beyond just amalgamation. So that process was already underway and that is not mentioned. Uh, the response from the Premier, former Premier also states that uh, the government had, state government had to act now to uh, so-called strengthen the local government system uh, because elections were due in March of next year. Now, it was uh, widely acknowledged and widely floated that uh, to ensure sufficient time to bed down any amalgamations that it was quite feasible to uh, postpone those elections till later in uh, 2008. Uh, the Local Government Act could have been amended quite readily by the state government to allow that to happen in the same way that they amended the Local Government Act to allow amalgamations to be forced through without uh, any referendum, uh, a requirement that was previously there. 
under the law, and indeed that requirement under the law was used to reassure people at, state, at local government level around Queensland that there wouldn't be forced amalgamations because the right to have a referendum was there under law at Queensland level. Uh, that was just uh, removed um, uh, precipitously by the Queensland Parliament, which of course only has a single chamber, does not have an upper house and is controlled by the government of the day. And it shows what happens when a government controls uh, a parliament completely, whether it's a single house or both houses. Uh, whatever's there in the law one day can be uh, removed the next uh, when there's political opportunity or political um, points to be scored. Uh, and that's what happened in Queensland. So the, the uh, response from the, the former Premier, I think, is, is somewhat uh, less than complete and somewhat misleading. Uh, and it does still leave uh, open the, the fact that there is significant community concern in Queensland about these uh, forced amalgamations and uh, a real question mark about how adequately they will uh, uh, operate. But the other point I wanted to emphasise is the uh, noting about the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the, the Queensland National Party Senators uh, um, drawing upon the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which of course uh, the Democrats supported. I haven't noticed National Party Senators in Queensland drawing on the uh, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights terribly often in the past, but it's always good to see them uh, moving in that direction. It is worth noting um, with disappointment to two aspects. Uh, the commentary that uh, was made in the resolution and uh, indeed by many from the coalition about the need for referendums and the importance and benefit of them, uh, that uh, the National Party in Queensland did not take the opportunity to fulfil its pledge to hold a referendum in Queensland when it was last in government. Uh, a key pre-election pledge of the then Borbage opposition was to hold a referendum uh, to reinstitute an upper house in Queensland. Uh, that key pre-election pledge was broken. Uh, despite the fact that it was a uh, not insignificant reason why uh, various preferences flowed to the uh, coalition and made the National Party the party, um, the senior party of government in Queensland probably for the last time um, ever. Uh, they did not fulfil that pledge, they did not hold that referendum, they did not ask the people of Queensland their view and therefore the Queensland Parliament is still without an upper house and uh, it is no small irony that uh, if there had been an upper house, if that referendum had been held, then probably the local government amalgamations would not have gone through. Uh, the other point that I wanted to emphasise is that the, uh, another key right of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which also dovetails in to the resolution passed by the Senate, uh, is the right of self-determination. It's actually uh, part one of Article one of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, that all peoples have the right to self-determination. Uh, so again, um, whilst the Democrats supported the resolution put forward by the coalition and by Senator Boswell uh, and express our um, dissatisfaction with the inadequate response from the former Premier, Mr Beatty, uh, it's hard not to see the double standards here uh, because, of course, just last week the uh, federal government refused to support uh, the adoption of the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and gave as a key reason uh, their concern with the um, article contained in that convention which recognised the rights of Indigenous peoples to self-determination, floating the completely false and misleading suggestion that that might lead to some form of separatism, uh, even though there was uh, a clear indication in the convention that that was uh, not how it should be interpreted. Uh, it seems that uh, asking people uh, to have a part and celebrating and demanding the right of people to have a opportunity to take part in the conduct of public affairs and decisions directly affecting them is okay when it comes to local councils in Queensland, but it's not okay when it comes to Indigenous Australians, uh, whether it's the refusal to support uh, plebiscites for Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, uh, an amendment which, uh, again, uh, the Coalition voted against uh, in regard to this issue when the legislation was being debated last night, uh, but also when it comes to uh, other parts of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights uh, where um, that uh, uh, old position of uh, refusing to support some of its basic components uh, once again resurfaced. Uh, it is unfortunate when you get that um, double standards there because it does undermine the strength of the argument that's put forward. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the Democrats will maintain our consistent position. We will continue to uh, express our strong concern with the 
uh, Queensland state government's uh, ongoing insistence on forced amalgamations in Queensland. Uh, but uh, I think the key issue from here is maintaining the focus on what does actually happen uh, and trying to maintain the pressure that uh, whatever path happens from here, uh, there is actually uh, maximum opportunity for people to have uh, more potential to genuinely take part in the conduct of public affairs, as noted in the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and uh, celebrated and supported by the Senate and uh, the Coalition via Senator Boswell's resolution. Thank you. No further comment. Any documents by ministers? Are the questions is the Senate take note of the document? Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Presentation of documents by ministers. I think. Are there any reports from committees? No reports from committees. Are there any documents presented by the clerk? The clerk. Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to senators. Thank you. We now move on to committee memberships. No committee membership changes. Messages from the House of Representatives. Thank you. A message has been received from the House of Representatives for the Quarantine Amendment, Commission of Inquiry Bill 2007, for concurrence. Senator Brandis. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Thank you. Questions that motion be agreed to? Those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Quarantine Act 1908 and for other purposes. Minister, Senator Brown. I move that this bill be now read a second time, but I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Just leave granted for the second reading incorporation. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Senator Brandis. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Brandis. I move that the resumption of the debate be in our order of the day for a later hour. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007 for concurrence. Call the Minister, Senator Brandis. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Questions that motion be agreed to? The opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to provide for the reporting and dissemination of information related to greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas projects, energy production and energy consumption and for other purposes. Mr. Senator Brandis. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There'd be no objection. Leave is granted. Uh, Minister. I move that the, the debate be now adjourned. Does that motion be agreed to? That opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you. Clark. Business of the Senate Order of the Day, number one, Employment, Workplace Relations and Education Committee report to be presented. Um, Senator, the whip. Yeah, on behalf of the Chair of the Employment, Workplace Relations and Education Committee, Senator Troth, I present the report of the Committee on the Provisions of the Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures, um, measures No. 2 Bill 2007, together with submissions received by the Committee and move that the report be printed. Does that motion be agreed to? That being say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures number four, Bill 2007, and Associated Bills. Second reading, adjourned debate. Attention, the State of the Chamber. Quorum not present, ring the bells.
quorum required, Senator Sherry, Tax Laws Amendment Number 5. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, we're dealing with um, tax for tax laws amendment four and tax laws amendment five um, that have been listed together for debate. Um, I intend to limit uh, my contribution to only some of the schedules due to the combination of the two tax bills and the time constraints in dealing with what are two relatively large uh, tax measures. Schedule 1 repeals the existing foreign loss and foreign tax credit quarantining rules and replaces them with new simplified foreign income tax offset rules. The main measure is the abolition of foreign loss and foreign tax credit quarantining and the rewriting of the remaining complex foreign tax credit rules as part of the 1977 Tax Act. The rewritten tax offset rules also reduce compliance and administration costs through the removal of the foreign tax credit as a remedy for the double taxation for transferring pricing adjustment in another country, the inclusion of a $1,000 de minimis cap and the removal of attributed tax accounts. The amendment means that taxpayers will no longer be required to quarantine accessible foreign income accounts into four separate classes. Excess foreign income deductions or foreign losses will no longer be quarantined for domestic accessible income. Therefore, in utilising deductions, no distinction is made in respect of the source of the accessible income, whether foreign or domestic, which will reduce compliance costs. The bill also allows taxpayers with a minority interest in foreign companies to choose to calculate attributable income using the CFC branch equivalent rules rather than the Foreign Investment Fund FIF rules. This should reduce compliance costs for taxpayers and financial institutions that have to deal with the notoriously complex FIF rules and will allow Australian investors to take advantage of the existing exemptions and concessions of the CFC measures. These amendments go some way in making Australia's international tax rules more competitive. However, there is so much more that this um, tired, out-of-touch, stale government could do. Um, they've been sitting on their hands when it comes to ensuring Australia's financial services sector can grow and become a financial hub within Asia. Labor will reform Division 6C and replace the division with a specified, specific tax regime for managed funds and listed property trusts. This announcement was in addition to the Labor leader Kevin Rudd's announcement in the May budget reply to reduce the withholding tax rate that applies to non-residents investors to a flat and final rate of 15 per cent. These measures, proposals of, and policy of Labor demonstrate our commitment to Australia's economic future, sensible tax changes that value add and were welcomed by the financial services sector. I also note that these changes in Schedule 1 were announced in the 2005 budget. It's taken far too long, over two years, to legislate this, which I think again leads to a question mark over the government's general handling of ensuring a translation of budget announcements into legislation in a timely manner. Schedule 3 to this bill contains amendments to the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, commonly known as SIS to provide an exemption from the borrowing prohibition to allow superannuation funds to invest in instalment warrants so long as certain borrowing criteria are met. The in-house asset rules contained in the CIS Act are also amended to allow for the purchase of an interest in a related trust forming part of an instalment warrant if certain conditions are met. This measure overcomes the ATO, the tax office, and uh, the Australian Prudential Regulators, author, Regulatory Authority's view that instalment warrant arrangements constitute a form of borrowing and that, uh, are invested, and that an investment by a self-managed superannuation fund in an instalment warrant is an in-house asset and therefore breaches the borrowing provisions and in-house asset rules of the CIS Act. Labor believes this proposal will assist superannuation funds to grow their assets to support Australians in their retirement and, as a result, supports the measure. 
Schedule 4, amends the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936. So the trustees of closely held trusts are no longer required to report to the Commissioner of Taxation details of the trust's ultimate beneficiaries. Instead, trustees of closely held trusts are now only required to report details of the trust's trustee beneficiaries. The ultimate beneficiary rules were introduced by this government in 1999 as an anti-avoidance measure aimed at preventing complex chains of trusts being used to avoid or indefinitely defer tax. The measure in this bill goes back on the government's own closely held unit trust integrity measures of 1999. However, the amendments will reduce the costs of complying with the ultimate beneficiary rules, but maybe at the cost to the integrity of the tax system. Labor supports this proposal to reduce the compliance burden at the compliance costs, but will monitor the operation of this to ensure it does not open up possibilities of tax avoidance. Schedule 5 amends various acts to assist in the smooth transition to the uh, simple, I was going to say simplified superannuation regime, but I've noticed of late the government no longer describing it as the simplified superannuation. It seems to have morphed into what's called better superannuation. I wonder what focus group polling has been uh, driving that uh, quite um, significant change in title description. I have to say everyone I've met in terms of the better super package that's now been dubbed by the government it hasn't particularly seen as, a, as a, an exercise in simplification. Schedule 5 makes the following minor amendments to the superannuation rules. It limits strategies which could circumvent the minimum drawdown requirements for account-based pensions, facilitate the provision of tax file numbers to superannuation retirement savings accounts, changes the treatment of a non-TFN contributions income under the pay-as-you-go PAYG regime and revise the application of the Small Business Capital Gains Tax Relief Amendments. On the issue of the tax file numbers, what I don't think is generally known in terms of the better superannuation package is that a penalty tax will be payable by the member on their contribution, I think of 42.5, um, rather than 15 per cent on contributions. Now, I don't think most, uh, uh, most Australians are aware that they'll be subject to a higher tax on contributions when their employer fails to provide their TFN number. Now, in questioning uh, the tax office closely at estimates about this, I think, um, and I must say, the tax office were more forthcoming uh, with information than the, um, the uh, Treasury were. We're probably looking at maybe five, perhaps five to eight per cent of the just over 10 million contributors to our system being penalised by this higher tax. I mean, these people are going to be in for a rude shock when they get their fund statement, conveniently after the election, of course, um, from July 1 next year. We're going to have hundreds of thousands of people suddenly discover that they've been subject to higher tax, not lower tax. And um, if Labor is in government, I just indicate this is an area where we will be um, having to keep a very close eye on the outcomes. Because frankly, if we are in government, and if I'm privileged to be a minister, I don't want to be sitting next to Treasury and tax officials having to defend hundreds of thousands of, um, having to defend a position where hundreds of thousands of Australians have actually been, had an increase in their contributions tax. But um, we'll see, well, I have to say, for the hundreds of thousands of people facing the, um, the prospect of higher tax, it's not particularly safe, as they will discover, no matter who's in government, no matter who's in government. I certainly believe the tax office and all the evidence to date are doing their very best to minimise this problem, but uh, it is going to be a significant issue. Um, that's my prediction. Um, the amendments also provide the readability of provisions rewritten as part of the simplified uh, superannuation reforms and clarify the intended operations of the reforms. Um, these are, I think, changes, important changes around the edges of the new regime, and of course. The current uh, superannuation regime is built on Labor's superannuation policy of compulsion that we introduced back in 1987, starting at 3 per cent, rising to 9 per cent through the SG. But the measures that we are presented with are sensible and Labor supports them. Schedule 8 claims to provide more flexibility to family trusts by allowing family trust election to be varied or evoked in a broad range of circumstances and expands the definition of a family to include lineal descendants. 
Also, distributions to former spouses, widows, widowers and former stepchildren will be exempt from family distribution tax. These measures come at a cost to revenue of some $8 million per annum. Schedule 8 reflects, I think, an out-of-touch government and a strange idea of priorities in tax reform. Um, the measures simply make the family trust rules more generous. It's hard to see how it benefits the average taxpayer or the economy as a whole. I find it particularly hard to see how the lineal descendants of nieces and nephews can be appropriately described as family members for taxation purposes. The assistant uh, uh, shadow treasurer, Mr Bowen, moved an amendment in the House of Representatives removing Schedule 8 from the bill. Now, I won't be moving it in the Senate here uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, time just does not allow us. We're under enormous time constraints. But Labor believes that the $8 million per annum this schedule will cost taxpayers could be better spent on other projects. Tax Law is 5. Labor supports the measures contained in this bill. I first turn to Schedule 1 of the bill, which reforms sections 51 AD and Division 16D of the 1936 Tax Act, reform which is vital in facilitating private sector investment in infrastructure, and it is long overdue. It's been a long wait, seven years in fact, since reforms to these provisions to encourage infrastructure investment were first recommended by the Ralph Review. We've seen three different assistant treasurers in that time. Gosh, doesn't time fly when you're having fun in opposition? Three different uh, assistant treasurers. And each of them has success successively promised to introduce this legislation. <laughs> yes, yes, but seven years on, we finally got the measures. And that's not a shot at the tax office and uh, the, the uh, tax advice in Treasury. I mean, it's a shot at the incompetence of this government. Um, we well know the, uh, the burden, the overload on Treasury and the tax office in terms of implementation, but I think, think this is a product, this time, seven years extraordinary, a waiting period is a product of this churn of assistant Treasurers, government taking its eye off the ball, out of touch, a bit stale. Um, and uh, just not giving it the priority it should have been, it should have been given. Section 51 AD and Division 16D of the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936 are replaced with the new Division 250 in the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1997. If Division 250 applies to an arrangement, capital allowance deductions will be denied and the arrangement will be treated as a deemed loan, that is taxed as a financial arrangement on a compounding accrual basis. <coughs> The changes could do with some fine tuning. However, Labor won't be opposing these changes. The sooner they generally, the sooner they're implemented, the better. The history of this measure demonstrates um, a level of failure on behalf of this government. The review of the business tax, the Ralph Review, recommended in 1999 that Section 51 AD be abolished. In response, the then Minister for Revenue, Assistant Treasurer, Senator Coonan, stated on the 14th of May 2002. Further cons consultation on these issues will be undertaken through the course of 2002-2003 and it is expected the legislation will be introduced in the autumn 2003 sittings. Well, here we are, spring 2007. <laughs> autumn 2003 sittings. And the 2003 draft exposure legislation that was released for comment uh, for, for and by interested stakeholders on the 26th of June 2003, Senator Kernan stated these provisions are in urgent need of reform. The government is committed to its early introduction into Parliament in the spring sittings of 2003. And now here we are, spring of 2007, with the legislation before the Parliament. It's anyone's guess as to how much investment in infrastructure has been lost at the delay that has been caused um, and as a result of the uh, of the four years it's taken to get what was described by the then Minister, Senator Kuhn, as urgent legislation. So it's simply not good enough that this time, at a time of capacity constraints, we all know the, the constraints on, um, on infrastructure, the pressures on infrastructure in, in the economy, that this government has delayed reform of tax rules to encourage investment uh, in infrastructure. This is just yet another example of this government's stale, short-sighted, out-of-touch approach and its lack of vision. However, 
better late than never. Better late than never, and Labor will support the proposal. Schedule six of the bill removes the $100 million total income cap on the same business test. The schedule is particularly pleasing as it implements Labor policy and amendments from 2005. It represents another backflip by the government, a government which would benefit from listening to business and Labor um, in developing tax policy. The same business test, the $100 million cap, was introduced by the government in 2005. Now I can recall Senator Murray's contribution to the debate at that time. Um, we've both got long memories, I know, Senator Murray. Both uh, Labor and Senator Murray, on behalf of the Democrats, opposed it in the Senate in 2005. And uh, Labor consistently called for the removal of the cap, which had stood in the way of major investments in infrastructure projects, mining and venture capital. How right Senator Murray was. How right the Labor opposition was. Um, and here we are, the government's reversing uh, a measure it introduced in 2005. Sending very bad investment signals to industry is this sort of approach by the government. It's dragging its feet on key reforms that will build and assist productivity growth in this country. The measure removes the cap. It was strongly supported by submissions to the inquiry, and this cap should never have been introduced in the first place. The Minerals Council's submission to the Senate inquiry stated that this arbitrary cap was denying legitimate capital allowance business deductions, which ultimately were factored into rates of rate of return assessments and potentially discouraging expansion. This at a time when there was a significant need for inf investment in infrastructure projects in Australia. Now, for a government that claims to be pro-business um, and introduce this cap, um, here we are two years later removing it. I'm glad the government's recognised the error of its ways, and I'm glad the government's adopted Labor policy and Democrat policy, for that matter. Schedule 8 provides a CGT rollover for investors in a stapled group, where there has been an interposition of a unit trust between the investors in the stapled group and the stapled entities. This will allow certain stapled entities, such as Australian listed property trusts, to restructure with an interposed head trust without any CGT consequences. There will also be a consequential amendment to Division 6C of the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936 to ensure that the restructures do not result in the interposed trust being taxed as if it were a company. The measures will reduce the barriers for Australian listed property trusts to expand overseas, particularly in the US. However, the amendments only go a small part of the way to ensuring that Australian listed property trusts remain world leaders. And the Property Council's submission stated the Property Council views these reforms as the first stage of a now widely recognised need to comprehensively reform <coughs> Division 6. Labor could not agree more. As I've already said, Labor has announced that it is committed to reforming Division 6C and reducing and withholding tax rate to 15 per cent. Labor is strongly committed to making Australia uh, the uh, centre of the managed funds hub within the Asian region by increasing the competitiveness of what is a truly massive financial sector and uh, a world a world class financial sector, not just in terms of funds under management, fourth largest by volume in the world, but in terms of the quality, the skill um, uh, of the employees, I think over 300,000 who work in the financial services sector, um, the provision of the platforms, the IT, um, uh, a world class industry which needs further encouragement to enhance its export potential. So Labor supports this schedule, it makes a small step in the right direction. Labor also supports the government's minor amendment to the schedule, which deals with a technical point raised by the Property Council's submission. Schedule 10 of the bill reforms the taxation concessions for Australian films, introduces a new producer offset, which provides an offset of 40 per cent for film and 20 per cent for other media, increases the location offset from 12.5 per cent to 15 per cent. And there are some other changes that are useful for the industry. The offsets are designed to support and develop the Australian screen media industry. They replace the current package of tax incentives that have not been particularly effective in recent times. The independent producer sector has expressed concerns with a new producer offset because commercial broadcasters will be able to access the 20 per cent producer's offset for the television series, documentaries and other programs they produce. Labor notes these concerns. Labor will monitor the effect and the impact on the independent film industry. Um, the remainder of the schedules to this bill enjoy the Labor Party's support. Thank you.
you, Senator Sherry. Senator Murray. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, we're dealing here with uh, five, uh, sorry, four bills uh, cognately, and I think that's wise uh, given the uh, pressure we're under to um, complete our consideration of a large number of bills this week although I would have preferred Tax 5 to be dealt with separately. It's appropriate it's dealt with cognately here. Dealing first with uh, the Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures No. 4 Bill 2007, it is an omnibus bill containing eight schedules. It's accompanied by the Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non-Disclosure Tax Bill No. 1 2007 and the Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non-Disclosure Tax Bill No. 2 2007, which introduce amendments to complement the proposed changes in Schedule 4 of what I'll describe as TLAB 4 by providing mechanisms to introduce a 46.5% non-disclosure tax on certain income. Schedule 1 of TLAB 4 introduces new foreign income tax offset rules. The income tax law will be amended to abolish foreign loss and foreign tax credit quarantining and to streamline the remaining foreign tax credit rules. This is achieved by repealing the existing foreign loss and foreign tax credit quarantining rules and replacing them with new simplified foreign income tax offset rules. These rules also allow taxpayers to claim relief for foreign income taxes paid on an amount included in their assessable income. Transitional rules for the treatment of existing quarantine foreign losses and credits are also included. Such an amendment provides a mechanism to allow the Commission of Taxation to give effect to Australia's tax treaty obligations to provide relief from economic double taxation arising from transfer pricing adjustments. These changes will commence on 1 July 2008, following royal assent. The cost of revenue of this measure is expected to be $40 million per annum over the forward estimates period. Changes to the foreign income tax offset rules in Schedule 1 of this bill are reflective of systemic changes to the taxation system that have removed the original stimulus for the current or, or the, for the present foreign income tax provisions. The ultimate purpose of these changes is to prevent double taxation for Australian income taxpayers, both individuals and corporations who may earn foreign income, and thus the changes are equitable and to be supported. I also agree with the government's view that these changes will reduce compliance and administration costs and increase Australia's attractiveness as a source of capital investment and as a viable home base for international and regional organisations with both Australian and foreign income streams. It should be noted that the nature of the offset only enables Australian taxpayers to reduce their Australian ta income tax liability to zero. There is no mechanism to enable tax rebates through the system, which, if it had happened, would have been a concern. In a submission to the Stat Senate Standing Committee on Economics Inquiry into this bill, the Australian Bankers Association highlighted a number of inconsistencies with the way double taxation is relieved with respect to offshore banking and non-offshore banking income, a view supported by the Australian F Financial Markets Association. In the committee's view, the bill adequately deals with the ABA's concerns related to the schedule. I support the committee's view, but trust that such potential inconsistencies shall be monitored by Treasury with a view to correction should any matters of significance arise. Schedule 2 proposes capital gains tax rollover relief for medical defence organisations or MDOs with proposed amendments to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997. The rollover will generally be available when a membership interest in an MDO is replaced with a similar membership interest in another MDO and both MDOs are companies limited by guarantee. These amendments apply to capital gains tax events that happen on or after the 14th of February 2007. There are no forecast costs associated with these changes. This rollover aims to provide a better allocation of the nation's capital resources by removing capital gains tax as an impediment to mergers and takeovers and MDOs to help facilitate consolidation in the industry where required and or desired. Those who have followed my uh, career as the tax portfolio spokesperson for the Democrats know that I have tried to assist mergers and acquisitions uh, improvements at every opportunity because I think a highly uh, flexible market is in the interests of Australia. Schedule 3 enables investment in instalment warrants by superannuation funds. The amendment as proposed removes a borrowing restriction contained in the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act 1993 to allow superannuation funds to invest in instalment warrants of a limited recourse nature. 
over any asset the fund would be permitted to invest in directly. The in-house asset rules contained in the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act 1993 are also amended to provide an investment in related trust forming part of an eligible instalment warrant arrangement <coughs> will only be an in-house asset where the underlying asset would itself be an in-house asset of the fund if it were held directly. These amendments will apply from the day the bill receives royal assent and are forecast to be a considerable cost to revenue of $350 million over the forecast estimates period, with these costs expected to escalate each year after that, notwithstanding the cost that Democrats support them. Strict rules naturally apply to the operation of superannuation funds to minimise the financial risks such funds are able to undertake. Superannuation has historically been viewed and regulated as a lower risk investment because of the importance of protecting individuals' life savings and retirement funds. One such risk that has been consistently and justly prohibited is any form of leverage, that is superannuation funds are prohibited or restricted from borrowing money to invest. This schedule proposes widening the form of assets superannuation funds are able to invest in by including limited recourse warrants within the basket of available assets. Warrants are a form of derivative security which derives its value from an exercisable option on an underlying asset. Some instalment warrants incorporate a borrowing and thus have not been allowed under current restrictions. The AFMA that I mentioned earlier welcomes the change and in the aforementioned committee report they assert that regulatory standards are not eroded by the proposed changes. But I note that they said, and quote, it seems strange that instalment arrangements that feature a borrowing enjoy a broader exception than those which do not. Accordingly, we recommend that subsection 10.1 definition be expanded. Such a proposal seems common sense to me and the amendment suggested by the AFMA, despite Treasury comments to the con contrary, is worthy of future consideration. Schedule 4 introduces new trustee beneficiary reporting rules by proposing amendments to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 so that trustees of closely held trusts are not required to report to the Commission of Taxation the details of the ultimate beneficiaries of trust income. Instead, trusts of closely held trusts may be required to report the details of trustee beneficiaries that are presently entitled to, to certain income of the trust and tax preferred amounts. These amendments will apply to the first income year starting on or after the day in which this bill received royal assent and later income years. Financial costs are unknown. Schedule 4, in effect, substitutes the reporting requirements for closely held trusts from the requirement to report ultimate beneficiaries to a trustee beneficiary statement. This clarifies and simplifies the reporting requirements for applicable trusts by ensuring that all trustees entitled to a share of the trust net income and tax preferred amounts are reported. I'm always wary of anything that conceals the identity of ultimate beneficiaries, where there are just a few key persons. That always means that there is a desire to be hidden from scrutiny, and the question is why? What is there to be hidden? Obviously, that is not the case when trustees represent a great number of people or represent minors. Then it is appropriate that the ultimate beneficiaries are not exposed. Notwithstanding the clarification in legislation, such, such trust vehicles still represent a significant tax avoidance tool which the Democrats have consistently opposed, and I, mean, I remain wary of this area of tax law. Schedule 5 introduces a number of legislative updates to the new simplified superannuation system. The bill amends various acts to assist in the smooth transition to the simplified superannuation regime. The schedule limits strategies which could circumvent the minimum drawdown requirements for account-based pensions, facilitates the provision of tax file numbers to superannuation and retirement savings account providers, and revises the application provision for small business capital gains tax relief under the regime. Well done, is what I say. The readability of provisions rewritten as part of the reforms is also further improved to ensure the policy intent underpinning the provisions is clear. Simplified superannuation commenced on the 1st of July 2007. However, an individual's tax file number is taken to have been quoted by the individual for notices given to superannuation and RSA providers by the Commission of Taxation from the 1st of June 2007. The amendments to prevent individuals circumventing the minimum drawdown requirements for account-based pensions will result in a revenue gain of $20 million over the forward estimates. These amendments clarify the operation of the drawdown limits to ensure that the concessional nature 
of the new simplified superannuation system tax-free status only applies to income stream assets and not assets quarantined for investment purposes. This is a desirable clarification that closes a potential loophole in superannuation law. The retrospective application of capital gains tax exemptions for small business sale profits invested into super is likewise an equitable and worthwhile amendment. My remarks uh, now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, are really directed uh, to uh, the government advisers so that uh, they can take note of this. I have discovered that people writing to, uh, to superannuation funds uh, giving their tax file number and signing the letter uh, uh, with, their, with their proper signature uh, have not had that advice accepted until such time as they fill in a form which is designated by the superannuation company. And I think that is a, a dangerous practice because I think if people have taken the trouble to write in with their TFN number, with their signature, uh, that is prima facie a, a compliance with the law and I'd ask you to be aware of that. Schedule 6 to this bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 to update the list of deductible gift recipients to include the Australian Peacekeeping Memorial Project incorporated from the 30th of April 2007 until 31st December 2008 and Social Ventures Australia Limited from the 4th of May 2007 with a forecast, forecast cost to revenue of 9.82 million over the forecast estimates period. Schedule 7 makes technical corrections and other minor amendments to the taxation laws. Schedule 8 increases flexibility for family trusts by amending the trust loss regime in Schedule 2F to the Income Tax Assessment Act 36 to allow family trust elections and interposed entity elections to be revoked or varied in certain limited circumstances. These amendments also broaden the definition of family in Section 272.95 in Schedule 2F to the ITAA 1936 to include lineal descendants of family members. In addition, spouses, former widows, widowers and former stepchildren are exempted from the family trust distribution tax by including them in the definition of family group in section 272.90 and schedule 2F to the ITAA 1936. Changes take effect from the start of the income year in which the bill receives royal assent and is forecast to cost 24 million over the estimates period. While these changes to improve the legislation governing uh, such provisions have the Democrats' support, the Democrats remain opposed to the use of family trusts to avoid or unjustly minimise tax obligations. I want to turn briefly to uh, my committee stage am amendments uh, and to discuss them briefly in my second reading speech. Uh, my amendments uh, circulated the Chamber aim to implement uh, the uh, Human Rights Equal Opportunity Commission's report, Same Sex, Same Entitlement recommendations. My amendments are drafted in the absence of government initiatives to address those recommendations. This is the first tax bill that I could amend, amend following the Herriock report. I would say to the government I would be delighted with the government to substitute their own amendments for mine, but there is no sign of that moral courage as yet. I move these now because this issue is urgent and this unwarranted discrimination is overdue for correction. 58 federal laws were identified by Herriock as needing similar amendments. Specifically, I, I propose to implement the Herriock de facto relationship definition. Those amendments are in line with Herriock's preferred approach, wherein a dual system of acknowledgement is able to operate, in this case in tax law one which recognises heterosexual and marital relationships as one set and one which recognises homosexual non-marital relationships as a parallel set. Herriock has identified 58 acts as needing amendment to end this unjust discrimination. The Democrats agree with us and have followed Herriock's suggested amendment form as closely as we can. And my amendment proposes to remove this discrimination. If the government decides not to support the Democrat amendments, it will be because it does not support the removal of clauses in taxation legislation that, that discriminate on the basis of sexual preference. That will mean the coalition will be continuing to uphold homophobic laws. 
given the strong cross-party support for ending unjust discrimination, including from many, many members of the Cabinet and the Coalition, I remain optimistic that the Government will recognise the strength of these arguments. At this moment, I see no cause for delay whatsoever. The tax portfolio holder we're dealing with here is the Treasurer. I don't know where the Treasurer stands on these matters. I don't know whether he supports uh, official homophobic policy or not. All I do know is that if he really insisted this unjust taxation discrimination should end, it would end. He is, after all, the most senior minister in the government and the deputy leader of the Liberal Party. I am told by insiders that most Liberal ministers favour ending this unjust discrimination. So the buck stops with the Prime Minister, and the finger will be pointed at him if the coalition policy of homophobia continues after that damning Herioc report, because that Herioc report has said there is no justification for the discrimination that occurs in tax superannuation and other laws. The flip side, Mr Acting Deputy President, of tolerance is hatred. Extremists of many religions and many political sects hate homosexuals. Such extremists undoubtedly support the present coalition policy of inequity in tax matters like these. The coalition and the treasurer will be keeping terrible company if they keep homophobic tax laws on their books. And I do hope they will have the courage to accept my amendment or to offer amendments of their own. Turning now to tax laws amendment 2007 measures number five, bill 2007. That has 12 schedules. Uh, schedule 1 uh, covers asset financing for public-private partnerships. Schedules 2 and 3, thin capitalisation. Schedules 4, uh, 7 and 8, uh, capital gains tax rollover changes. Uh, schedule 5, income tax and the Prime Minister's prize. Schedule 6 uh, is the same business uh, test cap removal. Uh, schedule 9 covers uh, um, uh, gift recipients, uh, clauses, uh, Schedule 10, Film Production Offsets, Schedule 11, the 175 per cent R&D Tax Deduction Extension, and Schedule 12, Innovation Australia. Uh, I must compliment the Government on its reaction to the Senate Standing Committee on Economics Inquiry and Report. I note there are a number of amendments which directly address matters which were raised in that inquiry, uh, and I think the government is very wise to move rapidly to address issues which were of concern uh, to a number of the witnesses, and obviously the government has recognised that was legitimate concern. Uh, so another well done for you. The uh, tax, tax laws uh, amendment measures number five, Bill 2007, has a big price tag in excess of $640 million over the forward estimates. The two big ticket items are a comprehensive rewrite of the current tax subsidies and incentives for Australian film reduction and the removal of the small business test cap. Schedule 1 does amend the tax income tax law to modify the taxation treatment of leasing and similar arrangements between taxpayers and tax preferred end users, such as tax exempt entities and non-residents for the financing and provision of infrastructure and other assets. The principal application of the law is intended for what, is no, what are known as, as triple P's, the private partnerships, the public-private partnerships. These changes to tax laws, which are aimed at encouraging investment in Australian infrastructure, must be considered in the context of some high-profile failures in public-private partnership infrastructure investments. Uh, in some ways, I think it's hard to criticise governments on uh, private-public partnership arrangements uh, because they've had to learn on the job. Uh, but what they've had to learn, I think, is to be extremely careful of some of the actions and activities of some private operators uh, who have taken uh, somewhat of a lend of, of the public sector. Whether or not uh, such uh, past failures uh, affect uh, future um, uh, the future of these schemes I don't know, uh, but I am convinced there is a still a place uh, for purely public sector activity and for public-private sector cooperation and activity. Schedules 2 and 3 relate to the thin capitalisation rules and its anti-avoidance mechanism, uh, which continues to be uh, of importance. This amendment corrects this discrepancy and upholds the original intention of the law and is supported by the Democrats. I notice my time is up. 
Uh, I wish I could talk much more about tax, uh, Madam uh, Acting President, but I'll have to leave it there. Thank you, Senator. Senator Von Olsen. Thank you, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased, uh, as uh, Chairman of the Senate uh, Economics Committee, to follow my uh, uh, friend and uh, committee colleague, uh, Senator Murray, in relation to this matter. And I would like to just follow on from some of his comments in relation to uh, uh, Chapter 11, Schedule 10 of uh, the Tax Laws Amendment uh, 2007, Measures Bill No. 5, or no, number 5 Bill 2007, which I'll refer to as, uh, as TLAB, uh, TLAB 5. Uh, now, the Schedule uh, 10, the Film Production Offsets, uh, Madam Mackey, Deputy President, uh, follows on from a, a budget uh, announcement, 2007 budget announcement uh, by this government, uh, which quite uh, rightly uh, received uh, uh, enormous uh, praise from those in the industry, and uh, I would like just to uh, uh, to mention uh, briefly and quite briefly some of the commentary uh, uh, following on from uh, uh, from the budget. And I quote from the Australian on the 10th of May: um, uh, "Talk to people in the film industry in the Australian screen production incentives announced as part of a 282.9 million film package seem poised to pave a yellow brick road back to Oz." luring home creative talent that has drifted offshore. I'd like to think that within two or three years, the amount of production will lead to an increase of 25 per cent in television drama feature films, says Brian Rosen, the chief executive of the Film Finance Corporation. I go on to quote from Mr Rosen, the industry got everything it wanted. It's the biggest change since 10 capital BA was introduced by the Fraser government 25 years ago, which, is, which has created a strong talent base. Now it's about creating the businesses to drive the industry. Successful Australian international directors will come back and make more films here. Sydney Morning Herald on the 9th of, uh, of May this year, uh, and in the arts section, uh, John Garner. Now uh, the arts minister, George Brown, just gave the film industry almost everything it wanted last night with a 280 million uh, funding injection over four years. And as the Sydney Morning Herald said, the changes are considered the most important for the industry in more than a decade. And, uh, Minister, I do uh, congratulate you uh, on this uh, extraordinary initiative, which will make a huge difference to, uh, uh, to the arts in this, uh, in this, uh, in this country. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, the 10th of um, May, in the arts and uh, entertainment section, uh, uh, Gary uh, Maddox. Uh, uh, Lerman uh, hails budget boost for film stunning. Uh, from the set of his uh, epic film uh, Australia, uh, director Baz Luhrmann described the boost for the film industry in the budget as extraordinary. Driving back from meetings with filmmakers, the Village Roadshow managing director Graham Burke said it was, in a quote, much bigger than the Vision 10 BA tax incentives that fuelled an Australian filmmaking boom in the 1980s. All round, the industry there was marvelling at the scale of the federal government's support. That's the meeting he was at. Uh, and getting back to Mr Lerman again, uh, it's an extraordinary result, really, and probably a very historical moment, he said. The one big idea that they responded to and have completely embraced is that around the globe we're in an extraordinary and unique situation when it comes to the cinematic arts. Uh, continue again. Uh, Graham Burke, who's involved in production both through the Village Roadshow and the Warner Roadshow joint venture, said it was a wonderful moment in the history of the Australian film industry. Australia has a natural skill in this area and for the government to be encouraging it in a way that is commercial, because it will cause private investment to sit behind the government money, is just stunning. And there are many more quotes uh, following on from uh, uh, this marvellous uh, initiative. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, my colleagues on the uh, uh, committee um, met in relation, obviously, to, uh, uh, to all these matters, and uh, we took a, uh, a lot of, uh, of evidence, and I would like to uh, uh, thank colleagues from, uh, uh, from the government and from the uh, Labor Party and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Senator Murray uh, uh, for their assistance. Uh, we did hear some issues, uh, in, uh, initial issues in relation to the, uh, to the bill, and basically they revolved around, uh, and I quote from 11.9 in the report, uh, the potential uh, effect of the bill on the allocation of resources between in-house and independent producers in the television production sector. Uh, the accessibility of the, of the production offset to animators and the depreciation of low-value capital assets uh, used in film production. Now, in relation to the first of those uh, 
uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the, uh, uh, the allocation of resources between in-house and the independent producers, um, there were two uh, quite separate schools of thought in relation to, uh, uh, to this matter. And the Sc Screen Producers Association of Australia uh, raised concerns, and I quote again from the report, over the possibility of Australian commercial television networks exploiting the 20 per cent producer rebate at the expense of the in independent television production sector. Uh, free TV, and I refer now to 11.16 in the report, uh, representing the free-to-air commercial networks rejected the notion that the legislation should discriminate against in-house producers by limiting their access uh, to the rebate. Uh, free TV also repeated the claim that the commercial network's access to the rebate would shift production from the independent sector in-house. It argued that the gen uh, that generating uh, quality television content will always take precedence over maximising available tax rebates. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, we listened very carefully. The committee listened very carefully uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, um, to the uh, Screen Producers Association uh, and uh, particularly uh, uh, the uh, presentation from Mr. Geoffrey uh, Brown. And in recommendation three, the committee uh, uh, and I quote: the committee recommends the government review the implementation of the producer offset scheme in 12 months to ensure it has not been mis been misused to mitigate the intention of facilitating a sustainable Australian film production sector, including a vibrant independent sector. Now, I'm very pleased, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, that the government and its um, uh, amendment has actually gone uh, further uh, than that, and uh, the amendment uh, uh, that will uh, uh, will be moved will make it. Uh, uh, quite clear uh, that the minister must uh, indeed, uh, before the end of the uh, 12 months after the commencement of the division, initiate uh, a review uh, of the effect of the division in relation to levels of production by the Australian independent production sector compared to levels of production by Australian television broadcasters. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, what this means is that in 12 months' time uh, we will know exactly what the situation is in relation to any potential swing between uh, uh, outsourced independent production uh, to, to in-house. Uh, we have evidence from uh, Free TV and their representatives that uh, there will not be uh, such a move back to in-house. There are the legitimate concerns of the independent sector that this will occur. And it was the committee's view uh, that it was a matter that was better dealt with in 12 months' time by way of review uh, than, if you like, the committee picking winners uh, on information that, quite frankly, we could not judge until it had been put, um, and, uh, and uh, I, I, will, I will take the injection because, the, because I was actually referring to the committee, and the committee believed that it was appropriate to do so. Uh, now we could have uh, we could have uh, we could have we could have 500 reviews, and we still wouldn't get, wouldn't get within a bull's roar of what the, uh, the Australian Labor Party has uh, has nominated, but. But get, this is a debate about, uh, about the uh, product, film production sector, and I will, not, I will not be drawn in to these inappropriate uh, interjections. And I will, I will return back to this very, very important report. Uh, so we, uh, uh, I'm sure the other members of the committee uh, would uh, very much agree uh, with the government's amendment in relation to, uh, to actually strengthening our recommendations. Um, Yes, indeed. Thank you. It was unanimous. Um, the second matter was uh, that's right, and you agreed wholeheartedly. Thank you, Senator. Um, now, the other matter was the accessibility of the production offset uh, to animators, uh, and the committee was uh, very concerned about this matter. We believe the evidence that was given to us was quite legitimate. There were legitimate concerns, uh, and we made recommendations in relation to that in recommendation four. And I'm very pleased, and I'm sure my uh, colleagues on the committee uh, will equally be pleased uh, that the government has addressed those matters with a further amendment. And I thank the government on behalf of the committee uh, for doing so uh, so rapidly. The third, um, the third matter was the depreciation of low-value capital assets used in film production. Um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, this is a uh, more uh, difficult uh, issue, and uh, we received uh, uh, evidence from. Uh, uh, Louise Houston, the, uh, uh, the tax director at Warner Brothers Entertainment, in relation to this matter, and I won't uh, uh, take up uh, uh, the time of the uh, chamber in relation to uh, uh, all the matters detailed uh, uh, by, by Ms. Houston. But I will uh, just briefly uh, uh, 
uh, quote from a letter that the proposal to include the, include the balancing adjustment of a capital asset in the calculation of qualifying production expenditure uh, for the film production offsets is welcome. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about the um, EM in paragraph 10.72. Uh, however, it appears that subsection 376-125 in bracket 7 may not apply to a balancing adjustment for a depreciating asset required to be allocated to a low value pool. Uh, this would unfairly disadvantage a production company, which, for example, is a member of a tax consolidated group which has previously elected to allocate assets to a low value pool. Uh, this is because such an election is irre 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 irrevocable and applies to all companies within the tax consolidated group, irrespective of whether they were even in existence at the time the original uh, election was made. Uh, now, Madam uh, Deputy President, the, uh, uh, the government believes that the work that is um, um, required to uh, uh, properly uh, investigate um, their concerns, um, and, uh, and if that uh, uh, is, is warranted, uh, or if a, uh, an amendment was warranted, there was not sufficient time for that uh, to be drafted, and it would not be appropriate, in the government's view, to delay passage of the bill to accommodate that investigation. Uh, I can say, however, to those with a concern in this area, that the, um, uh, the government will look uh, further at the matter and give it appropriate consideration after the passage of the bill, uh, which in all the circumstances is uh, entirely appropriate. I won't take any uh, further time, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is a, a very important initiative. Uh, the committee uh, thanks, oh, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the committee, thanks the government for moving very quickly in relation to these two matters of great importance to the sector. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Carr. Thank you. Um, Manning, uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I'd like to speak to Tax Laws Amendment Bill No. 5, in particular Schedules 11 and 12, and that is those matters that amend the research and development taxation arrangements and the establishment of an entity known as Innovation Australia. Now, Senator Sherry drew to my attention a moment ago this is yet another government body. Another government body. How many uh, and we've heard already more reviews. I don't think these people know how to open their mouths without initiating yet another review or establishing another government body. Now, I'd like to uh, particularly take the issue of the schedules in order and start with Schedule 11, which implements the changes to the 175 per cent premium tax concession to give access to international firms that hold their intellectual property offshore. I have argued for some time there is in fact merit in opening up the R&D tax concession to international firms, especially the argument is that most of the spillover benefits from the R&D conducted in Australia still flows if the IP is held by a multinational's head office overseas. And that's why Labor welcomed the Howard government's decision in its May industry statement to expand eligibility for the premium concession and to remove the beneficial ownership test. We campaigned on this issue for some time. Indeed, it should be noted, however, that alone uh, this measure accounted for some $500 million of the government's so-called $1.4 billion industry statement. Now, except that this figure of $500 million is made up of a remarkable calculation, and that is a figure of $50 million was flatlined across 10 years. And so we have a measure here which has an arbitrary figure of $50 million put in flatlined for 10 years. So I'd be very interesting to see just how the actual costings come out over time, given the Howard government's absolutely appalling record when it comes to the question of costing changes to the tax concession. I don't think there's been a year in which the costings have been accurate. Not one year. And I would uh, perhaps give the officials due notice here that I'd like to ask some questions during the committee stages of this bill about how this figure was settled upon. How was it that a figure of $50 million were calculated? And how was it that it was calculated on the basis that it would be the same figure for 10 years, irrespective of the behavioural changes that occur on the take-up rates for this particular measure? And so I think it's, uh, given the absolutely appalling uh, answers that I received to these issues in the Senate in the budget estimates, I think it's appropriate, given we've got officers here today, like that they are idea. able to enlighten us. Like I think they are able to enlighten us as to how it was the Treasury did come up with these particular costings. Now, I did, 
I repeat, and I Labor welcomed this belated initiative by the Howard government as it attempted, albeit uh, in a limited way, to internationalise Australia's innovation system. However, this bill makes it clear that the government is simply introducing an even higher level of complexity into the R&D concession scheme. At the time of the announcement, Labor pointed out that the 175 scheme is a bureaucratic nightmare. This bill actually introduces further complexities and red tape. For a start, the definition of research and development for the purposes of the new re regime is different from the rules that apply to companies holding their IP offshore. This uh, was not announced, and it may be uh, done for the, for the betterment of administrative practice, but nonetheless, it results in companies that are eligible for both types of tax concession having to categorise their R&D spending in two different ways. And the bottom line under those circumstances is that this legislation has been described by stakeholders as complex, confusing and bureaucratic. This creates a second problem, and that's the risk that the policy intent will be undermined by a perception that the new scheme is difficult to access. International firms not only have to look at the rate of support they will receive for the R&D, they'll also take into account the complexity of the system. And it would be hard to imagine a system more complex than that that has been created by this government. Now, Labor will continue to seek feedback from business about the effectiveness of the premium concession and in this measure in particular. But the fact is that this policy, like the whole industry statement, reflects a half-hearted approach from this government. And the last time I had occasion to speak on a bill relating to the R&D tax concession, I made the point that even the Productivity Commission realises that the eligibility criteria for the R&D tax offset provides perverse incentives for small high-tech businesses to actually limit their R&D spending. That the government has made no attempt to amend the threshold arrangements. One can only assume that they haven't done it in the industry statement and they have no intentions of fixing this particular problem. And beyond that, of course, there's a serious potential to uh, improve the R&D concession arrangements overall and, however broadly, there is a serious need to improve Australia's business R&D performance. And this was yet another missed opportunity to do just that. Might I say that uh, in regard to our performance, some disturbing facts about Australia's R&D uh, have, of course, I think become increasingly aware of them, increasingly to, to light. The ABS has noted in its release of its 0506 figures that at 1.04 per cent of GDP, Australia's rate of business R&D expenditure, and I quote, remains below the OECD average of 1.53 per cent. The fact is that Australia's business is still recovering from the savaging of the R&D concession by the Howard government in 1996. And in 1996, the Howard government claimed that this, that the government, uh, Mr Howard, fact said that his government would be, and I quote, improve Australia's international ranking in terms of the expenditure on business R&D as a share of GDP. Well, instead what he did was he slashed the tax concession in half and sat on his hands while business R&D growth stayed in negative territory for four years. So we have yet another example of a broken promise under this government. In fact, one of the most uh, strident, I think, most uh, obvious characteristics of this government is the, its capacity to actually uh, fail to implement promises. Now, of course, this is not a position that uh, we were ever ex exposed in the election at the time this government came to office, and of course we now have a situation where they have. Uh, got an opportunity to come before the Australian people again, and I look forward to this government uh, coming clean on these issues in this forthcoming election. I look forward to this government actually uh, changing its course and actually going out to Yarra Lumla and actually declaring that it's time for an election, given that this is the longest parliamentary term we've had for, for some years in the Commonwealth. It is appropriate that uh, the Prime Minister acknowledge that this government is out of time way, way out of time, and that this is the sort of issue that ought to be discussed in the forthcoming election, and this is a, an issue that the government ought to acknowledge it has failed. We have, of course, uh, 
uh, four years after that initial uh, savaging of the system in 2000, the government commissioned a report confirming there had been both an absolute and a relative decline in Australia's business research and development performance since the mid-1990s. And over that same period, 20 of the 28 other OECD countries for which there are there's data experienced a notable increase in their business R&D to GDP ratios. So the overall result has been over the full 11 years of the Howard government, the real average annual growth rate in business research and development has been a woeful 5.7 per cent, compared to the period when Labor was in office of 14.5 per cent. It's not, not a bad achievement, isn't it? Cut it by a third. The fact is that Australia has maintained the same growth rate in business R&D under the Howard government as it achieved under Labor. If it had done that, investment would now be double today's figures. And so we see the whole of the last couple of years, instead of being strong growth, we have seen we're only now starting to catch up with the record of achievement that was in terms of business R&D back in the 90s. So I contrast this with our competitors, and you can see quite clearly what's happening. That China, for instance, is committed to lifting its overall research and development spending as a percentage of GDP to 2.5 per cent by 2050. That's from 1.2% in, in 2002 and 0.6% in 1995. So China's doubling its R&D effort every seven years. And we have a situation now where the Chinese are in fact uh, have overtaken Japan as the second biggest spender on research and development behind the United States with a spending growth of over 20% uh, during the, the, uh, previous, the previous year. So the Howard government ministers would like to tell us that uh, our business about selling minerals to China and buying sh back cheap, low-tech goods simply don't seem to understand just how far and how fast the Chinese are transforming their economy. They don't seem to get that fundamental principle that China is moving up the value chain at a rapid rate, and the only way we can stay ahead of the game is to play much smarter than we are. And so that's why I turn to the last schedule of this uh, particular provision, Schedule 12, which moves to combine the Industry Research and Development Board with the Venture Capital Registration Board to form a new entity known as uh, New Innovation Australia. Labor supports this amalgamation. It does make sense. It is a very uh, small step towards streamlining a national innovation scheme, now characterised by a mass of gaps and of duplication and red tape. This proposal, though, sends two clear messages about what this government is seeking to do when it comes to innovation. First, the message is very clear. The government is half-hearted. When the system needs a fundamental overhaul, what we get is that uh, Minister McFarlane uh, is able to do is come up with two, it was to combine two administrative boards. Where better coordination is needed between the government and the states, the Howard government actually refuses to participate. While we sorely need measurements to bridge the cultural divide between the research sector and business, the Howard government has nothing to offer. And secondly, what we've got here is a clear case of mutton dressed up as lamb. The Innovation Australia. If anyone hearing that name would expect a genuinely new body to drive the revitalisation of a national innovation system. And if they thought that, they would be sorely disappointed, sorely disappointed by this government's inaction. And while you can well and truly it's easy to support the amalgamation of two bodies, what we need here is a much more fundamental policy response. To, and if we were to convince anyone that we, have, we are actually serious about innovation in this country. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, this bill does give us an opportunity to reflect upon the importance of innovation in the future of the Australian economy. It gives us an opportunity to reflect upon the pretty ordinary performance of this government when it comes to innovation. It also gives an opportunity to look again at the world's, what the world experts are saying, that innovation will drive productivity and it will drive prosperity in the 21st century. And of course, it makes it crystal clear yet again that the current government is ill-prepared to secure Australia's prosperity for the future because it simply doesn't understand the fundamental importance of innovation and meeting the challenges ahead. Thank you, Senator. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank honourable senators for their
contributions uh, to the debate on Taxation Laws Amendment 2007, Measures No. 4, Bill 2007, and the Association, Associated Imposition Bills and Taxation Laws Amendment 2007, Measures No. 5, Bill 2007. Turning first to um, TLAB 4, Schedule 1 will abol abolish foreign loss and foreign tax credit quarantining and streamline the remaining foreign tax credit rules. It also contains transitional rules for the treatment of existing foreign losses and credits. By reducing compliance costs and complexity in the law, these changes will assist businesses operating or seeking to grow internationally. Schedule 2 provides a capital gains tax rollover for membership interests in companies limited by guarantee that are also medical defence organisations. Schedule 3 will allow superannuation funds to continue to invest in instalment warrants consistent with long-standing practice. Such warrants must be of a limited recourse nature and can be held over any asset a fund is permitted to invest in directly. Schedule 4 introduces simplified trustee beneficiary reporting rules. These rules will target arrangements where complex chains of trusts are used to obscure the ultimate beneficiary of the assessable trust income. These changes demonstrate the government's ongoing commitment to reducing red tape and regulatory burdens. Schedule 5 will assist in the smooth transition to the simplified superannuation regime known as Better Super and clarify the policy intent. Schedule 6 amends the list of deductible gift recipients in the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997. Deductible gift recipient status will assist the listed organisations to attract public support for their worthy activities. Schedule 7 implements various minor technical amendments and makes general improvements to the law that will improve the quality of the tax laws and reduce complexity. Final, finally, Schedule 8 amends the trust loss rules which apply to family trusts. The amendments allow family trust elections to be varied or revoked in a broader range of circumstances and also expands the definition of family. Let me now turn to the, taxation, the Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures No. 5, Bill 2007. Schedule 1 to this bill significantly improves the tax treatment of leasing and similar arrangements between taxable entities and tax-exempt entities, including foreign residents, for the financing and provision of infrastructure and other assets. These changes streamline the existing harsh rules and reduce the compliance cost of Australian businesses. Schedule 2 amends the thin capitalisation rules to ensure they operate as intended by changing the definition of excluded equity interest. Schedule 3 will allow groups that consolidate for tax purposes to apply the thin capitalisation rules as if the group did not contain an authorised deposit-taking institution, where the only authorised deposit-taking institutions in the group are specialist credit card institutions. Schedule 4 will provide a capital gains tax rollover on marriage breakdown to ensure that capital gains tax need not be an impediment to separating spouses in wanting to achieve a clean break from each other in terms of superannuation. Schedule 5 for the bill will exempt from income tax the Prime Minister's prizes for Australian history and science to the extent that the prizes would otherwise be accessible income. Schedule 6 removes the $100 million total income cap on the same business test in the company loss recoupment rules. When determining if prior year losses can be deducted against future income, all companies will have access to the same test. Schedules X7 extends capital gains tax rollover relief for statutory licences. The rollover will apply where a statutory licence ends and is replaced by one or more new licences that authorise substantially similar activity to the activity authorised by the original licence or licences. The measure also provides a partial rollover where a statutory licence ends and is replaced by a new licence or licences and other capital proceeds are also received. Schedule 8 allows a stapled group of entities to restructure with an interposed head trust without triggering certain tax consequences. Under the measure, a restructure that involves interposing a head trust over a public unit trust that is stapled to a company will not result in the interposed head trust being taxed as a company under Division 6, Capital C of the Income Tax Assessment Act, 1936. These amendments will particularly enhance the international competitiveness of Australian listed property trusts. Schedule 9 updates the list of deductible gift recipients and extends the period for which deductions are allowed for gifts to a fund that has time-limited status. Schedule 10 introduces a package of incentives that will reform and strengthen the Australian film industry that was announced in the 2007-08 budget. And I'll 
re return to Schedule 10 and make some additional remarks in a moment. Schedule 11 extends the premium 175 per cent research and development R&D tax concession to Australian research and development activities undertaken on behalf of multinational companies. Finally, Schedule 12 establishes a new board called Innovation Australia to administer and oversee the industry portfolio's innovation and venture capital programs. Can I say a few um, additional words about Schedule 10 of T-Lab 5, which implements the film package, which, as Senator Ronaldson in his contribution um, pointed out, has been uh, rapturously received by the film industry. The, um, yes, it has been rapturously, Senator Carr. The greatest set of innovations to the, uh, of support for the Australian film industry um, since the Fraser government introduced sections 10B and 10BA in the 1970s. Now, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I want to take the opportunity to um, place on record uh, the debt of gratitude which we owe my predecessor in the portfolio, Senator the Honourable Rod Kemp. Although uh, I followed Senator Kemp in the port portfolio on the 30th of January, by the time I became the responsible minister, most of the early work in relation to, or well, most of the work in relation to uh, the film industry package had been done by him and by officials uh, under his um, uh, instruction. And I particularly thank um, James Cameron and Peter Young from the department for uh, the extremely high standard of the work that they, uh, um, uh, uh, that they undertook, both in preparing and currently in the implementation phrase, phase of the film package. Um, the, as I said before, it's, been, it's a package that has been very well received. However, when it was reviewed by the Senate Standing Committee on Economics uh, in its hearings on uh, uh, T-Lab 5, uh, there were um, a, num a small number of outstanding issues which the government, as Senator Ronaldson has foreshadowed, uh, will address. Uh, probably um, the, most, uh, um, uh, the most vexed of the issues concerned the question of access to the producer rebate. And a concern was raised uh, on behalf of uh, the uh, bodies representing independent producers that the accessibility of the rebate to um, broadcasters, which might produce product in-house, could have a deleterious consequence upon the independent producers. Um, in the end, um, the, um, the committee recommended, as Senator Ronaldson foreshadowed uh, in recommendation three, that there be a review of the operation of the producer offset scheme in 12 months to ensure that it is not being misused to mitigate the intention of facilitating a sustainable Australian film production sector, including a vibrant independent sector. And in the government amendments that will be moved in committee, um, uh, there will be an amendment moved to um, make that review, um, to um, uh, mandate that review on a statutory basis. Um, might I take the opportunity, Madam Acting Deputy President, to affirm on the part of the government its intention that the independent sector should be beneficiaries of the producer rebate. It hasn't been the view of the government that the eligibility for the rebate should be quarantined only to the independent sector, but it is certainly the view of the government that the independent producers should be beneficiaries of the producer rebate and were it to be the case in the 12, first 12 months of, uh, in the early months of operation of the scheme, uh, that the independent producers were missing out, it would be the intention of the government to relook at the matter. And um, in that regard, might I adopt the language of uh, paragraph 11.47 of the report of the Senate Economic Standing Committee, which says, if I may quote it, it would be the committee's expectation that were the availability of the scheme for in-house production to have a detrimental effect on the independent sector, then the government, on the basis of that evidence, should legislate to restrict the producer offset scheme to independent producers. That is the intention of the government, and were the empirical evidence to suggest that that had been the effect, then that would be our intention. However, we are not persuaded that the scheme as devised will have that effect. Um, secondly, the uh, Senate, Economics, uh, uh, Senate Standing Committee on Economics recommended uh, there be some uh, uh, amendments to uh, change the definition of a qualifying series for the, for the purpose of animated features, and the government has adopted their, that recommendation, and an amendment to that effect will be moved in the committee stage. 
And finally, uh, the committee recommended that the ex current restriction on the Film Finance Corporation from co-investing in projects produced in-house continue to apply to funding provided by the new body, the Australian Screen Authority, or as it will be called, in fact, Screen Australia, after the 1st of July 2008. And might I also indicate, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that that would be my intention. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, with those uh, remarks, uh, might I thank once again honourable senators for their contributions to um, the debate, uh, to the second reading debate. Might I once again, in particular, thank those who have been the prime movers in this revolutionary, once-in-a-generation reform of the Australian film industry, and commend the bills to the Senate. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures No. 4, Bill 2007, Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non-Disclosure Tax Bill No. 1, 2007, Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non-Disclosure Tax Bill No. 2, 2007, Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures No. 5, Bill 2007. Is it the wish of the committee that bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. I shall proceed with number one bill, Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures Number Four, Bill 2007. Senator Murray. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, seek leave to move items one and two on sheet 5328 revised number two together. Leave granted. There being no objection, Senator, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, move those uh, amendments uh, and in moving them uh, I wish to uh, urge the Senate to accept them. The uh, amendments I refer to uh, arise directly from and uh, are uh, closely aligned to uh, the precise and detailed recommendations of the May 2007 Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission uh, report into same-sex, same entitlements. That was a national inquiry into discrimination against people in same-sex relationships, financial and work-related entitlements and benefits. This is the first tax bill uh, that I could put these amendments to. I will draw the uh, attention of uh, the chamber to the, the appendix number one uh, of that report, which lists 58 acts that need uh, amending uh, to comply uh, with the Commission's finding that inequitable and unjust discrimination uh, applies to tens of thousands of Australians uh, in, uh, who are in same-sex relationships. Uh, I draw um, the Senate's uh, attention to the uh, chapter headed findings and recommendations uh, that is at page 371 by memory. Yes, it is. Chapter 18. Uh, and within that, uh, on page 384, you will find a list uh, of, uh, of items uh, which are used to determine whether two people are in a de facto relationship uh, and the circumstances uh, to determine that relationship therefore being taken into account uh, and those are replicated in, in my amendment. The, um, the discrimination under tax laws is also um, described uh, in that uh, summary chapter 18 on findings and recommendations um, and it's described under C on page 377, discrimination under tax laws. 
I very much doubt uh, that members uh, have the report readily to hand. So I will read the discrimination that exists, the homophobic discrimination, might I say, uh, the unjust, totally unwarranted, immoral, discriminatory, disgraceful discrimination that exists uh, under our tax laws against same-sex couples or families. And I will draw the attention of the chamber to the fact that many people of same-sex persuasion uh, do in fact have families, children, uh, and of course dependents. And I will read from, uh, from that section C. Uh, don't despair, it's not so long that it'll last forever. Uh, it's headed C, discrimination under tax laws. The inquiry finds that federal tax laws discriminate against same-sex couples or families in the following ways. A same-sex partner cannot access the dependent spouse tax offset available to an opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot access the tax offset for a partner's parent available to an opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner, lesbian co-mother or gay co-father cannot access the housekeeper tax offset available to an opposite-sex op partner, birth mother or birth father. A lesbian co-mother or gay co-father cannot access the child housekeeper tax offset available to a birth mother or birth father. A lesbian co-mother or gay co-father cannot access the invalid relative tax offset available to a birth mother or birth father. A taxpayer in a same-sex couple relationship cannot accept, access the higher rate of overseas forces tax offset available to an opposite-sex couple. A taxpayer in the same tax sex couple relationship cannot access the higher rate of its own tax offset available to an opposite sex cap, uh, couple. A United States Defense Force same sex couple cannot access tax exemptions available to an opposite sex couple. A lesbian co mother or gay co father cannot assert a primary entitlement to the baby bonus. A same sex partner of a person eligible for the child care tax rebate cannot access the rebate in the same way as an opposite sex partner. And a person eligible for the child care tax rebate cannot transfer the unused value of the rebate to his or her same sex partner. A same sex couple must spend more than an opposite sex couple to qualify for the medical expenses tax offset. A same sex couple may pay a higher Medicare levy and Medicare levy surcharge than an opposite sex couple. A same sex partner cannot ex access the same capital gains tax concessions available to an opposite sex couple. A same sex couple transferring property to a child or trustee on family breakdowns will be taxed at the top marginal rate, unlike an opposite sex couple. A same sex partner must pay income tax on child maintenance payments received from a former partner, unlike an opposite sex partner. A same sex partner is not eligible for the same fringe benefit tax exemptions available to an opposite sex partner. Now, chapter eight on the report provides much more detail about these and other tax entitlements. This, this kind of discrimination is not about marital relationships. This is about relationships between people who live together, uh, who have uh, an enduring relationship uh, which is determined uh, on a very exact basis and who are not allowed the same tax entitlements as other Australians living in the same circumstances. It is an abomination. It is unacceptable. Now that this report is out, there is no excuse for it not being addressed. There is no excuse. There's no political advantage in this to anyone refusing or opposing this. There's just a moral vacuum. There's just a moral failure. Now, I've brought these amendments forward because I think it's time the government address these amendments. And I do hope that the amendments, uh, as I've designed them as close as I can uh, to comply with Herriock's uh, recommendations, find acceptance. And through you, Madam Chair, I know, Minister, uh, that the amendments are likely not to be perfect, but the government could always accept them 
and improve them in the House and send them back uh, for the acclaim of the Senate. Uh, but I would uh, urge the Senate uh, to accept these amendments and approve them. Andrew Sherry. Uh, thank you. Um, this is not the first occasion uh, in the Senate and indeed the House of Representatives where um, we have been debating the removal of discrimination uh, as it applies to superannuation uh, provisions in respect to same-sex couples. It's not the first time. I'm, I've forgotten how many times, indeed, we have, Senator Murray, um, uh, spoken on this matter in the Senate. And indeed, um, uh, the Australian Democrats, sometimes the Greens, I have to acknowledge, um, or the Labor Party invariably are moving amendments time and time again, either in committee or, or a second reading, uh, that the government uh, remove the discrimination in respect to superannuation provisions uh, as they apply to same-sex couples. Senator Murray rightly identified a moral failing on behalf of the government, but it's actually a double moral failing because I was here in this Senate chamber about four years ago, Senator Murray would recall, when his uh, Senator Cherry, as the superannuation uh, spokesperson for the Australian Democrats, received a written commitment from the Prime Minister to remove the discrimination in respect to same-sex couples. A written communication was tabled here in the Senate chamber and it was on the superannuation choice legislation. I'm sure Senator Murray would recall this. So we have a double moral failure. We have the Prime Minister of this country, typical tricky Mr Howard, at his tricky best or worst, frankly, giving a written letter of commitment to the Senate chamber to remove the discrimination in respect to same-sex couples and superannuation some four years ago. Four years ago. And where are we today? It still hasn't happened. It still hasn't happened. Now, <coughs> we have a very tricky Prime Minister. Short term, wants a bit of legislation, in that case superannuation choice. And he gave a written commitment. Senator Coonan, I think, was the assistant uh, treasurer at the time, brandishing this letter from the Prime Minister. She well, she may support it, Senator Murray. But however, she John Howard. That's the really however, the Prime Minister, Mr. Howard, in a moral, a serious moral failure, signs up in writing and then fails to deliver. Yeah. Fails to deliver. Now, the um, there was an intriguing leak in the Financial Review on a cabinet discussion about three weeks ago. It was in the Financial Review. It was intriguing because rarely does cabinet leak. I mean, it's a very, very unusual circumstance, um, very, very rare indeed for cabinet to leak. And for a full-blown report on this issue to be, um, to be given in the Financial Review. And it was a report on the discussion that took place in cabinet about this issue, and apparently Cabinet was split down the middle. There was a fierce discussion, as reported in the Financial Review, um, and they were unable to reach agreement, and it was left to the Prime Minister to make the call. The Prime Minister made the call on this issue four years ago. Oh, right. Four years ago. Now, I'll come back to that uh, Financial Review report shortly, but I notice in <coughs> some media shorts of the Prime Minister doing some community meetings and addressing questions from the floor, when he was asked by uh, someone in the audience, would he remove the discrimination in respect to same-sex couples? Um, and he very bluntly said, no, no. So we have uh, the Prime Minister giving a written commitment four years ago, and then in a recent, I don't know um, uh, the, uh, the precise date, but it was recently, the Prime Minister saying no, he would not remove it. Uh, duplicitous, that's right, uh, Senator Carr. You give a promise four years ago, tricky promise to get a bit of legislation through then. And I warned, I have to say, Senator Murray, I've got to admonish you. I warned Senator Cherry at the time. It was a short term, tricky promise to get this. Yeah, well, the super choice legislation. They got it through. Well, you're dealing with Mr. Howard. You're dealing with Mr. Howard here, the Prime Minister of Australia giving a commitment four years ago and then still failing to deliver today. Yeah. 
Now, let's come back to the financial review leak. What we had was a uh, very detailed report in the financial review of the debate that took place no less than in Cabinet. Very rare. I, can't, I think I could count on one hand the number of times Cabinet discussions have leaked in the last 11-odd years. Now, Senator Carr quite rightly, uh, well, quite incorrectly interjects, but he quite rightly makes the point. Has there been a police inquiry called into this leaking to the financial review of the Cabinet discussion on the removal of discrimination as it applies to same-sex couples and superannuation? Um, so, Parliamentary Secretary, I'd like to know whether, in fact, there's been a police inquiry. You can deal with that in this committee stage, initiated into that leak of the detailed discussion. But, but I will. I will point the finger. We know who leaked it. We know who leaked it. Mr Turnbull leaked it. He was the one who leaked that cabinet discussion because he's under electoral pressure. I can see some smiles on the advisor's face. They know, I, they know I'm right. I hope this police, discussion, this police investigation is, is un, being undertaken because what we, had, what we have is Mr Turnbull playing both sides of the street. Is part of collective cabinet responsibility, uh, following the lead of the Prime Minister, who will not deliver on the promise that he made four years ago. And Mr Turnbull leaked that discussion to the Financial Review because he wants to ensure that his views in that cabinet discussion were communicated to the, the gay, uh, gay community in his own electorate. That's what it was all about. So we'd like to know. What's happened to the police investigation the into that cabinet okay. uh, discussion? Anyway, here we are, four years later. The government still has not delivered on its amendment. Still has not delivered on its promise, solemnly given in writing by the prime minister. I mean, how often are various people in the community going to be misled by this tricky manoeuvring of the prime minister? And I mean. Many, many areas. Well, I just hope that the, the same-sex community in Australia really do understand at the next election just how tricky the Prime Minister has been on this issue. Very, very tricky indeed. And I just hope that they realise just how tricky Minister Turnbull was in leaking those Cabinet discussions, in leaking them to the Financial Review, because we know that he was the one responsible. Himself. So, <clears throat> Labor will be supporting the amendments moved by the Democrats. It is Labor policy to remove the discrimination in this area. I mean, superannuation, superannuation, it's your money. It's your money. It's your saving. It's your saving. So why on earth the government should continue to maintain discrimination when it's your own money, your own superannuation savings, um, why they should continue to maintain discrimination in this area? Um, it's just beyond me. Anyway, we'll be supporting the amendment. Two specific questions to the parliamentary secretary. One is, has a police investigation been called into that leak that was, that was um, detailed in the financial review? Where's the police investigation up to? Oh, oh Senator McGowan. Oh, Senator McGowan. There are not just... <laughs> Well, <laughs> Order, I hope Begar. all of that's on the record. Uh, I hope it's all on the record. Senator Begar, you've had the opportunity to take part in the conversation. Yes. Senator Sherry. Thank you, thank you. I, but I must say, I, I'm um, yes, Senator somewhat taken aback at the intervention of Senator Begar. He listens. He listens um, to the boy. Does he not know what the same sex couples are? There, there is nothing, there is nothing <laughs> more important to Cabinet solidarity than the preservation of confidentiality in cabinet discussion. It was splashed all over the Fin Review, Senator McGowan. Splashed all over the Fin Review. Full detail about who said what on same sex couples and superannuation. Who said what? Um, as I say, we have no doubt it was Minister Turnbull who leaked it. No doubt at all. That should be through the chair. Absolutely. Yes, sorry. Through the chair. Anyway, What's the status of the police investigation? Has there been a police investigation called into that leaking of cabinet, uh, confidential cabinet discussions? Um, 
Well, it is. It's true, Senator McGowan. It's true. He leaked it. He leaked it. I'm not withdrawing it. I'll await the outcome of the police investigation. I'll await the outcome of the police investigation. Oh. Point. I'll take a point of order on that. Uh, Senator Sherry agrees with me. That is, that is a reflection on Senator Turnbull. And uh, I, I would, I, I would, um, Mr. Turnbull. So I would um, ask the senator to uh, withdraw that comment. It, it's a serious accusation he makes towards him. Senator, senator Sherry, on the point of order. I will withdraw it. Look, I'm magnanimous. Um, but I look forward to an update from the parliamentary secretary about the police investigations to who leaked that report. And just Thank for you, Senator McGoran's edification, oh, turn it up. It was in the Fin Review, the full report on who said what about it. I mean, turn it up. Senator Sherry. And I, bet, I, I can guarantee that this committee that the Prime Minister would have been furious, absolutely furious, that someone like uh, Mr Turnbull, someone like Mr Turnbull, could have leaked it for his own political advantage in his own seat. So I hope the, the federal police were called in to identify the perpetrator. Sorry? Senator. Well, I don't know. We'll wait to hear from the parliamentary secretary about, about who leaked it. So an update on the police investigation into that leak. Um, but secondly, I noticed there are officials from the, from the um, ATO here. Could the parliamentary secretary give us an update on the estimated number of Australians? This is the same. This is the appropriate schedule. The estimated number of uh, individuals identified by the ATO at this point in time for whom tax file numbers cannot be identified. I think the last time I asked about this in estimates, it looked like it was going to be about 90, 90 per cent they would identify tax file numbers for, for the purposes of the penalty tax. Uh, what's the update on the approximate percentage identified? So they're the two questions that I'd like a response to from the parliamentary secretary. Thank you, Senator Sherry. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, the government won't be supporting the amendments, um, although the government has publicly indicated that it's in favour of removing discrimination against interdependency couple relationship, people in interdependency relationships, um, but not limiting it to same-sex couple relationships. Uh, it's, as I think I've said it before here in the chamber, um, we don't uh, we don't confine it to same-sex relationships. We we look at it in a broader sense in relation to uh, interdependency relationships um, and the report of the uh, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission was only handed down on the 21st of June this year and as Senator Murray indicated there are 58 acts to, uh, to change in respect of uh, a piece of legislation. With respect to Mr. Sh Senator Sherry's questions, uh, there's no officials here that can give, you an, uh, give us an update in respect of the um, percentage of tax file numbers that are identifiable, so I'll have to take that on notice, Senator Sherry. And uh, I'm not sure that the, uh, the other question really dignifies a response, but as far as I'm aware there's no investigations with respect to the issue that he raised. Uh, matter of the police uh, thank investigation. You, uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Sherry. Well, on the matter of you've missed the, the exchange, um, unfortunately, a very serious matter. A member of Cabinet leaked to the Financial Review, details of discussions on the same-sex couple. This is, this is an allegation, is it? No, it's in the Fin Review. It's oh, not right. an allegation. Well, it's true. It happened. If it's in the Fin Review, it must be true. And, and now, S Senator Colbeck no, thinks ahead. this Please is quite a flippant ahead, matter. <laughs> but any time any documents or discussions are leaked from Cabinet, there is a federal police investigation. So could you check with the officials to see whether or not a federal police investigation has been initiated into that leak? And report in the financial review. You're asking, I'm a bit confused. Then. Are you asking me, Senator Sherry, to check or the parliamentary secretary? Okay, perhaps you should address your remarks with the uh, chair. The parliamentary secretary. Thanks, chair. Uh, as I indicated, uh, Senator Sherry, I'm, I'm not aware of any inv investigations in respect of that matter. Thank you, parliamentary secretary. Senator Sherry. The officials are here. Could he check with the officials to see whether or not a federal police investigation has been initiated into, yes or no? Yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Senator Sherry. The Parliamentary Secretary. Sherry, I think my, my well, my my response was accurate. There are no investigations in respect to the matter you raised. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary. Senator Sherry. Well, just, I, mean, I must say I'm astounded. Yeah. As I said earlier, um, it is very, very rare indeed for confidential discussions in cabinet to be leaked to the media. I can't recall more than a handful of occasions in this government's 11 and a half long years in office. And I do find it quite extraordinary um, that there was no police investigation into this matter. But as I say, we had a discussion. We've got a fair idea who the perpetrator was. Um, as I say, very dis on, on the amendments before us, um, it's more than disappointing. Um, that here we are four years on and the government still has not met the commitment it gave in writing four years ago. And, and of course the major report that Senator Murray, but we didn't need the major report, Senator Murray. We had the commitment in writing from the Prime Minister and he's failed to deliver. Um, Labor will be supporting the amendment moved by Senator Thank Murray. Thank you, Senator Sherry. The question is that uh, Democrats' amendments moved by Senator Murray on sheet 5328 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the... The noes have it? I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Is a, is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells. Turnabout amendment.
Lock the doors, lock the doors. The question is that Democrats' amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 5328 revised be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair, I point Senator Webber, teller for the ayes, Senator McGoran, teller for the noes. There being 33 ayes, 37 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you. The question is that the bill be. Those uh, senators continuing to participate in debate, please take your seats. With the remainder, please leave the chamber as soon as practicable. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Set Senator Sherry. That's T-Lab 5. Oh, on T-Lab 5. Yes, could I? I'll put the question again. Are you on the are you on the question with respect to the bill standards printed, uh, Parliamentary Secretary? No. Okay. Uh, that's to another no, bill. Another that's bill. we'll just deal with this bill first, Parliamentary Secretary. Yes. I'll put the question again that the bill standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee will now move to the Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Bill, Non-Disclosure Tax Bill, and uh, I call. Is that the right? The bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator Sherry. Just to clarify, the government's amendments in respect to Schedule 8, 10, 10. Which bill are they being moved to? We've just dealt with. There's a fourth bill in the package. We've no fourth. 
package of bills with us, as I understand. Uh, we've just considered the Laws Amendment 2007 Measures Bill, which is number four. And we're now dealing with we're now dealing with tax, taxation trustee beneficiary non-disclosure tax bill number one. Sorry, it's not in order. It's not my not my job to question why. So I put the question that the bill stand is printed. That's number one. The bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee will now turn to the Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non-Disclosure Tax Bill Number Two, and call the question: Is the bill standards printed? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. We will now turn to Bill Number Five, Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures Bill Number Five. The question is: The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Chair. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government's request for amendments and amendments to be moved to this bill. The memorandum was circulated in the chamber today. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Is it the wish of the committee that the statements of reasons accompanying the requests be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the requests to which they relate? There being no objection, it is so ordered. What's the question now? Do you want to formally move your amendment, sir, Senator Colby? Thanks, Chair. Uh, firstly, I'd like to move um, government mem uh, amendment um, number one, schedule 10, item one, page 161. The proposed amendment will address, to recommend, address a recommendation of the Senate Standing Committee on Economics to establish a review of the effect of the film production offset to compare levels of production by the Australian independent production sector to production levels of Australian television broadcasters. The government accepts the evidence presented and will act on the committee's recommendation to ensure legislative that this, legislative, that this offset is reviewed in 12 months' time. So full. Ex uh, the full details of the, of the changes are contained and outlined in the supplementary explanatory memorandum already tabled. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary. Senator Sherry. Yes, uh, Labor will be supporting the amendment to Schedule 10. Um, it allows animated programs of 15 minutes to be eligible for the producer rebate. Without this amendment, an animated program would have to be at least 30 minutes to be eligible for the offset. So Labor supports the amendment. And in concluding my remarks, I do note that it's to have yet another review. Yet another review. I mean, I started to count the number of reviews this government has had in the last, say, since the last election, and we're up into the hundreds. Senator McGowan smiling. A bit of an issue being made by hundreds. the government at the moment. Uh, hundreds. Well, sit down and count them, Senator McGowan. Hundreds of reviews and quangos this government set up since the last election. Hundreds of them, and they got the gall to have a shot at us. Um, for uh, making a range of commitments in respect to reviews and investigations if there's a Labor government elected. So I just make the point that um, when it comes to a track record on reviews and quangos and investigations and all these uh, new, um, um, new investigations, uh, this government leaves the Labor Party's commitments for dead. We'll support the amendment. Thank you, uh, Senator Sherry. The question is that the bill be now passed without requests. Yeah, Senator. I go to Schedule 11 and I'd ask our officers here that can assist me with inquiries as to the data source the Treasury used to estimate the amount of R&D undertaken in Australia by multinational companies. Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary. Thanks, Chair. Thank um, you, Senator Kerr. As Senator Carr would uh, be aware and has been um, previously told in respect to his uh, questions or notice at Senate, Senate uh, estimates, it has been a long-standing practice that the government does not provide a breakdown of costings. Thank you, Senator, Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. The costing equates to being uh, 
$222 million in eligible expenditure each year. Uh, how was that $222 million expenditure calculated? How many uh, international firms, subsidiaries are there in Australia that could be potential benefit uh, of this change and how and if they chose to increase their spending? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Chair. Well, um, Senator Carr, I take that essentially the same question in a different form. Um, and so I essentially give you the same answer. Uh, but if you want to persist with the question, I'm quite happy to take it on notice. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Thank you very much. I would uh, ask that the minister take it on notice. And uh, uh, I do note that the, the department officials don't seem to be able to answer any of these questions. How much R&D expenditure do these international companies currently account for? Can you tell me that? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Chair. I'll take that on notice as well. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. The costings for the proposal indicates that the increase in spending by international companies will be the same for every year. That's $222 million. Can you explain to the committee what allowances was made for behavioural changes by the multinational companies in response to this measure. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Again, Senator Carr, I'll have to take that question on notice. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Could I ask uh, how the Treasury managed to come up with the estimates of the take-up rate on the R&D expenditure and the cost to the budget? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Uh, Senator, I don't know that. Uh that uh, I can provide you with, or it's appropriate to provide you with, the methodology of the calculation. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. On what basis do you refuse to provide that information? Senator Carr, I, I don't know that I'm refusing to provide you with information, but you're asking me for a methodology of calculation. Um, the uh, the Treasury. Uh, obviously, uh, has those uh, has a methodology of working it out, um, but uh, given that, uh, as I've said to you previously, it's not a practice of the government, to, and it's been a long-standing practice of government not to provide a breakdown of costings. I think I've uh, I've covered that matter previously. Senator Carr, the the, the parliamentary secretary was still speaking when you stood up. I can't have two speakers standing at the one time. Thank you, Senator uh, Colbeck. Senator Carr. Could I ask uh, what assumptions were made about the inducement effect of this measure? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Senator, I'll take that question on notice. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Further, uh, Parliamentary Secretary, what assumptions were made about the time it would take for, the, for this particular measure to have full effect? Was there an immediate take-up effect or was there to be a lag effect? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. <laughs> um, I'll take that question on notice. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Well, I could ask the Parliamentary Secretary what parameters were calculated. Uh, was there any measure undertaken by Treasury to decide on which modelling outcomes best represents the likely outcome of affecting behavioural change of this particular measure? I, I, what I asked was what were the parameters of the modelling undertaken for Treasury to calculate what would be the best representation of the likely outcome of these particular measures before the committee. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'll, Senator Carr, I'll have to take the question on notice. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr uh, Chairman. It's quite apparent that uh, the government's taken all those questions on notice and that they're not able to answer these rudimentary questions about a measure which they have allocated $500 million on a flat line assumption of $50 million for 10 years, on the assumption that of all the international firms in this country, for the next 10 years, for every year, $222 million will be calculated as the basis of the claims against expenditure. Now, what an extraordinary proposition to put to this parliament. But that is what's being said here, and there can be no explanation given by the government on the basis of which those calculations have been made. With that being the case, I, uh, I didn't in fact expect any different, because it's quite apparent that this is a matter that's been pulled out of the air. These figures have been pulled out of the air, 
and there'd been a calculator on a 10-year flatline assumption. And the government has never, ever been able to get these calculations right. Yet they're only too happy to point the finger about others who seek to establish a policy parameter in this area. And it's quite apparent the government's not able to answer these fundamental questions. So I turn to Schedule 12, uh, Mr Chairman. This is a measure to establish a new innovation board. The minister announced the chair and the deputy chair, but it's not publicly stated how the rest of the 13 positions will be filled. How many board vacancies will be created by this measure? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr, um, I'm going to have to take that question on notice. I'm sorry. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Mr Chairman, these are simple, straightforward questions. How many vacancies are created by this action by this government? We've got officials here, and you're telling me that you cannot tell me an answer to that? What will the process be for the filling of the vacancies on Innovation Australia Board? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr, unfortunately there aren't any officials here from industry department which is uh, looking after the board and so I'm going to have to take that question on notice. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Mr Parliamentary Secretary, uh, can I ask you this? How did you allow a situation to arise where you didn't have appropriate officials here before chair, this chamber Senator to answer Carr. simple questions such as these? Why wasn't it your responsibility Carr, to ensure that officers were here the to answer these questions? I repeat, Senator Carr, would you be kind enough to ask your questions through the chair? I think the uh, parliamentary secretary heard the question. I'd ask him again. How is it that Senator Carr, I disallow that question unless you ask it through the chair. That's all I'm asking. Mr. Chairman, it's quite clear, quite clear. The government is not able to do fundamental tasks that are required of an executive. These are simple questions, and I'd ask again. I ask through you, Mr. Chairman. How is it? That you've allowed a situation to develop where you don't have officers here to answer these basic questions. I didn't allow that to develop, uh, Senator Carr. But you, but you could answer the question if you wish to, Senator Colby. Thanks, Chair. I'm not sure it's a, matter, it's a case of whether or not I wish to. It's, uh, I think it's reasonable that I uh, respond to Senator Carr, and I, um, I have to say I, I'm disappointed that I'm not able to provide the, question, the answers to the questions that you. Uh, that you're asking. I think uh, um, it, it's, you're, you're asking reasonable questions of the government, and uh, um, I'm, I'm not happy that I'm not able to give you that advice. And uh, I've put that on the table as part of uh, a part of the date, the debate, and uh, my actions in taking the questions on notice are quite genuine, so that I can provide with the, you with the information. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Carr. Mr. Chairman, I take the parliamentary secretary's uh, answer in the spirit in which it's been offered. Um, and I think it would be also appropriate for him to point out that there are other more senior people in the government who should have made sure that officers were here to answer these basic questions. But given that, I'd ask you this. In the event that these appointments will be made immediately, what will be the length of time for these appointments? Would you be prepared to take that question on notice with view of the circumstances? And the very last section of the bill states that the appointments of members of the committee under section 22 of the Industry R&D Act are revoked when this new act takes effect. And I'd ask firstly, there are currently nine committees operating under the Industry R&D Board Act, and is it the government's intention to immediately re-establish equivalent committees under the new act? My second question, does the government intend to establish any additional committees relating to the venture capital responsibilities? I would ask, what is the process for the establishment of new committees? And what is the process, and for the fourth question, what is the process of appointing members to those committees and what uh, would be the length of those appointments? Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Senator Carr, uh, I'll uh, t undertake to take that, those questions back to the industry minister and get them to you as soon as I can. Thank you, Senator uh, Colbeck. The question is that government amendment Schedule 10, item 1, moved by Senator Colbeck, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, as against say no, I think the ayes have it. Would you care to move, formally move your second amendment, uh, Senator Colbeck? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I move um, Government Amendments Number uh, to Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures Number 5, um, Items Number 1 to Schedule 10, Item 1, page on page 137, lines 10 and 11, and uh, Schedule 10, Item 1, page. Uh, Senator, I think you're, you're you should be moving your second amendment, which is lines 17 and 18, according to my notice. So, uh, so this is okay. Sch Schedule 10, item 1, page 137, lines 17 and 18. That's it. Thank you, uh, thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Sherry. Labor supports the amendment. The wording is the same. I just think it's applying to a different section. Yes, it's just section. the numbers. We yes, support. thank you. The question is then that uh, government amendment moved by Senator Colbeck, Schedule 10, item 1, lines 17 and 18, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is. You have the. You have a, one other amendment, uh, Senator Colbeck, QG four five zero, on sheet QG four five zero. Fortunately, my pages are not numbered. Would you like making it a little bit difficult for me to? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I move amendment. Um, uh, to schedule 10 on QG 4500. Okay. Senator Sherry. Labor Thank you, me. Senator Sherry. Thank you, uh, Senator Colbeck. The question is that government amendment schedule 10 item 1, page 161, after line 16, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be passed without, with requests. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, committee has considered Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures No. 4, Bill 2007 and three related bills and agreed to the Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures No. 5, Bill 2007 with an amendment and requests and agreed to the other bills without amendment. Parliamentary Secretary. That the report of the committee be adopted. question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye against say no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Clerk. Oh no, those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Tax Laws Amendment 2007, Measures No. 4, Bill 2007, Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non Disclosure Tax Bill No. 1, 2007, and Taxation Trustee Beneficiary Non Disclosure Tax Bill No. 2, 2007. It, it being after 6.30, the sitting of the Senate is suspended till 7.30 pm.
I have received a message from His Excellency the Governor General notifying assent to the following laws Therapeutic Goods Amendment Act 2007, Northern Territory National Emergency Response Amendment Alcohol Act 2007. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day Australian Crime Commission Bill 2007, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Lovewick. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I rise to speak on the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill 2007. Can I say at the outset, of course, that this bill uh, has evidently been rushed in, particularly by the, uh, perhaps you could call it, the preparation that has gone into the bill uh, to date. Uh, it does, uh, and of course I may go to the purpose first, the purpose of this bill is to amend the Australian Crime uh, Commission Act 2002 to clarify that an Australian Crime Commission examiner can record the reasons for issuing a summons or notice to produce before uh, or at the same time or as soon as practicable after the summons or notice has been issued. It also seeks to protect those summonses already issued from being challenged, and that is these summonses are not invalid merely because the reasons were not recorded uh, prior to uh, their issue. This has uh, arisen out of, as we are informed by the government, from a court case uh, with the Australian Crime Commission against Brereton in 2007 which was uh, decided, or I should say the judgment was handed down on the 23rd of August 2007, as I understand it. The issue is that Smith J or said was basically that for a summons to be valid, reasons for issuing the summons must have been issued prior to the time it was actually issued. That uh, case dealt with the issue of two subpoenas, and I'll come to those shortly. But it does seem to uh, demonstrate a couple of things. One thing is that the government uh, has taken a view that this matter needs to now be progressed urgently and has introduced the bill in very short notice. It has not had the opportunity of going to a Senate committee, as many of these bills might otherwise do. The opposition was given notice of this bill only last night. In terms of the background, of course, the Australian Crime Commission is a Commonwealth statutory body working nationally with other federal, state and territory agencies to counter serious and organised crime. It aims to bring together all arms of intelligence gathering and law enforcement to uh, fight uh, against serious and organised uh, criminal activity. The powers of the ACC are at large. The ACC, through an examiner, may summon a person to appear before them at an examination to give evidence and to produce such documents or other things uh, as are referred to in the summons. And of course, the examiner has a special role in the legislation. An examiner has the power under the ACC Act to conduct an examination for the purposes of a special intelligence operation or special investigation. Examiners are independent statutory officers appointed by the Governor General, and the purpose of an examination is to inform an examiner on matters that may relate to the subject matter of the special intelligence operation or an investigation. The government, as I've said, has rushed this bill uh, to the parliament in response to the Supreme Court of Victoria court case at the ACC against Magistrates Court of Victoria and Michael Richard Brereton. Briefly, uh, perhaps it's worthwhile going to the circumstances of that case. Uh, Mr Brereton had attended but refused to be sworn or make an aff affirmation to the truthfulness of the evidence. This was a matter that examiners had uh, requested he attend. Brereton was then subsequently charged, as I understand it, under section 30 of the ACC Act in relation to that refusal. And section 30 is a failure to answer questions. A person who contravenes section 30, as subsections 1, 2 or 3, is guilty of an indictable offence that, subject to this section, is punishable upon conviction by a fine not exceeding 200 penalty units or imprisonment for a period of not exceeding five years. It is, in fact, a serious offence. The counsel uh, for uh, Mr Brereton subpoenaed or sought to subpoena two lots of documents from the ACC. The first document was any documents pursuant to section 28.1a of the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002, which records or evidence that the examiner 
was satisfied that it was reasonable to issue an examination summons. The second, any document pursuant to section 28, subsection 1A of the Australian Crime Commission Act, which records the reasoning for the issue of the examination summons on Mr Michael Burriton. The ACC sought to have both subpoenas struck out as an abusive process on the grounds that they served no legitimate forensic purpose and constituted, in fact, a mere fishing expedition. But to cut to the chase, the magistrate rejected the application to have the subpoenas struck out, but it also transpired during those proceedings that to demand the person say, to take out an oath or affirmation in the context of the proceedings, there must first be a summons properly issued in compliance with the powers pursuant to section 28 of the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002. It is legitimate for a concern to be raised in relation to the exercise of that power, particularly when there is no record within the materials itself as to whether or not the examiner has put his reasons in writing. This is whether the examiner has put reasons in writing and when that occurs it may affect the legality of the summons itself. The decision was appealed to the Supreme Court of Victoria where the Supreme Court upheld the magistrate's decision. And of course the substance of the bill is then to address those circumstances that were raised in the Supreme Court. Firstly, the bill allows an examiner to execute a summons or notice to produce documents who may not be the same examiner who issued the summons or notice to produce. Uh, that in itself uh, doesn't arise directly from the proceedings, but it is one that I'll come back to. The second um, is in respect of the matter that is uh, at least on point with the decision. But of course, Labor understands that situations are uh, in respect of that first point, may arise, for example, illness, leave or urgent duties, when you can imagine that is a requirement that can be uh, sought, and we don't gavel with that provision. The issue, of course, is the bill allows an examiner to record the reasons for issuing a summons or notice to produce after the summons or notice has actually been issued. It is important to note in that context that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Crime Authority Authorities' bipartisan report into the Australian Crime Commission, Establishment Bill 2002, released then uh, subsequently in November 2002, recommended recommendation number 14. And it's worth going to that, that the bill be amended to explicitly provide that examiners must satisfy themselves in each case that before they exercise special powers under the Act, that it is appropriate and reasonable to do so, and that they indicate in writing that the grounds, the grounds, I should say, for having such an opinion. End of quote. The PJC also noted at point 3.42 of that report that the independence of the examiners can be made more evident if the bill is amended to make specific provisions for examiners to assure themselves before exercising their coercive powers that it is appropriate and reasonable to do so and that they indicate the grounds for forming such an opinion. Some members of the uh, PJC believe that the reasons should be recorded in writing. Although there was no uh, formal government response to the PJC, the NCA report, the government's response, uh, if you look, can, it seems to be found in Senator Ian Campbell's second reading speech on the 15th of November 2002, which also specifically addresses recommendation 14, wherein he said, the government agrees that this recommendation, the bill, the Australian Crime Commission Establishment Bill 2002, has been amended to provide that the examiner must satisfy themselves that it is reasonable in all the circumstances to exercise powers to issue a summons or a notice to produce and will be required to reduce to writing the reasons for taking the decision. End of quote. These amendments are outlined in items 9 and 10 of the Australian Crime Commission Establishment Bill 2002 supplementary explanatory memorandum. They do require an examiner to be satisfied that it is reasonable in all the circumstances to issue a summons or notice to produce. The provisions also require the examiner to record in writing the reasons for the issue of the summons. It does seem, though, even at that point, that neither Senator Ian Campbell's second reading speech nor the amendments in the supplementary memorandum to the 2002 bill unambiguously stated when 
the reasons in writing to issue a summons or notice to produce should be provided by an examiner. Clause 2 and 7 of the current bill before us amends subsection 28.1a and 29.1a of the ACC Act to expressly provide that an examiner may record their reasons for issuing a summons or notice to produce before, at the time or as soon as practicable after the summons or notice has actually been issued. It is, of course, uh, concerning to Labor, as it would be to the wider community, that the government does not appear to have, have had an understanding of how the practice of providing a record of reasons subsequent to the issuing of a summons or notice to produce actually operates within the ACC. The government, um, in working through this, uh, there are a range of matters that we will take an opportunity in the committee stage to examine, uh, but of course uh, hopefully it won't take uh, too long this evening. But they relate to the issue of how many summonses have been issued, how they've been audited, how they've been uh, checked against the process of ensuring whether the summons was issued uh, with written reasons at, prior or subsequently to the issue of the summons and how the government has managed that process to date. Labor understands that there is a significant number of uh, cases that uh, are currently before the courts and that information would also be helpful to understand how many cases uh, can be affected by this decision. It does, of course, provide a situation where it appears a legal technicality surrounding the recording of reasons rather than the actual existence of a substantive reason would of itself allow those guilty or, or guilty of serious organised crime to in fact escape. And that is of a concern. It's a concern especially where uh, these are significant cases or could be potentially significant cases where there is significant time and effort and has been employed in them. Uh, and so Labor understands why the amendment has been sought. Item 5 of Schedule 1 ensures that the failure of an examiner to comply with the technical requirements of recording reasons for the issuing of a summons or notice to produce does not affect the validity of such an action. It is important to note, though, that the bill also provides for retrospective operation. Item 10 and 12 validate summons and notices to produce retrospectively since the commencement of the ACC Act. Those matters do require a clear demonstration by the government, and they can take that opportunity in the closing debate to demonstrate the reasons for retrospectivity, because it is a, a fundamental rule of law that, uh, generally in Westminster systems, that retrospectivity is not permitted. Most people should be aware of what the law is at the time uh, that uh, they are charged with or sought to have the law exercised. But in this instance, weighing uh, the matter itself, Labor will support the legislation. It does that uh, with the knowledge that the government does have a heavy onus upon it, a clear onus to be able to demonstrate through these proceedings this evening that those matters that have been raised, there are clear and unequivocal answers. Labor recognises that, in addition, in certain circumstances, uh, urgent action is necessary due to operational requirements that the practice of issuing a summons and then subsequent uh, reasons to be written down uh, can occur. But it should really be standard practice where, in all circumstances, you can form a reason, write those reasons down, issue the summons and at least ensure that you then have a proper auditing process. Given, of course, that uh, this is the last week in which Parliament <coughs> is likely to be sitting before a federal election, Labor will, as I've said, agree to facilitate passage. But we will continue to have a look at the operation of this provision. We're not going to provide an unqualified support for it. It does need to ensure that it does operate as fairly as it is able, that it is, in fact, a technical hitch that has occurred and that it can be remedied uh, without uh, causing uh, grave injustice to individuals and ensuring that the law itself works properly and appropriately. So from a uh, broader perspective, when you examine uh, the issues in detail, uh, you can see uh, to the extent that the uh, 
matters that, as I've said, were raised in the Victorian case uh, do provide, I think, some substantive reasoning for why the government now has sought to uh, provide this amendment. There is, of course, a range of issues that go to the matter itself. And I think it can be best expressed in this way when you turn to the decision itself by the Victorian Supreme Court, where this matter, of course, as I've indicated, was ventilated. In that uh, judgment itself, the matters uh, that I've averred to uh, did provide some reasoning within uh, the decision. Of course, it doesn't appear to be, although I'm open to uh, correction on this, it doesn't appear to have been the uh, substantive point that was made, but it does appear to be, in fact, a subsidiary point or a collateral point that was made by Justice Smith in the issue. But having uh, said that, what is important to understand is that there are uh, matters that do need to be carefully considered. When you look at the decision, it does appear that particularly from page 9, as I've said of that decision, the clear purpose of section 28, and I quote, 1A is both to focus and enhance decision making and provide an accountability mechanism by requiring the creation of an audit trail under section 59 of the ACC Act. The record is potentially available on request of the Portfolio Minister and to the Parliamentary Joint Committee of the Australian Crime Commission, constituted under part 3 of the ACC Act. And it is not uncommon, uh, for, uncommon with investigative agencies. Uh, the parliament has uh, counterbalanced the secrecy regime that is erected to ensure the effectiveness of the ACC investigations with a measure of public accountability through a dedicated parliamentary oversight committee. It may also be a matter that this should be returned uh, to the ACC or parliamentary committee for further uh, monitoring, oversight and examination as well. And it would be encouraging for the minister to advise uh, of that. The decision, though, as I've said, where Justice Smith, uh, his honour, went on to say that it seemed to have been a, in the context of this issue, that uh, it was raised not as the primary point, but still an important point that it is clear that the uh, government, it appears on the face of the record, cannot ignore. But of course, they're not the only uh, stakeholders in this. The uh, there has been, uh, at least raised with me by the Law Council, uh, legitimate concerns about the bill, about its impact. And the Law Council uh, suggests and believes that the government intends to pass in haste uh, a bill which is specifically designed to perpetrate an injustice. The government does need to explain uh, how that uh, will, in fact, be, the concerns will be allayed. Of course, we know that Michael Berrett is currently being prosecuted in Victoria for refusing to be sworn or take an affirmation after he answered a summons to appear before the Australian Crime Commission and how his rights will be affected in dealing with this. But we can't um, also uh, put aside the issue that uh, these sorts of matters should not be attacked on mere technical grounds. It is important that, in the interest of justice, that justice is not only uh, done but seen to be done. But in terms of the uh, more specific matters, I will take an opportunity during the committee stage to raise uh, some of those, and I suspect the minister will be able to, if not provide an answer this evening, uh, take it on notice. But fundamentally, Labor has indicated that it will uh, support the legislation. But of course, I remind uh, the minister, really in closing, that he does have a statement of expectation from the Australian Crime Commission, where uh, Senator the Honourable David Johnston, Minister for Justice and Customs, has indicated that it is his, his expectation that the Australian Crime Commission will, and he goes through a range of eight points. And can I encourage the minister to also include an issue of ensuring that there is oversight and audit of these types of work? Because without a clear audit trail, without clear oversight, without the figures being provided and collated, Errors like this can unfortunately creep in, and you can see how easily they can be perpetrated over a, 
a significant amount of time between both when the legislation was first introduced in 2002, when it was again uh, re reviewed, I should say, in 2006, and then uh, only really come to light as a collateral matter in a Victorian case. That uh, occasionally does happen. In this instance, it, it has happened. And of course, it does have serious implications for the current procedures that the ACC have. And I encourage Senator, the minister to advise how we will resolve. Senator Dr. Spoyer. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, the government and the chamber won't be surprised to hear that uh, the Democrats are at best a little peeved at the process before us. I think uh, certainly I attempted to convey that in my remarks this afternoon when we debated the idea that this bill should be cut off uh, from ex exempt from the cut-off provision, and that had little to do, um, although was related to, um, with the complex or controversial uh, nature of this legislation. Legislation that uh, the government refers to as. Uh, as dealing with uh, a technical matter, it was partly because of, and primarily at that stage, because of the process. Madam Deputy President, uh, it is not acceptable for this House, as a House of Review, for senators to receive legislation of a controversial, even urgent nature at that time well, we received it this morning, and uh, yes, through you to the minister, received a, a briefing for which we're thankful, and then have it exempt from the cut-off provision and debated the same day. Now, I understood from the debate earlier that the minister was going to, that Senator Abetz, who was on duty in the chamber, was to endeavour to not delay unnecessarily this process for the benefit of the chamber, not just the crossbenchers, not just the Democrats, but so that there could be some pretense of consultation and debate within the broader community, namely the legal community, my understanding was that there was going to be some attempt to delay this process. And, uh, the government may suggest that uh, there may have been a couple of hours, for which we are pathetically grateful and thank you, because it did enable us to make some phone calls and consult with relevant authorities and groups. Um, but to deal with this legislation on the same day that it is cited is not acceptable. I know it's par for the course these days, uh, and I hope, I hope that will change, Madam Deputy President, regardless of who is in power. This is unacceptable use of the Senate's uh, powers, and at least the government could have waited till tomorrow morning. So having put on record um, my concerns with the, the process, I'm happy to turn to the substantive nature of the legislation before us. And the Democrats, in the time that we've had to be briefed on, analyse, scrutinise this bill and, of course, consult with relevant groups in the community. We believe that this bill amounts to a government patching up its mistakes and doing so at the expense of fundamental legal principles and, in doing so, also showing absolute contempt uh, to the lawmaking procedures in this place. The bill, as we have heard, amends the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002. It's clearly a direct response uh, to the decision of Justice Smith in the Victorian Supreme Court in ACC v Brereton, uh, 2007. Its intent is to rectify a perceived deficiency in Division Two of the Act, uh, exposed by the court's decision. And as we've heard, as we know, Division Two deals with the coercive powers of the ACC, and these powers, Madam Acting Deputy President, are by no means uncontroversial. So before we even get to the point of debating the legislation and the change before us, we already start from the recognition and the premise that current powers in that relevant division are indeed controversial. Division 2 allows an ACC examiner to compel witnesses to give evidence, including in circumstances where that evidence may be self-incriminating. And of course, various peak legal bodies have consistently opposed the extensive and the wide-ranging used, uh, wide, widely used and wide-ranging uh, coercive powers of the ACC examiners on the basis that they do represent an unjustified abrogation of the privilege against self-incrimination. And I'm aware of 
you know, some of the debates that have taken place on this, Madam Acting Deputy President, whether it's been through National Crime Authority Committee days or the ACC, the new legislation, relatively new. But these powers are controversial and they are questioned at best um, and condemned at worst by a number of groups in the community. In ACC v Brereton, the court ruled that Section 281A of the Act required an ACC examiner to record in writing for the issue of a summons or notice to produce issued under Division 2 of the Act prior to the issue. Indeed, counsel acting for the ACC in that case himself conceded, was up front to the court, that the existence of a document regarding the examiner's reasons for issuing the summons was a condition precedent to the issue of the summons. In other words, the summons couldn't be issued unless the ACC had first justified its reasons for doing so. Now, it's interesting to reflect on what the judge hearing the matter said at this point. His Honour Justice Smith said, and I quote Madam Acting Deputy President, the preconditions are no doubt specified because of the significant inroads made to the right to silence and the need to ensure that the power is properly exercised. End quote. Well, the bill proposes to amend the Act such that the reasons for the issue of the summons required to be recorded under Section 281A will now be able to be provided as soon as practicable after the issue of the notice. Now, the government is telling us that this amendment is justified, it's necessary, because the situation as it stands is problematic, whereas where a summons has to be issued urgently or where a large number of summonses may be issued at one time. The government says, therefore, that this is a technical amendment. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sure we're going to hear that. Um, we've heard it as a justification, we've seen it as a justification, and I'm sure it will be put forward again. But a lot of groups do not agree that this is merely technical, and I tell you what, the Australian Democrats beg to differ on that point. Um, I consider that the explanatory memorandum is another um, in a long line of explanatory memorandums which are uh, arguably misleading uh, in, a, in, a, in a similar manner. Madam Acting Deputy President, it's clear from Justice Smith's reasoning that he did not, review, did not view the requirement of an ACC examiner to issue reasons as a perfunctory exercise. On the contrary, Justice Smith considered that reasons were a necessary and substantive requirement of the decision-making process undertaken by the examiner. I'm sure when Justice Smith uh, made this finding, he did not envisage a legislative fix to the problem that simply abolish, simply remove the protective element. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I've discussed the extraordinary nature of the ACC's coercive powers to compel a person to produce documents, uh, to attend an examination and to answer questions, even when the information sought may be self-incriminating. But in addition to this, the ACC's extraordinary powers are exercised, as we know, behind a veil of secrecy. We should expect in these circumstances that the powers are exercised according to the letter of the law. As the Law Council puts it, and again I quote, strict compliance with the law is the least we can expect from enforcement agencies exercising, exercising extraordinary powers. Parliament would send a very dangerous message if it rewarded agencies which ignore the requirements of the law by passing retrospective legislation which not only shields the offending agency from the consequences of their past non-compliance, but reduces the safeguards they must comply with in the future. Mr Acting Deputy President, that's from the Law Council, the peak representative body in terms of legal, the legal profession in this country. They have put out a statement today uh, with the same, well, arguably much shorter level of notice as the rest of us. They are not impressed by this legislation. Section 281A contains dual requirements. A, that an examiner only issue a summons if he is satisfied that it is necessary to do so, and B, that he records his reasons in writing uh, are inherently linked. Mr Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, the second item is not a mere technicality, is not a mere technicality as the government suggests. Far from it, the requirements uh, operate together as a safeguard, safeguard against the misuse of the coercive powers and to deliver a degree of tangible accountability each time the powers are exercised. 
So after the Brereton decision, the government is caught between a rock and a hard place. It is apparent that for some reason the ACC decided that it did not need to record its reasons, at least prior to any summonses or notices to produce being issued. This is despite the wording of section 28.1a as it stands, which I think pretty clearly states that um, written reasons should be recorded. And uh, I'm not sure what the, the minister's interjection was, but maybe he will respond to, to that process. And it's okay. Look, through you, I mean, if people are frustrated by this debate, especially the government frustrated debate, it's nothing. You've got nothing on the rest of us. Absolutely nothing on the rest of us. Less than 24 hours to look at, scrutinise, analyse, debate, potentially amend and pass this legislation. And then it's going to committee. We're going to embrace retrospectivity. We may, may as well embrace it for all things. Retrospective committee references, retrospective legislation. <sighs> Extraordinary. The result, it says, is that a raft of evidence obtained under the ACC's coercive powers is now subject to legal challenge. Now, we're not dismissing that. We're not disputing that. We're not suggesting that's not an important thing. But it would have been nice to ensure that people had time to digest that and look at the myriad of potential solutions available to, uh, to the government, or at least look at the myriad of implications, uh, fundamental implications, as a consequence of going down this particular legislative path. But what does the government do? It attempts to legislate retrospectively to remedy the ACC's problems and their incompetence. Retrospectively. Now, that is a big deal in that, this place, Mr Acting Deputy President, and at some time I am sure that most senators, in dealing with a range of legislation, let alone legislation that deals with issues of criminality, but legislation dealing with retrospectivity is controversial generally, and specifically in this case you bet it's controversial. The effect will be that any summonses or notices issued uh, prior to the bill being enacted and prior to the decision, of course, in ACC, ACC versus, uh, v Brereton will be valid. And we understand that there are up to 30 prosecutions currently on foot. I'm sure the government will outline those issues for us. But in those, uh, those uh, um, prosecutions involving evidence uh, obtained in accordance with Division 2, and that that will be affected by the bill. So again, the Democrats do not underestimate some of the issues at stake here but not just the issue of those prosecutions or other cases that uh, uh, may be pending, but the issues too relating to fundamental legal principles that are potentially breached, breached as a consequence of this legislation. Mr Acting Deputy President, again, as the Law Council has stated, this will have the effect of making suddenly valid summonses which were previously invalid. As a consequence, people who had previously committed no offence in that they had failed to comply with an invalid summons, will suddenly be retrospectively liable to criminal sanction. That's what they're saying, the Law Council. So obviously I ask the government to respond to those particular uh, accusations because that's incredibly, um, <laughs> that's quite dire. The right to certainty before the law and not to be subject to retrospective criminal sanction is actually a fundamental uh, legal right. It's actually a basic human right. Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights provides that no one shall be held guilty of a penal offence made so retrospectively. Article 15 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights provides that no one shall be held guilty of any criminal offence on account of any act or omission which did not constitute a criminal offence under national or international law at the time when it was committed. So, Mr Acton Deputy President, my opposition to this legislation is obviously evident, but I'm not alone. I'm not alone in having concerns about the process and the policy that we're debating today. I think it was summed up well today by the Law Council in their comments when they said, the Law Council believes that the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill, which the government intends to pass in haste, is specifically designed to perpetuate an injustice. The government is inviting the parliament to be complicit in this act. The parliament should reject the proposals. 
Mr. Acting Deputy President, the Democrats agree with this sentiment. The bill will abrogate a fundamental human right, and that is not to be subject to retrospective criminal sanction. And if that is acceptable, if that is the new uh, mode, the new uh, acceptable uh, uh, form in this place, then we need to know about it. And is this standard across the board, or is this just in relation to the particular uh, powers and the arguably coercive powers of the ACC at that? I mean, is this not particularly? Um, I mean, maybe it's not that serious for, for some, clearly. It deals with very controversial provisions which abrogate the right to remain silent, and yet we've been given a day to consider it. A day to consider it. Moreover, the bill removes safeguards which are not only procedural but form part of the substantive process in an examiner being satisfied that a summons or notice to produce ought to be issued, thus invoking the jurisdiction of the ACC to use its coercive powers. Now, I do acknowledge, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the government, including the minister's office um, and the ACC, uh, have all made attempts to explain their, uh, the, the purported urgency their understanding of the urgency of, of the legislation uh, before us. And my goodness, of course we acknowledge that the ACC, the, the Crime Commission, has an incredibly tough time in, in you know, combating uh, organised crime and, of course, in some cases, without a doubt in some cases, the powers that they have have been and are justified. This is not about the Democrats going soft on crime or you know, wanting people to get away with things. This is us doing our job as legislators in terms of debating legislation in a way that ensures proper time and reflection. But I do acknowledge that the government, and certainly the minister's office today, very happy to provide briefings. Thank you for that. Um, very helpful. Um, but in terms of the government's role, the government of the day, doing this in such a hasty um, manner, we need more justification. I do believe that there has been a pattern in this place of government members on occasion paying lip service to the scrutiny role, the scrutinising role of this particular chamber. Um, and there are times when it is more evident than others, and I think that having less than 24 hours to deal with legislation that I do believe has wide-ranging wide -ranging uh, impacts um, and is such a highly contentious uh, piece of, of law and is arguably offensive to principled sections of the law, then I think on a day like today um, it is, uh, the Senate is not, is not doing its job. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I realise that uh, obviously this debate has been on, brought on quickly. Um, there aren't many speakers on the list. I think there's uh, three of us from non-government parties. I'm assuming the intention is to move into the committee stage immediately after this, so there will be uh, minimal time. I do note that uh, in his comments uh, Senator Ludwig uh, indicated that he would be asking, on behalf of the opposition, he'd be asking the government uh, some questions, uh, that uh, some of which he expected they would take on notice. I'm just wondering, um, through you, <laughs> Minister, to, uh, to Mr Acting Deputy President, to, um, to Senator Ludwig, uh, um, I'm assuming you're either confident of answers tonight or when you say take on notice that uh, given that the bill is going to go through tonight that uh, I'm not quite sure of the, the time frame um, that you're allowing. So in conclusion, Mr Acting Deputy President, don't doubt the importance of this bill. I don't doubt that the government believes that there is an urgency and that there is a matter that needs to be resolved. I do doubt that this is merely technical. I do believe this had broad-ranging implications and I really think the government could have acceded to our request not to give us a token hour or two uh, in relation to this legislation. It pretty much stayed in the same place on the notice paper, let's face it, if not moved up, um, but could have given us uh, another night. I wonder what consultations have taken place between the government, relevant authorities and, of course, the affected communities, and by that I mean clearly the legal sector. I'm wondering what uh, discussions and negotiations have taken place, because my reading of the, uh, the Law Council's uh, attitude is that they have nothing but contempt for this process and the legislation before us, and on those grounds the Democrats will not be supporting the legislation. Thank you. Uh, Mr Whip. Mr Acting Deputy President, I just want to correct the record. Uh, there's not a token hour or two. It, it's totally dependent upon how many speakers there are before the bill. And, uh, uh, Senator Nettle. 
Uh, thank you. I want to echo Senator Stotters Boyer's comments in relation to the process by which we are dealing with this legislation. The Australian Crime Commission's role is to address serious and organised crime in Australia. Over time, it has acquired extremely draconian coercive powers that have eroded fundamental legal principles such as the right to silence and the privilege against self-incrimination. The Australian Crime Commission's special coercive powers include the ability to summon a person to an examination to give evidence under oath or affirmation and the power to obtain documents. Penalties for failing to comply with the Australian Crime Commission's coercive powers include fines and imprisonment. It's this power to issue summons requiring people to answer questions with a limited right to silence and no privilege against self-incrimination that this bill seeks to expand. This Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill, which the government is seeking to rush through Parliament, will remove one of the few mechanisms of accountability over the use of the Australian Crime Commission's coercive powers. The bill will operate retrospectively to validate any and all summons that have been issued unlawfully by the Australian Crime Commission. It will also mean that any future summons issued by Crime Commission examiners will not have to conform to the existing accountability for the issuing of summons. The impetus for this extraordinary legislation was the recent case before the Victorian Supreme Court that others have referred to. The case was part of an ongoing legal proceeding that, aris that arose from Operation Wickenby, which is part of a very large investigation and prosecution of alleged tax, e tax evasion associated with various participants in the media, entertainment and sporting industry. Before I canvass the issues that arose in that case and this bill, I want to make clear that the Australian Greens are very supportive of the work of the Tax Office and others to detect, to prevent and to punish tax evasion. Integrity of the tax system is crucial to ensuring the government's capacity to provide services and programs for all Australians. However, that is not the issue before the Senate today. We are considering what powers and what limitations on those powers are proper for the Australian Crime Commission. I make that point because the government has sought to justify this bill primarily by reference to the particular high-profile tax evasion case, which they say may be hampered because of the failure to follow the existing forms of accountability set out in the Australian Crime Commission Act. It is not and should not be the role of this parliament to rush through special legislation to make up for the shortcomings or failings of investigators in particular tax evasion cases. The government says that the bill um, will provide that a summons or notice will not be invalid merely because it fails to comply with technical requirements of the Act. These so-called technical requirements are the need for a Crime Commission examiner to record reasons before issuing a summons. The recording of reasons is not, as the government says, merely technical, but one of the few mechanisms of accountability that there is over the Crime Commission's coercive powers. The Victorian Supreme Court pointed this out in its judgment in the Brereton case, quoting the decision of the magistrate in the original hearing in which the, his honour said that the requirement to record reasons, quote, is both to focus and enhance decision making and to provide an accountability mechanism by requiring the creation of an audit trail. Under section 59 of the Australian Crime Commission Act, that record is potentially available on request to the portfolio minister and to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Crime Commission, constituted under Part 3 of the Australian Crime Commission Act. As is not uncommon with investigative agencies, the Parliament has counterbalanced the secrecy regime it has erected to ensure the effectiveness of the Australian Crime Commission's investigations with a measure of public accountability through a dedicated parliamentary oversight committee. The court then went on to say that the production of such records is also important because the question of access to a record of, of reasons might occur, quote, in the context of a criminal trial where an issue is raised as to satisfaction of a precondition to a valid examination summons and the document recording the reasons is sought using a, 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 a subpoena. Um, that is the present context and is very different. There is every reason to allow the usual trial procedures to operate. There would be little comfort to an accused person sitting in jail after sentence to find out subsequently through the actions of a parliamentary committee that the conviction is invalid. The government also seeks to justify this bill by claiming that the existing Act does not require the record of reasons for the issuing of the summons to be made prior to the issuing of the summons. 
This is a tortured argument, given that if the government thought that was the case, then why is the bill being brought forward? In any event, this is clearly not the view of the Victorian Supreme Court or, indeed, counsel for the Australian Crime Commission in the Brereton case. His, honours found, his honour found that, quote, there was, as counsel for the plaintiff properly conceded in the proceedings, a condition precedent on the validity of the issuing of the examination summons, namely the existence of a document recording the examiner's reasons for issuing the examination summons, such document to be in existence before the examination summons was issued. His Honour then went on to say, and I quote, that the preconditions, that is the production of a record of reasons, are no doubt specified because of the significant inroads made to the right to the silence and the need to ensure that the power is properly exercised. So contrary to what the government is saying in this place today, the courts clearly believe that the present act requires a record of reasons to be produced before a summons is issued. Let us then be clear about why the government is bringing forward this bill. It is doing so because it wants to override the views of the Victorian Supreme Court and the existing accountability under the Act and further loosen the limits on the coercive powers of the Australian Crime Commission. It is doing so retrospectively because it seems clear that at least some of the warrants issued by the Australian Crime Commission have not been issued in the manner that was required by law which, as the court has said, requires a record of reasons to be made prior to the issuing of the summons. The Australian Greens do not support this bill. We do not think this important mechanism of accountability should be removed, and we do not believe that it should be removed retrospectively. It is not the first time in recent history that the government has brought forward ad hoc amendments to the Australian Crime Commission Act to reduce accountability. Most recently, for example, it used the pretext of the intervention in the Northern Territory to lengthen the tenure of Australian Crime Commission examiners. This bill should not be rushed through the parliament at the end of this sitting on the eve of an election. It is a further example of the cavalier attitude of the government to fundamental rights and liberties in this country. And it is further evidence of why we need a bill of rights in this country. The Greens will not support this bill. Uh, Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank members for their contribution to this debate. The Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill 2007 clarifies that the Australian Crime Commission examiner can record their reasons for issuing a summons or notice to produce before, at the same time or as soon as practicable, after the summons or notice has been issued. And I say that with respect to clarifying very clearly that Section 281A of the Act has uh, a provision which says before issuing a summons under subsection 1, the examiner must be satisfied that it is reasonable in all the circumstances to do so. Full stop. The section goes on to say the examiner must also record in writing the reasons for the issue of the summons. Now, the technical issue at stake here in this amendment is when, when the examiner should record in writing the reasons for the issue of the summons. And what we have had recently in the Victorian Court of Appeal is uh, his honour, Justice Smith, stating that he should do that before the issue of the summons. Nowhere in the, um, in the section is that made clear. Um, it is not practical to await a parliamentary committee inquiry into the Australian Crime Commission Bill before proceeding to debate on this bill and passage. As a result of the findings, as I have said of Justice Smith in the Brereton matter, there is a pressing risk of collateral challenge to the validity of quite a large number of summons and notices issued by the Australian Crime Commission examiners. Significant prosecutions could be derailed or delayed based on challenges to the validity of summonses and notices if we do not make these amendments now. Um, can I say that the government does support having the maximum degree of parliamentary review, and I support this, of amendments of this kind that is possible. I will therefore write to the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Crime Commission to invite the committee to review these amendments, albeit after the event, if deficiency is found or that the uh, degree of protection, uh, safeguards, checks and balances is not found to be sufficient. The government will then consider those findings and seek to address those points raised whilst seeking to preserve the integrity of the intent of the legislation. Now, can I also um, briefly mention an issue that I do feel strongly about, and that of course is retrospectivity. 
I note that some provisions of this bill apply retrospectively to provide the summonses or notices to, produ to, to produce issued after the commencement of the ACC Act, but prior to the commencement of the bill are not invalid where reasons were recorded subsequent to their issue. I understand that the re retrospective application of these provisions could be detrimental to persons who might otherwise have had scope to challenge the validity of the summonses or notice to produce. And can I say that those persons would, no doubt, in the practical reality of defending their position, instruct their counsel to take proceedings in line with the precedent set out in, in, in Brereton. They would incur considerable cost, they would incur expense and time, and indeed court time would be taken in the pursuit of this recently elicited um, precedent. What we seek to do is to stop them doing that um, whilst also providing for the integrity, as I say, of the intent behind these provisions. The government considers, however, that this is a just and appropriate outcome, that is, to amend this Act at this time, it does not consider that a failure to record reasons for issuing a summons or notice prior to the issue of the summons or notice should give a person who would otherwise have been convicted of an offence of an offence uh, technical grounds to challenge the admissibility of evidence and thereby escape conviction. Um, may I also um, say, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, prosecutions need to turn on facts and evidence, and, and I, I for one, in the scope of these provisions, don't believe that uh, they should turn on matters of a technical nature. Now, what we seek to do here is to clarify a, an equivocal provision, an apparently equivocal provision, because it's now been construed, and I'm respectful of His Honour's decision. We seek to clarify that so that uh, our Crime Commission can move forward with confidence, and indeed those people uh, who may um, come under the purview of this legislation as citizens will know precisely where they stand. Need I say the government will always be vigilant where there is a technical issue that seeks to uh, allow um, for uh, a defence issue to be raised um, on, on the basis of a misinterpretation or a vagueness or uncertainty within the legislation, the government in these circumstances will be ready to act. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Minister. The question is, the bill be read a second time? Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those, uh, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Just in, uh, I'll try to confine my remarks to uh, eliciting some responses to the issues at hand rather than go to the detail of uh, substantive submissions. In terms of uh, the process, is the minister able to say uh, how many uh, matters are in fact uh, affected by uh, the invalidity? When I say that is, perhaps if, uh, if it can be ascertained those summonses that have been issued which would fall uh, to this technicality if the legislation was not passed. The second part of that, and I'll try to encapsulate uh, the broader issues as well, is that when you look at the Law Council submission uh, they say also as a consequence people who had previously committed no offence in that they had failed to comply with an invalid summons will suddenly be retrospectively liable to criminal sanction. Whether there is also a class of individuals who have uh, failed to apply, failed to, uh, to uh, comply with an invalid uh, summons, i.e. in the sense of it could be attacked for the technical reasons that have been uh, highlighted by uh, His Honour Smith. And then, of course, whether uh, the processes of the ACC, how they operate in terms of the examiner, 
uh, dealing with the uh, issue of the summons. In other words, it seems to be what I've understood from the summing up that the examiner, and perhaps the minister can confirm this, where the examiner forms the reason, then uh, by and large uh, takes the opportunity of issuing the summons because the operations might be live or happening or unfolding, and then subsequently or contemporaneously to the issue of the summons prepares his written reasons, in other words, reduces his uh, view to writing, and then uh, subsequently prior to an examination, uh, those matters are available, and they could be uh, those reasons, of course, then could be challenged uh, by a counsel for the person who is uh, subject to the summons for a range of reasons. Uh, they may be uh, able to then, of course, the government could argue public interest immunity and the like. But it was trying to ascertain how many is there statistics which demonstrate the examiner who might do it prior to, at the time of the summons, or then after the summons. And if none of those statistics are kept, whether it's the intention to ensure that there is an audit and trial under the proposed new regime as well, because what you're now uh, suggesting is that the new regime will in fact have those three uh, distinct possibilities available uh, to the uh, examiner, that the record be made before the issue of the summons or at the same time as the issue of the summons or as soon as practical after the issue of the summons. In addition to that, and I'll, I'll keep going uh, whilst I've got the uh, call, that the question uh, also arises when you look at as soon as practical after the issue of the summons, whether that in creates another uh, problem of determining uh, how long that point is and whether it can be collaterally attacked on the basis of a technicality because of the uh, as soon as practicable, what that means. It, uh, I know it has been uh, a difficult issue of determining what that length of time, but there is likely to be a time when it is uh, outside what as soon as practicable there is. So you then end up with another opportunity for a collateral attack in respect of the summons uh, on the point that it may have been a more than practicable time afterwards. And of course that would then turn on the facts and issues of the case itself. This concerns me that you might be opening up another uh, technical point down the track. It seems to be that uh, when you read the original uh, 28 one uh, uh, that it, it didn't, and you go back and have a look at the records, it didn't uh, seem to seize the issue of when uh, the ACC should, the examiner and the, for the ACC, should uh, reduce the reasons that they'd already formed to writing, whether it was an oversight or whether, in fact, it was already in their mind how the process would work uh, and nobody sought to turn their mind to it. I'll pause at, at that moment. There is a few other matters, but I'll give the opportunity for the minister to answer. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Minister. Sorry, uh, there are some in excess of 600 summonses been issued that would be subject to um, Section 28 one A. However, of course, there are arising from those potentially approximately only 30 prosecutions. I'm advised that in almost all cases there are reasons written shortly after the affirmation of the issue of the summons. Um, reasonable, reasonably practicable in terms of time to provide those reasons is a matter for the court. Now, the simple reason for that is because in each of the circumstances there may be uh, different issues to deal with, different reasons, different urgencies, uh, different contexts, and indeed what in one case may be almost contemporaneous for reasons which would be justifiable may indeed be some long or some short time after the issue of the summons. So reasonable practic practicable um, for the um, uh, amendment uh, is a matter to be, as soon as practicable after the issue of the summons, is a matter for determination and adjudication by the court, should there be a challenge. Uh, you, you sound a little bit. Uh, thank you, Chair. The other final point uh, 
went to those class, uh, you indicated there were 30 prosecutions on foot, uh, but whether that class is those who had failed to comply with the summons. In other words, whether there are any individuals other than um, if we put Mr Berrett in a class of his own uh, and say, are there any who have failed during that period to comply with the summons in that point where they were then done, in other words, the reasons were then reduced to writing after the summons. Now, that may not be able to be ascertained, uh, but it might be, so I'll, I'll see how the minister can shed light on that. Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Chair. Oh, no, I'm told that, that um, all, all of those summonses um, have, have been um, attended by circumstances uh, of a summons with reasons um, at some short time afterwards. Some of them have been, um, there will be some that have been at the same time, but um, the vast majority, the 600, have only yielded 30 prosecutions that are currently on foot. No, no, not failure to comply. Not failure to comply. Right? They're not failure to comply. Senator Ludwig. I thought that the 30 prosecutions were those that were uh, prosecutions at large about matters that uh, they're in uh, strife about. The point that I'm trying to ascertain is how many, if any, uh, of the 600 relate to people who have filed to comply with the summons and then have been charged with failure to comply with the, with the summons. In other words, they have then uh, either suffered a 200 penalty or a five-year term, as the case may be, and been prosecuted for failing to answer the question. The Minister. Thank you, Chair. There are very, very few prosecutions for failure to comply. The 30 are the substantial cases wherein the summons, with the annotated reasons attached a short time after, have yielded a superior pro prosecution. That is, ch charges flowing from with respect to those 30 major matters. But there have been, as I say, in excess of 600 summonses executed. Uh, Senator what I was alluding to earlier, thank you, Chair, in respect of uh, taking on notice, and of course that information can be passed to the parliamentary joint a committee when it does look at this, in terms of those matters that uh, what the Law Council raise and what I raise is the number of uh, persons, and I understand the, the, the number is relatively short, but how many, and I'm, you can take it on notice, which do in fact fit into that uh, class, that class where they have failed to uh, answer the summons in some way as a consequence refused, I should say, to answer the summons and therefore have been subsequently prosecuted for refusing to answer the summons in some way, shape or form and have suffered a penalty. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Chair. There's not very many, approximately, but don't hold us to it, a half a dozen would have refused and would have the benefit of this particular case. Or may have the benefit. I don't know, but may have the benefit. Would would have a live issue to explore in terms of justifying their refusal on the basis of this case. Sounds a little bit on a technical ground, yeah. and and it would then turn on the factual uh, matrix of the case if if, if it was pursued, um, so on and so forth. The um, other matter, of course, goes to the advice uh, provided to other states and territories. I understand the ACC is a, a, a body that does liaise with uh, various states and territories in its operations. And Have the states and territories been advised of this issue and uh, what's their response to date? There hasn't been a response to date. Yes, I haven't sir. written to them, but I will shortly. Senator Ludwig. And as I understand it, the states and territories do have complementary legislation in their uh, respective states and territories. And as such, is the minister able to identify whether the same issue also arises within those states and territories and whether or not the minister intends to uh, take action to assist the states or uh, find out what the states will do? That is also a matter that I would expect the parliamentary join a committee could uh, also monitor. Minister. Thanks, Chair. We're not aware of any matters that the states have that directly 
are on point with respect to the problem here, but we will write to them. We will seek that they amend um, and have harmonious legislation to our legislation following this amendment. Senator Dr. Boyer. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick query in relation to the process of the joint committee. I understand from the minister's remarks that uh, he will write to the, um, the parliamentary joint committee in order to facilitate this process. But is there a time frame that, uh, through you, Chair, to the minister, that he envisages? Uh, obviously, one of the reasons we're dealing with this legislation and others so quickly uh, is because of um, the fact this could be our last. Uh, sitting week for the parliament, so uh, obviously that has some impact on the um, available time to investigate these matters. Uh, um, Minister. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. I anticipate writing to uh, the through you. I anticipate writing to the committee, if not this week, early next week. What the committee does is for the committee. They will either reject my letter and say they're perfectly happy, or they will take it um, and conduct an inquiry or conduct uh, of, of, of extent or a narrow inquiry, it's the matter for them. But the, I'd anticipate they'd rep report possibly in the new year. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. Is the Minister able to explain the current uh, auditing procedures for the 600-odd uh, uh, summonses that have been issued, whether uh, the Minister can uh, is aware of how they actually uh, ensure that the warrants are tracked in the process. It, it struck me that the way the summonses uh, are issued, you would track that, i.e. the summons itself, but whether or not uh, the ACC track when the uh, written, uh, written uh, reasons are reduced and published and dated, and whether they track whether that's prior to an examination taking place, or can the minister rule out that at no point an examination takes place before the reasons are reduced to writing? Minister. They did not centrally review the matters with respect to those details prior to this case. They do now. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that answer. The the other part, of course, was – oh, I see. So you've also got no uh, – as I understand and I didn't want to put words in uh, the department's mouth – but there's also no record as to whether the reasons were reduced to writing prior to the examination, or can you uh, say that the ACC can confidently say that every one of the examinations that took place by an examiner, the reasons were already written down? So that they were there for the usual, I guess, uh, challenges based on the reasons themselves, subject to, of course, the, the matters being uh, 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 the matters being uh, argued or uh, brought uh, before a court uh, in respect of some matter about the reasons themselves. Minister, that the ACC is reviewing that with respect to ascertain exactly what has been the historical disposition in context of that, uh, obviously initiated by the case. The reason I also, uh, thank you, Chair. The reason I also put that on the record is so that the ACC uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee can uh, take that and also examine that with the ACC at some point so that uh, these issues uh, are at least ventilated more clearly and that uh, if there is remedial action that needs to be taken, that it can be taken effectively to ensure. And I didn't want to second guess what that outcome might be, nor what the current situation is. So I put that in a frame that uh, asks the question rather than make an allegation in respect of these issues. The other matter, of course, I think it's important to uh, highlight, of course, is this: this uh, amendment doesn't affect the. Uh, perhaps I can put it uh, in the in a question format as, as the minister doesn't affect Sankey uh, and Whitlam in the sense that the challenge that could be mounted that goes to whether or not reasons, written reasons are made available uh, is still a, a large issue. In other words, it doesn't put it beyond the challenge of parties to then seek to argue that 
the reasons should be made available to the parties and tested in some way against the public interest. Yeah. Chair, whilst the Minister is taking advice on that, I can go to uh, the particular matter in more detail where in Alistair uh, against uh, the Queen, it was a High Court case uh, that then went to the general principle, of course. The general rule is that a court will not order the production of a document, although relevant and otherwise admissible, if it would be injurious to the public interest to disclose it. However, the, the uh, Public interest has two aspects which may conflict. These were described by Lord Reid in Conway and Rimmer as follows. There is the public interest that harm shall not be done to the nation or the public service by disclosure of certain documents. And there is a public interest that the administration of justice shall not be frustrated by withholding of documents which must be produced if justice um, is to be done." End of quote. In short, this does not put beyond challenge those issues that someone may want to ventilate in respect of uh, the written reasons that are provided. And of course, it's still uh, open for the, for the uh, government to argue uh, public interest immunity and all those other matters, but it's about ensuring that this only deals with the technical matter. The, the um, amendment at the end, subpara, sub, sorry, subsection 8, which sets out that a failure to comply with any of the provisions does not affect the validity of the summons answers the question. Um, it is still open for a defendant or prospective defendant, as the case may be, to raise the threshold issue and explore the reasons, but a failure to comply with the provisions of 1A now, sorry, after the passing of the bill, will not render the summons ineffective um, or, or invalid, in other words vitiated, by that failure. So that the provisions wherein a person is entitled to explore the legal veracity of the various instruments is there, but a failure to comply in this instance will not invalidate the summons. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion, uh, Senator Ludwig. So, as I understand, it, the right still exists. This is simply a matter that goes not to the substance of the written reasons, but to uh, the issue of not invalidating the uh, provision because they're not written. Minister, it doesn't limit what a defendant can try and get hold of. But if there's no compliance, the summons are still valid. Thank you, Minister. I think that's uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. I think that's helpful in this debate to to ensure that uh, those sorts of matters are clear, that uh, we're not intruding in respect of that argument that was raised in Sankey and Williams, and uh, in that the public interest still remains. Uh, as as a balance between that which might be available, that which might not be available to. Uh, these types of matters, and that it is narrowly cast, that is, this amendment, to fix uh, what has been quite a long uh, uh, issue. And that uh, the question, I guess, also raises itself, which should be asked, is when was this first, uh, when did it first come to light? And when did the ACC, that is, the Australian Crime Commission, advise the Minister of the, uh, the issue? So it obviously came to light when the magistrate refused to strike out the um, subpoena, the subpoena for the reasons, and so you'll note that a prerogative writ was employed, was issued to the single judge of the Victorian Court of Appeal alleging error on the face of the record with respect to the adjudication by his worship. Now maybe his honour. I don't know whether they've changed that. Um, but, the, but the point is the amendment is narrowly cast. It is a technical amendment 
and indeed, as some senators have commented in the second reading speeches, it is not the broad as they have anticipated with great respect to them. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill 2007 and has agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Mr. Ranking Deputy President. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. That, the question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. And Mr. Clark. Act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day Quarantine Commission of Inquiry Bill 2007, uh, second reading, adjourned debate. Uh, I think I sent a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I, I was going to speak on the third reading in the last one, but I will speak on the quarantine uh, amendment bill. It is a matter that, uh, in terms of Queensland, it does have a devastating effect. The uh, breakdown of what appears to be a breakdown in quarantine, uh, such as uh, has been placed in the press and articulated at large, uh, does affect not only the racing industry, Per se, but it also affects quite uh, broader interest groups and stakeholders in the area. It affects those who go to not only the races themselves and who might place a bet every now and then, but also the riding schools, right through the community to those people that attend riding schools, to the strappers, the trainers, uh, those who have stud farms. All of those areas are uh, adversely affected. And of course, when you go back uh, to this uh, issue itself, the AQUIS really come from the NAN report itself, where, uh, in terms of the breakdown in uh, our border security, those issues were ventilated at that time and are uh, important to ensure that they do, uh, do ensure that we do have uh, integrity to our border. It is important to maintain uh, our borders to ensure that these breaches don't occur. And it's particularly uh, encouraging to see that the government has moved to provide a, an inquiry. That inquiry, of course, should ensure and should be wide-ranging enough to ensure that the, all the matters that are brought forward by people can be clearly articulated during the inquiry and properly examined. The area itself, uh, of course, has many stakeholders, and it's incumbent upon the government to ensure that those stakeholders do get access, ability to put their submissions uh, forward. They do get the ability to be able to uh, articulate their concerns. It's important that the system has integrity to ensure that the outcomes are also uh, respected. And what the government uh, also uh, should also uh, take on board is the, uh, any findings, recommendations that are made by uh, the inquiry are also uh, committed and also provided with sufficient um, support and encouragement so that the industry can examine those. Because what this industry does seem to be characterised by, especially when you have a look at the NAN report itself, that there has been a series of breaches of quarantine over the last couple of years. Now, whether or not the uh, department keeps statistics on these, keeps a frequency graph to ensure that it manages its border protection well, those sorts of issues should also be ventilated to ensure that the industry uh, does uh, get, gain a valuable insight into the operation of AQUIS and how it maintains its borders. But having said that, I will uh, hold my uh, contribution at that point. I see that the Shadow Minister has turned up to provide a contribution to the debate. Uh, well, Senator O'Brien. 
Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I know you have a, uh, a strong, indeed, a vested interest in uh, the issue of uh, equine issues, as uh, a, a keen rider, or at least uh, having been so in the past. I'm not sure of the current status of your um, equestrian um, uh, pursuits, but uh, I think the uh, uh, reality is that this. Uh, uh, is an issue which pertains to anyone with an interest in the breed of horse, breed, various breeds of horses that uh, are uh, within the equine population in Australia, as well as some other animals that are affected by this disease. Can I say that, uh, so far as the opposition is concerned, uh, we uh, um, have long been of the view that Australia needed a rigorous uh, and uh, secure quarantine system and that our effective island status equipped us to resist the introduction of a great many diseases, including the equine influenza disease, a disease that exists in horse populations in every other uh, significant country around the world where such populations exist with, until recently, the exception of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, a disease which has caused uh, havoc in countries in which outbreaks have occurred, uh, closing down racing industries, significantly affecting breeding industries, limiting the movement of horses and occasioning significant expense because of the need where the disease uh, widely penetrates the equine population in a country for the introduction of vaccines at cost and also uh, vaccines which mask the presence of the disease and make it more difficult to ultimately detect and therefore control in terms of its spread. So we were uh, uh, free of the disease for quite some time, a disease which has uh, uh, caused significant problems to racing in industries in uh, South Africa. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, Japan, uh, United States, uh, as well as uh, United Kingdom and France. The situation that uh, we found ourselves in uh, from about the 24th of August this year was uh, one which I think shocked uh, the Australia, Australia's racing and breeding industry, in, uh, racing in terms of uh, thoroughbreds and standard breeds, certainly, and breeding industry insofar as the thoroughbred industry is concerned because of the significant impact. We saw the uh, introduction of a disease, and whilst it hasn't been absolutely proven, uh, the, uh, uh, there have been a variety of comments which I think allow me to say that the overwhelming probability is the, the, the disease was introduced with stallions uh, flown into Australia probably on the 8th of August uh, this year, uh, those horses having uh, spent some time in Japan. Uh, Japan experienced an outbreak of equine influenza, uh, first noticed I think in Japan around the 14th of uh, August, uh, which means that uh, it was present before that time, before it uh, came to be noticed and the horses that came from Japan arrived here on the 8th of August, so there was a significant overlap. But one would have thought, uh, having uh, horses come from a country where a disease outbreak had occurred, that we would have uh, uh, barrier arrangements and quarantine arrangements in place which would have prevented the disease from escape, escaping from quarantine. As I understand it, those horses arrived from Japan uh, in a box or crate-like uh, um, uh, environment, lifted off the aircraft and walked from the, uh, the crate uh, or box, depending on how you would describe it, into a, a, a float and uh, moved from Mascot Airport, uh, some horses to Eastern Creek in Western Sydney and some horses to Spotswood in Victoria. And the, it was the Eastern Creek horses that uh, it turned out were carrying the disease, apparently. The, uh, the, there is a possibility that uh, the disease uh, 
found its way onto the uh, truck uh, which carried the horses from the airport uh, and uh, that it wasn't properly cleaned when it, uh, the horses were disembarked at Eastern Creek and the, the disease was spread that way, but much more likely, given other material that's in the public domain, uh, that the disease spread from Eastern Creek. Uh, and I'll come to uh, uh, my reasons for saying that shortly. This would have to be the worst incident of a breakdown of Australia's quarantine in a living memory. Uh, this disease has an impact on uh, equine industries uh, which can only be measured in millions of dollars, in thousands of jobs, in lost opportunities. And let me extrapolate a couple of those propositions. The disease is uh, now uh, extensively into the Hunter Valley. Uh, the Hunter Valley is the home of the, a number of thoroughbred studs. The, those thoroughbred studs house the most uh, expensive stallions in this country in terms of their uh, service fees. Uh, and ha within that region, of course, are the uh, young horses from the previous crop and, of course, mares who are expecting to fall down and conceive uh, during the, the uh, current season. Uh, the disease may mean that the Hunter Valley is isolated for a period of, period of months, and depending on how long that goes, that might mean that the uh, yearlings in the Hunter Valley will not be able to be sent for sale at the yearling sales coming up early next year. The impact of that will be enormous, let alone the impact on racing carnivals, uh, the, the impact on the horses, that are, the, the stallions that are detained in Eastern Creek uh, Quarantine Centre, uh, one of which uh, has a stud fee of $225,000 a service and I'm told would expect to, as they put it, cover 50 or more mares a month uh, whilst in uh, uh, in service from the beginning of September, so uh, it doesn't take much to work out that there are millions of dollars uh, lost to the owners of that animal alone, let alone any others. So uh, how did uh, this co uh, come to pass? Well, we're not sure, and of course we, uh, the Labor Party, was um, first in calling for a judicial inquiry into this matter. What uh, the minister said. Uh, in relation to this matter was uh, when the outbreak was known in Japan uh, on the 19th of August. He said Australia will not take any risks with horses being imported from countries where equine influenza is present. And on the 24th of August he said it is likely that the infections originated from another country in quarantine, for another horse I should say in quarantine, that has contacted the disease but has not shown any clinical signs of it. While it's too early to be certain, we suspect that this, this to be one of the horses from Japan, given there has been an outbreak of EI in that country. On the 27th of August, the minister said, because there'd been an outbreak at Maitland, the Maitland event may be the source of the domestic outbreak. On the 28th of August, the minister then said, well, we still cannot track the actual source of the infection and therefore blame or liability cannot be assigned. We just don't know. There has been no breach of the impenetrable quarantine barriers at Eastern Creek. Our focus has shifted to Maitland, where a couple of hundred horses passed through and have passed it on to other horses. Now, um, on the 28th of August, the minister then said, you would assume uh, that it, uh, uh, he was talking about whether it had come from overseas, you would assume that because we've never had it in Australia before, but it might have been dormant and come to the surface it's just too early to say. A remarkable contribution. And on the 31st of August, uh, he said, we want to identify what went wrong so it can never happen again and so we can repair the breach. It's going to be human error. There's no question. But uh, were the quarantine procedures adequate? Uh, the minister has bounced around all over the place between the 19th of August and the 31st of August in relation to whether the disease came from overseas, whether it got into Eastern Creek, whether it came out, whether it originated magically out of nowhere at Maitland. Uh, a remarkable set of contributions, all in the context of an industry facing a dramatic circumstance, millions of dollars in losses and discussion about in what was inevitable and that is the possibility that there will be a massive legal case taken against the Commonwealth because of a breakdown of the Commonwealth's quarantine arrangements in this country. And something that's been uh, little noted in the public commentary about this was um, 
published by AAP on the 30th of August. And it's not sourced to an individual, it's sourced to an unnamed person, but I think it's a very interesting quote to read and I propose to put it into Hansard. Uh, the story reads, it's AAP 30th of August, quarantine procedures at the federal government's Eastern Creek facility in Sydney have been regularly breached according to a stallion groom formerly employed by a leading US stud. The groom who declined to be named told AAP today he and other grooms from overseas shuttle stallions were allowed to come and go from Eastern Creek without using strict biosecurity and quarantine what measures while caring for their horses at the facility in 2001 and 2003. The groom was employed by a leading Kentucky stud and was in charge of seven stallions during his first trip in 2001 and four stallions in 2003. The groom revealed he and other stallion grooms were allowed to leave Eastern Creek on numerous occasions without changing clothes or scrubbing down uh, to attend race meetings, play golf and to eat and drink at local hotels and restaurants. The Eastern Creek Centre is one of the possible sources of Australia's first equine influenza outbreak, which has shut down racing in Queensland and New South Wales. Later on uh, in the article, it, he goes on and says, um, the groom was required to stay at Eastern Creek by his employers, but conditions for the stallions and their handlers at the time were so bad, he and others frequently left the quarantine centre. And this is a quote, I unloaded the horses from a national transport truck into the facility and was supposed to stay there with the horses all the time, the groom said. But the conditions for the horses were only just acceptable. If they were my stallions, I wouldn't be taking them there. They didn't wash out trucks after horses were unloaded and drivers used to help unload horses and then drove off after they were in contact with the horses. There was no scrubbing down, not once. I was there for two weeks each time and I never saw a footpath which you are supposed to use all the time. The groom said walking out of Eastern Creek was easy and he did it often to eat at a local pub. We had to let them know that when we were going out, but no one enforced any of the quarantine protocols, he said. They knew what was happening, but we were free to do what we liked. I even went to the races at Randwick with five other grooms and played golf on a few occasions without scrubbing down. A well-known breeding stud had a big marquee at Randwick one day and I was invited and went along. I mean, this is remarkable that a person who was in a quarantine facility with horses coming from a country that might be carrying diseases, who can come and go without any quarantine procedures, not only that, go to the local pub, go to the races, attend marquees conducted by uh, people running studs in other parts of the country, the potential for disease spread was enormous. Now, that's one of the reasons we need a thorough and rigorous examination of this matter. Who was in charge of quarantine facilities if these were the circumstances that existed? The minister last week was asked a question in the House of Representatives. It was to the effect that in the last two weeks, procedures were tightened at Eastern Creek and grooms or handlers were uh, required before they left to go to the local pub for lunch, to change and shower both coming in and going out, and that that was a new procedure that hadn't previously applied, although there had been regular visits from the quarantine facility by uh, those handlers to the local pub. There has not yet been an answer to that question. And I think we're entitled to draw the conclusion that if the minister can't rule that out, that, that that is exactly what has happened, that there has been a circumstance at Eastern Creek where the arrangements and the rules and the regulations and the requirements of staff, of sorry, not of staff, probably of contractors there, have not been that which was appropriate to the circumstances of a quarantine facility. And in the circumstances where horses were introduced from a country where a, a disease as infectious as equine influenza came into the facility, if that was a circumstance, if the, if the arrangements that were described by that uh, unnamed person in that AAP story 
are an accurate reflection of what has been going on. It, the only thing that is remarkable is that we haven't had a disease outbreak from that facility in relation to horses earlier. There may be other aspects of the operation of that facility and other animals or other plants that are kept there that have, uh, uh, have not been securely kept and we may have other problems which we don't yet know about or have not been sourced to that environment. But we now have a circumstance where, as I said earlier, it is almost certain that uh, a disease has been introduced into this country and in all likelihood by procedures which have not been appropriate or rigorous enough to meet the, the requirements of a modern, world's best practice quarantine facility. So we called for a judicial inquiry uh, very early in the piece, I think on the 24th of August, shortly after it was known that the outbreak occurred. Uh, it was very clear to me and to other members of the opposition that the consequences of, of this outbreak, if it spread, would be enormous. And unfortunately, uh, that has been the case, and we do not wish that upon the industry. What we need to do now is have an inquiry conducted which is rigorous, which examines all of the matters which are relevant to the protocols and procedures which existed, to the rules which applied to the uh, importation of horses, to any decisions which have been taken uh, from a ministerial level to a managerial level and down, to assess the impact of those decisions on the practices, procedures and protocols that apply to facilities such as this and determine their impact on the circumstances we find ourselves in now and the circumstances, of course, which these industries find themselves in now. So we support the concept of a judicial inquiry, a judicial inquiry with all of the powers of a royal commission, because that's what we are told this legislation creates, that is the taking of the royal commission powers from Royal Commission legislation and in introducing them to the quarantine legislation, with one exception, which we understand, which is to do, to do with powers of search, because those powers already exist in the quarantine legislation. We support those measures. We believe there should be a rigorous, thorough, open, uh, transparent public inquiry. There should be the opportunity for interested parties to present evidence and to cross-examine witnesses. We believe that the relevant ministers should be prepared to and give evidence at such an inquiry and should be available for cross-examination. And certainly, so far as we're aware, the two relevant ministers are Minister Truss, who was the relevant minister going back to 2003-2004, when correspondence from the Australian Racing Board suggested there were problems with the quarantine arrangements, and those problems could well lead to the introduction of equine influenza, quite prophetic predictions by the Australian Racing Board and the current minister, Minister McGoran, who was presiding over the regime in which uh, the outbreak actually occurred, and to understand the role that the minister played or any, uh, any uh, deficiencies in the role that the minister played in relation to the disease. We do say that the terms of reference uh, uh, contained in the legislation are not adequate, and we'll be dealing with that uh, uh, proposition in the committee stage of this legislation. We think that it is uh, uh, appropriate that those uh, terms of reference be binding and not be optional to the minister as the current legislation provides, because although the legislation lays down three uh, so-called terms of reference, it allows the minister to um, allocate all or any of those terms to the commissioner, Mr Callanan, to deal with the matter. We don't think that's appropriate. And the other matter we'll be addressing in the committee stage is the issue of the publication of Mr Callanan's report. We do not accept that that should only be the province of the minister. Uh, we think that the legislation is deficient. It should require the tabling in the parliament of that report, and we will be moving an amendment to that effect as well. Uh, I intend to have more to say in the committee stage of this legislation. Thank you, Senator. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I too rise this evening to support this uh, Commission of Inquiry Bill uh, quarantine amendment in order that there be an appropriate investigation 
into this outbreak of equine influenza in Australia. It was interesting when uh, this was first reported, uh, having spent uh, the last few years uh, in this place on the uh, Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee looking at issues of quarantine, uh, that was, uh, I was immediately conscious of the fact that if this had come from a quarantine centre, it was a major, a major breach of Australian quarantine uh, protocols and regulations. And it's just another reminder of how vulnerable Australia is to uh, the outbreak of disease and how important for us to maintain disease-free status in just as many areas as we possibly can. And so I welcome the fact that uh, the government has decided to have uh, an inquiry which is effectively a royal commission in as much as it has all the powers of the royal commission, but it's been uh, set up under the Quarantine Act because it will allow for the additional powers that the Quarantine Act also affords investigating authorities. So I am hopeful that uh, this inquiry uh, under um, Justice Callanan will get to the bottom of how equine influenza got to Australia and then how it got from the quarantine centre into the broader population. And I certainly concur with remarks to date on the massive impact it has had in uh, the Australian community and the rural community in particular. Not only is it an economic impact, but you only have to listen to the stories of people involved in eventing, for example, people involved in getting their horses ready for the Olympics and the, uh, the heartbreak that's gone on with people who um, innocently have been caught up in the disaster that has been equine influenza, and that, of course, is not to mention then those people who have huge investments in the racing industry. And whilst the government has moved to offer some um, income uh, relief or income compensation, you can never compensate people adequately for the loss of opportunity. Uh, and of course, racing is a, uh, a gaming industry as well, and you can never compensate people for the fact that they may have uh, had their animals in preparation for a certain race at a certain time, that, that, that opportunity will not come again. It will present in different ways, but not under the same sort of circumstances. So there are a lot of people around Australia who, who are in, uh, in, I'd classify in the amateur field around horses who have been devastated by this in the same way as those who are involved in a professional capacity. And of course, in rural communities, there's been a significant impact as well. My initial response to this was to be quite mystified as to how horses um, that had arrived in Australia on the 8th of August could have been carrying the disease when the protocol, as it's set down, means that those horses had to have been in quarantine in Japan for four weeks before they left Japan and started their journey to Australia. Now, assuming that their journey to Australia was 24 to 48 hours maximum. They'd been in Japanese quarantine for four weeks, and so I'm glad to say that this inquiry is also going to enable uh, an investigation into the um, appropriateness of protocols at the Japanese end. And of course, with the way horse racing is these days and the breeding industry, you have horses in Eastern Creek and probably in Japan have also come from the United States and Ireland, just as two examples. And they're going to be um, going uh, in order for the breeding industry in, J in Japan and then on to Australia and back and so on. It just is very indicative of how um, difficult it is to try to uh, contain a disease of this kind once it uh, begins. And in the Japanese end, I'm particularly keen that there be an investigation of um, the appropriateness of the time response, because certainly when I had a look on the internet to see when this was first reported in Japan, it, uh, I found that the Japanese Racing Authority had had a press conference on the 16th of August uh, um, saying that 20 thoroughbreds in Japan were infected with equine flu. And at that press conference, they admitted that the day before, August the 15th, 200 vets had been dispatched across Japan to look at uh, various racing facilities, presumably quarantine facilities as well. And yet the Japanese government did not officially um, announce 
the disease or report the disease until the 24th or 25th of August, some considerable time after, at least 10 days after, vets had been dispatched in Japan because there was a suspicion of the disease. So we've got to ask ourselves, um, do Australian authorities wait to be officially informed when the internet will tell you that the racing authorities in the home country have had a press conference and told the whole country there that they have got this disease and that there's a lockdown and cancellation of races and the uh, Kanazawa racetrack uh, didn't hold its races the weekend after that because of the uh, symptoms of disease in horses in Japan. Now, all international trade depends on countries being timely in their notification of globally notifiable infectious diseases, and they also rely on timely and authoritative and accurate certification when they give export or import permits. Australia relies on that system globally. Every other country does as well. In this case, um, the, the Australian Embassy, of course, would be reporting back, one would hope, to the Australian government on a daily basis and uh, that uh, of anything that is reported in the Japanese press and any other press around the world where we've got an embassy on issues that may well affect Australian trade or Australian interests. And clearly there would have been a, a, an awareness, um, you would have thought, once that press conference was held, that that was the situation in Japan. And if those horses had been in quarantine for four weeks before that in Japan, we should have been able to make some calls to the Japanese government fairly quickly to establish where those quarantined horses had come from and whether any of the horses stabled there had in fact already come down with the disease. I think that um, this is not to excuse the fact that this disease has escaped from Eastern Creek. We all know that is the case and there's been a breakdown of quarantine at the Australian end. But I think we have to also look at the protocols um, with which we, uh, under which we agree to the import and, uh, import and export permits of live animals around the world to make sure that uh, in a timely way we have earlier notification, immediate notification. At the minute there is a suspicion of uh, a notifiable disease, not just at the point at which finally it is officially confirmed some 10 days after a domestic announcement that isn't good enough and it's not fair to the international community. And uh, one would wonder in terms of the breeding industry whether there will be another move now to uh, to move for uh, artificial insemination in terms of the thoroughbred industry. Um, I know it's a contentious thing to say, very contentious thing to say, but realistically we are dealing with very valuable animals being moving around the world and I think when people assess the losses to the breeding industry because of this outbreak and the likelihood of this continuing that um, people may have to reconsider a definition of what constitutes a thoroughbred horse. So that'll be a debate for another day. And uh, I'm aware of the smiles in the chamber about uh, opening a Pandora's box, and I know that is the case. But you know, if you own a valuable stallion like uh, like those that are being transferred around the world, you'd have to um, be asking yourself at the moment about the risks associated with um, the international movement of animals in this way. But anyway, I don't wish to delay the House further except to say that I support the establishment of the inquiry. I am uh, hopeful that it will be as comprehensive uh, as is required to get to the bottom of how the disease uh, was uh, spread and uh, looking at the existing protocols and the uh, rules which govern the uh, movement and control of the quarantine facilities uh, in Australia. But as with uh, a comment made by Senator O'Brien, I do not believe it is appropriate that um, the report, when it is finally completed, um, simply goes to the minister. I think it is essential that it be uh, tabled in each House of Parliament so that the community can read the report in full and therefore be in a, in a better position to um, both assess the government's reaction and, I would suggest, assist the government 
in coming up with improvements to the protocols to make sure that this doesn't happen again and that we have a better process in place. And I think it's in the government's interests as well to engage in an open and transparent partnership with the community, who, um, particularly the uh, horse racing and breeding community, um, and to be involved in such a response once we get a full analysis um, of what is actually an investigation and analysis of what has occurred. And so I too have an amendment asking that not a, that once the report goes to the minister, it be tabled in the parliament within 14 days of receipt of the report. So I look forward to uh, hearing what uh, Justice Callanan finds out in the course of this inquiry and hopefully to seeing some amendments over time to improve the protocols internationally and domestically to try to maintain Australia's disease-free status. Thank you, Senator. The question is, Minister. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye, can't say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. For an act to amend the Quarantine Act 1908 and for other purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? Sorry. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Being no objection, so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, um, um, Madam Acting Chair. The, um, oh. We have a short running sheet. That's probably the order I was thinking that the uh, amendments would be taken in. But before we come to the amendments, what um, I wanted to do was to ask the uh, uh, ask the minister to respond uh, to the question that I referred to earlier as having been asked of the minister and to which he has not responded, and that is, have there been tightenings of arrangements for staff, sorry, for um, handlers coming and going from the Eastern Creek facility? particularly to the local pub since uh, the outbreak of equine influenza. Perhaps we'll wait for the, uh, the, the other minister from the bench. Perhaps I'll continue by asking again, and, and that is that during the course of my contribution I referred to uh, a circumstance that uh, was raised with the minister earlier and to which he's not replied, and that is that uh, there have been um, arrangements uh, applying to handlers of the horses at Eastern Creek uh, where they were previously um, entering and leaving the or leaving and re-entering the facility for the purposes of going to lunch at the local pub without any appropriate quarantine arrangements, and those arrangements have been tightened since the outbreak to the extent that uh, uh, those handlers are required to change, shower and change both on exiting and on re-entering the quarantine facility at Eastern Creek. Uh, and uh, I would appreciate if uh, uh, the minister could uh, uh, respond to that question uh, as an initial matter in relation to the committee stage of this uh, bill. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. The uh, advice I have is that no specific changes have been made, but of course uh, vigilance is always a vital in this area, and uh, it would be uh, undoubted that. Uh, given the uh, circumstances we face, that uh, vigilance and uh, protocols, etc., that uh, are in place would be uh, being uh, followed uh, 
very uh, strenuously, but at this stage my advice is that no, that no specific changes were made other than additional security and quarantine measures have been put in place at quarantine stations. These measures include requirements for all persons entering the horse quarantine area to undertake disinfection of footwear with VIRCON, that's V I R K O N, shower on arrival at the station, shower when leaving, and wear aqueous supplied protective clothing at all times while in the station. Senator O'Brien. So, do I take it that those measures did not apply prior to this outbreak? Minister. Uh, the, the advice is that the, these were uh, changes uh, since the 24th of August, and uh, as I read it, that would be uh, the ad additional uh, security and uh, quarantine measures uh, that were uh, implemented as a result uh, of this uh, particular outbreak. Now, the extent to which those um, practices were undertaken before the 24th of August. I am uh, not sure and whether that was actually part of the protocol, but whether things may have been somewhat more lax prior to the 24th of August. I am unable uh, to assist in that uh, regard. Senator O'Brien. Thanks. Is the uh, minister aware of the article um, contained and issued by AAP uh, on the 30th of August that I referred to in my second reading contribution. That is um, the former groom who says he uh, carried out work in the facility in 2001 and 2003 um, who revealed that he and other stallion grooms were allowed to leave Eastern Creek on numerous occasions without changing clothes or scrubbing down to attend race meetings, play golf and eat and drink at local hotels and restaurants, uh, to uh, uh, attend race tracks, to attend uh, um, pavilions uh, run by thoroughbred studs, um, and the allegations about trucks leaving after unloading horses without washing down. Uh, is the uh, minister or uh, the department aware of those allegations and what do they say as to them? Minister. Uh, thank you. We, I'm personally not aware of uh, the uh, article, but the department is. And uh, what I would say in relation to uh, those particular allegations and indeed all other allegations that uh, people might have, we as a government treat those allegations very seriously, and that is why. Uh, we have this particular legislation before us this evening because we want the Callanan inquiry to get underway ASAP and uh, as soon as it does get underway people like this particular groom will be able to provide evidence to the inquiry and uh, the veracity and uh, details of those sort of allegations uh, can be tested and I of course would encourage anybody with such a uh, stories with such concerns uh, to uh, come forward and uh, provide evidence uh, to Mr Callanan's inquiry so that we can get uh, a full picture and uh, we then of course uh, as a government would look forward to the uh, advice and suggestions uh, of the inquiry as to uh, what changes uh, ought to be made. Senator O'Brien. Thank you. Minister, uh, we're uh a former contractor such as this uh, person to come forward and reveal breaches in the quarantine arrangements at Eastern Creek. What, the, what uh, are the personal consequences for such a potential witness and are there any potential um, penalties which might apply to a person who revealed deficiencies in the system in which they participated? And if that is the case, are they barriers to uh, getting all of the necessary evidence that we might obtain 
in the conduct of such a thorough, rigorous and transparent inquiry. Uh, thank you. Witnesses at the Commission of Inquiry will have the same protection as witnesses before a Royal Commission. The Royal Commission's Act protections are based on the immunity provided to justices presiding and witnesses and legal representatives appearing before the High Court of Australia. In terms of witnesses, one of the main protections provided is in relation to defamation. The protection extended to High Court justices is based under the general law rather than legislation and, basically speaking, protects them from civil liability in relation to anything they say or do in their judicial capacity. Having read that, I must say I don't think that is necessarily responsive to a Senator O'Brien. This is always uh, one of the difficult areas, and if I understand Senator O'Brien's uh, question uh, correctly, it's really a question uh, of uh, a witness potentially self-incriminating, and uh, how, how does one uh, protect uh, uh, those people? That is always a uh, difficult situation, and uh, the Royal Commission does have the power of subpoena, so if information is uh, provided, witnesses uh, can be subpoenaed and uh, required to uh, give evidence. Whether people have particular evidence that they are reluctant to give uh, in circumstances where they might self-incriminate, uh, undoubtedly they would need to seek legal advice and uh, approach the uh, Commission uh, as to the appropriate way to uh, handle that. I'm not sure as to what the exact uh, procedure would be, but uh, Hopefully one of the advisers might be able to assist at a later stage in relation to that, which, if I might say, is a very fair question being asked by Senator O'Brien. Senator O'Brien. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Chair. I appreciate uh, uh, the uh, um, undertaking to try and find out, and just uh, so that I can be clear that where I'm coming from, uh, I'm, I am concerned that there may be uh, there may have been um, procedures more observed in the breach or protocols more observed in the breach by particularly contractors who have from time to time attended uh, and worked at the facility as handlers for particular imported uh, horses, probably thoroughbred stallions. That seems to be the most valuable uh, commodity that, that uh, uh, in the context of uh, this inquiry that uh, would require um, handlers to attend. Um, and I. I really do think that if there is a barrier to those individuals coming forward and giving their evidence that uh, we need to understand how those barriers might be overcome uh, if uh, uh, that were to prejudice the obtaining of evidence which would indicate what the culture was, particularly at Eastern Creek, during all relevant times, uh, let's, let's say since, since the Olympics, which I think is when the last occasion that there's been a major change in horse importation protocols, 
and Minister, you'll be aware, I think you in question time were under the misapprehension that I was talking about uh, uh, foot and mouth disease uh, concerns that were raised. They were raised in relation to thoroughbreds back in 2000 uh, or uh, before 2000 in relation to horses being imported for the uh, equestrian aspects of the Olympics and there was a debate as to whether uh, horses could carry foot and mouth. There having been uh, considerations about foot and mouth coming from Europe in particular but also other parts of the world where uh, foot and mouth disease was endemic. But of course uh, change protocols and the more uh, um, frequent uh, importation of horses, both breeding and racing horses, um, uh, is a circumstance which would have exerted some pressure on our import protocols. And of course it's very important that any inquiry looks at uh, um, the development of those protocols, probably maybe from before the Olympics, but certainly from that time. So whilst th that other matter is being considered, I wonder if uh, the Minister can advise us whether the terms of reference in the legislation uh, require the, uh, 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 Mr Callanan to have regard to matters uh, which go to the protocols that underpin the, uh, the uh, um, rules that uh, apply to the importation of, um, well, let's say horses. I think there are other animals that are affected by the same protocols, but let's say horses for the sake of the debate. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of the, those terms of reference, uh, is the minister able to assure the Senate that there is no impediment in those terms, as they are contained in the bill, which would prevent Mr Callanan from taking evidence as to the uh, history of the protocols and the involvement of ministers in the development of policy underpinning those protocols? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. In relation to the letter that was referred to, we may have been at cross purposes. I was referring to one letter and clearly uh, Senator O'Brien was referring to another in relation to the exchange at uh, question time a few days ago. In relation to uh, the powers that the Royal Commissioner <coughs> may have, um, <coughs> generally I can indicate to the Senate that uh, Mr Callanan has indicated that uh, in the event that he thinks the powers are not broad <coughs> enough, he would, be, uh, would not be constrained in any way, shape or form in approaching the minister to extend the powers, and the minister has indicated that uh, he would be uh, willing to grant that. But in relation to the uh, specific matter, if I can refer the honourable senator's attention to uh, 66AY1A, Roman numeral 3, which uh, would read, conduct a commission of inquiry into matters specified in the instrument of appointment relating to all or any of the following, then the outbreak of equine influenza, quarantine requirements and practices relating to the outbreak, which seems quite specific to the matter raised by Senator O'Brien. But in any event, we have any matters incidental to the matters referred to in subparagraphs 1 and 2, and then report to the minister. So I think the terms of reference are both specific in relation to the particular issue raised by Senator O'Brien, but also very wide and broad in as much as the Commissioner is given power to uh, uh, inquire into matters incidental to uh, those uh, first two paragraphs. Senator O'Brien. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Chair. Can the Minister explain why, uh, in the preamble in uh, 66AY1, uh, the Minister uh, um, is able to authorise the, in this case, Mr Callanan, to inquire into all or any of those matters that he referred to. What's the relevance, which is effectively a discretion to the minister to decide after this, uh, the parliament uh, 
um, um, purports to set the terms of reference that the minister might constrain it to something less than the uh, provisions in the bill. What's the purpose of that provision? Minister. Yeah. 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 Is, uh, I understand it. It's a common uh, legal phraseology to uh, cover the field, to uh, allow all or any matter to be uh, inquired into. And what the legislation says, the minister may, in writing, appoint a person to com to conduct a commission of inquiry into matters specified in the instrument of appointment relating to all or any of the following, and then we have the uh, terms of reference, and uh, it's quite clear from uh, the minister's public statements that uh, he is very much interested in all matters being inquired into, and in the event that the terms of reference are not wide enough or broad enough, and uh, Mr Callanan is somehow constrained in his inquiry as a result of uh, some limitation in the terms of reference, uh, he has indicated he will uh, ask the minister, and the minister has indicated that he will uh, very willingly uh, broaden the terms of reference to ensure that any avenue of inquiry that Mr Callanan considers to be important can in fact be pursued. Senator O'Brien. Uh, do the terms which constrain those terms of reference that the minister uh, can establish for Mr Callanan um, omit the reference to the spread of equine influenza for any purpose, uh, uh, or should we understand the term outbreak to uh, refer to the discovery of the disease and its uh, um, occurrence in a variety of different places? And the purpose of my question is to say, well, do, do these terms constrain the inquiry to what happened at Eastern Creek, or is the uh, uh, is Mr. Callanan to be um, equipped with terms which will allow him to trace the spread of the disease upon establishment at Eastern Creek? Because well, I think we we do know, and the minister has said, and I assume he's been uh, accurate and truthful, that the disease was discovered at Eastern Creek. Uh, I think on or around the 24th. Of August or before. So, uh, the purpose of my question is to understand why there's not a reference to the spread of the disease in the terms of reference, or should we understand that the term outbreak um, takes us from the point of it first being observed to where it uh, subsequently occurred in other parts of the state of New South Wales and Queensland at this stage? The terms of reference uh, in fact refer to the outbreak of equine influenza not in Eastern Creek but in Australia, and uh, that would be uh, interpreted as referring to the outbreak uh, in Australia anywhere. But in the event that uh, somebody were to seek to argue that uh, the outbreak actually occurred in Eastern Creek and therefore the inquiry should be limited only to Eastern Creek. I dare say uh, Mr Callanan's uh, judicial mind would uh, allow him to have uh, reference to subsection 3, which uh, refers him to any matters incidental to. And uh, I think everybody would agree that, uh, as a matter of construction, uh, if somebody were to seek to say that the outbreak could only have occurred in one place, well, Clearly, a matter incidental to the initial outbreak is its spread through to other parts of Australia, and therefore uh, Mr Callanan would be uh, clothed with full authority on the current construction of the terms of reference to make the sort of inquiry that Senator O'Brien refers to. But you know, once again, having said that, in the event that some argument is to be brought forward or sought to be maintained to restrict Mr Callanan's inquiry, then uh, we do have the assurances of both Mr Callanan and Minister McGoran that I've referred to previously, which uh, indicate they would both pursue uh, as broad a reference as possible to ensure that uh, 
all matters are appropriately inquired into. Senator O'Brien. Um, I wonder if uh, the minister has an answer to my first question, um, so I'll raise that now. And uh, whilst I'm on my feet, uh, 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 raise the uh, another issue that uh, arises, and that is uh, in the conduct of the commission, as I understand it, uh, um, the existing powers in quarantine under quarantine legislation uh, with regard to uh, uh, search have been retained rather than those from the Royal Commission power. And indeed, as I understand it, inquiries are being conducted by officers of uh, um, the department or AQUIS or both um, uh, into the circumstances around the uh, um, the outbreak or outbreak and spread, depending on your preference for how it should be expressed, and those um, uh, officers uh, will be uh, uh, there, those officers' inquiries will be able to be included in the evidence. For Mr. Callanan's inquiry, without any other special provision, if this legislation is passed, uh, is the um, legislation sufficient to allow Mr Callanan to conduct separate and in, in, uh, independent inquiries, that is, independent of officers of the department, uh, AQUIS, um, etc., uh, to um, perhaps be certain that uh, the, uh, the evidence is uh, being pursued without fear or favour in relation to what might have been a performance or lack of it by um, departmental officers or the agency or whatever. So, Minister. In, in relation to the latter, uh, and we're still getting some information in relation to the uh, first matter, can I indicate that uh, there have been some questions as to why this has not been uh, dealt with uh, completely under the Royal Commissions Act? And uh, the, the reason it will. The aspects of the Royal Commission uh, legislation which will apply will provide all powers and protections necessary to conduct the inquiry, and so Mr Callanan will have power to hold public hearings and compel the production of witnesses. However, it's also important for a range of existing powers in the Quarantine Act to be accessible to the inquiry, and right on point, uh, if I understand Senator O'Brien's uh, question correctly, for example, there is provision for independent investigators to be empowered to utilise the quarantine search powers that were specifically created to deal with quarantine offences and that are already contained in the Quarantine Act. And so uh, Mr Callanan will be able to avail himself uh, of uh, the benefits of those independent investigators to assist the inquiry. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just um, wanted to get on the record from the Minister um, the, the nature of the terms of reference, um, when read uh, in a strictly literal sense, don't refer to uh, the matters that I raised, which is essentially what happened at the Japanese end before the horses left Japan and came to Australia. In the uh, briefing I had in relation to the bill, it was uh, explained that the terms of reference, uh, particularly in relation to uh, matters incidental to the matters referred to in uh, the first paragraphs in re relation to the outbreak and the quarantine requirements, would indeed include pre-arrival as well as post-arrival. And I do notice that um, that. Somewhere in, in the uh, in the bill, I can't find the exact place now. It says that the there can be hearings uh, either inside or outside Australia, but I just wanted to get on the record from the minister because it's not stated in the second reading speech that the uh, that this outbreak of equine influenza in Australia will not just be confined to circumstances post arrival of any horses to Eastern Creek or anywhere else and that it will allow for a full investigation of the, the whole of the uh, 
uh, of the uh, circumstances that led to it, given especially since we know that uh, the horses arrived at Eastern Creek on the 8th of August, that the, the uh, equine influenza was uh, established on the, by about the 24th, but by then the Japanese had known, as I said, as early as the 15th of August that there were horses in Japan with the disease. We know those horses were quarantined for four weeks. I think it would be important that the commissioner has the power that he needs to actually have a really good look at the circumstances before there was any transshipment as well. So I just wanted to, uh, for the minister to put on the record that those things are, those matters are capable of being investigated under the terms of reference as stated. Minister. Yes, sir, they are. I want to sound a uh, note of caution. I don't want to be too petty in this, but uh, Senator Milne referred to we know. Uh, I suppose it might be a fair assumption, a fair hunch, that until Mr Callanan actually reports, um, I don't want to be uh, trapped or seen as uh, affirming uh, any suggestion as to where it may have actually originated from, etc. So that's simply from an overabundance of caution. Having said that, the Royal Commissions Act, I think section 7 capital A and 7 capital B, deal with or clothe royal commissioners or people that are given those powers to undertake inquiries uh, overseas and outside of Australia. And so he would have those powers courtesy of the reference uh, to that legislation. And uh, I would also uh, draw Senator Milne's attention to 66AY little a Roman two quarantine requirements and practices relating to the outbreak. And as I understand it, uh, there is a quarantine protocol which requires testing in a quarantine situation in the country of origin, I think other than New Zealand, is that right? Yeah, other than New Zealand. So uh, definitely in Japan, uh, that would be a requirement and uh, therefore all the matters that Senator Milne uh, has referred to were, would uh, definitely be within the uh, purview of Mr Callanan's inquiry. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, whilst I um, take the point the minister makes in relation to stating that uh, the disease came from Japan, and I didn't actually say that, I said what, what we knew was that uh, on the 15th of August 200 vets were dispatched in Japan That's a court, uh, to look at horses there for suspicions of, uh, of influenza. That was reported in the Japanese press and on Thursday the 16th the Japanese uh, Racing Authority officials held a news conference to announce 20 thoroughbreds were infected with equine influenza. So when I say we knew, it was certainly reported in the Japanese press that there had been an outbreak there but I also take the point that it is yet to be proven that the disease outbreak at Eastern Creek originated in Japan. Senator O'Brien. Thank you. Um, another uh, question I have is the um, a matter that I have raised in my second reading contribution and in, in the committee stage, and that is uh, the uh, impact of uh, policy settings of government on the quarantine protocols, and practices and arrangements, uh, can the minister assure the Senate that the terms of reference of Mr Callanan's inquiry will be wide enough to enable Mr Callanan and indeed uh, those who seek to put submissions before the inquiry to canvas the minister's role in any policy settings, practices or procedures which are relevant to the equine influenza um, protocol, sorry, outbreak and uh, the protocol surrounding it. Minister. I would have thought that uh, the uh, clause, any matter incidental, would uh, clearly capture the uh, matters raised uh, by Senator O'Brien and uh, you know, from the uh, the government's point of view, uh, these protocols have been in place uh, for some time. Uh, whether they are good enough or not, or indeed whether they were breached, 
They are the matters that uh, we will listen uh, to uh, the Callanan inquiry uh, for uh, any assistance. But uh, look, having said that, we as a government are anxious uh, to uh, make sure that we are as well informed as possible to ensure that such a uh, breach uh, is uh, unlikely to occur again. In relation to the question that Senator O'Brien has been very patient uh, with me uh, in obtaining an answer, I now do have, it, uh, do have the advice that there is no formal protection for people who may self-incriminate in giving evidence to a royal commission. And so uh, that is a matter that undoubtedly uh, uh, the Royal Commissioner and the Council assisting would need to consider on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis as to uh, if somebody is willing to come forward and say, I've got some evidence that you may be interested in, but I uh, need some protection against self-incrimination. I think that may then be a matter for the potentially for the Director of Public Prosecutions uh, to uh, deal with. But as I understand it, there is no blanket um, uh, protection uh, against people self-incriminating, because, of course, if there were, then uh, potentially people that had done uh, 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 activities that might see them being prosecuted would uh, run in, confess all, knowing that uh, they as a result of that, they couldn't be prosecuted. So uh, it's one of those difficult situations, I agree, but uh, the advice that I have is that there's no formal protection for people who may self-incriminate. Senator O'Brien. Thanks. Well, I, that is a concern, um, and it's uh, uh, perhaps a, an issue that ought to be considered, given that uh, as I understand the circumstances, uh, and let, let's uh, go to the circumstances at Eastern Creek, we've had over a number of years, uh, particularly at the start of the thoroughbred breeding season, an influx of horses. Those horses are usually accompanied by contractors who are engaged sessionally for the period those horses are at Eastern Creek. They don't have a, uh, necessarily a, a, an ongoing connection or uh, perhaps not even any special training in relation to protocols or uh, perhaps not even an understanding of why there would need to be special protocols. Uh, and uh, I would suggest that for this inquiry to completely understand what has occurred, those individuals should uh, be uh, um, uh, able to give evidence. And I, I would regard those as the, uh, perhaps more the victims than the cause of uh, the problem because of their circumstances uh, uh, in relation to whether it be training or whatever else or just existing within a culture at the facility. So if there's no, uh, um, they have no expectation that their evidence uh, will not lead to some uh, prosecution for a breach of a rule that uh, they may or may not, may not be aware of. Uh, that's going to be an impediment to the inquiry. Is there any consideration being given to uh, equipping the Royal Commission with the power to pursue those sorts of uh, um, indemnities uh, in return for evidence? Minister. I suppose how this uh, inquiry is going to unfold will largely depend on uh, the way it is conducted, as I understand it. Mr Callanan uh, will uh, hold an initial public hearing, scope the way that he intends to uh, deal with the matter and then adjourn for a while. Uh, I also understand that uh, uh, people will be able to make submissions. I understand inquiries of this nature can also uh, take uh, evidence in uh, private. Um, I'm 
I'm not sure that that would necessarily assist in uh, certain circumstances, but uh, the uh, general rules, the general rules that apply to uh, royal commissions and people uh, self-incriminating, would apply to this inquiry as well. Senator O'Brien. Well, I'm taking it from that. Uh, contribution that no consideration has been given to that matter and the government doesn't intend to make any special arrangement and, uh, for that circumstance. Uh, it may be because that is the precedent. Senator O'Brien, being 10pm, the committee reports to the Senate. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Fisher. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise tonight to talk about an issue of vital importance to Australians at large and to South Australians from my home state in particular, and that's water security. It's vital to city people and to country people. Efficient water collection, storage and use are economically and environmentally sensible. But the South Australian Labor government's current nonsense is neither efficient nor sensible. South Australia is the driest state on the driest continent, yet we have the RAND Labor government dithering in critical planning for our future water supplies whilst letting the country's driest state dehydrate. A state government which has sat on its hands and prayed for rain and done little else to prepare for either the shorter or longer term. In recent weeks, my fellow South Australians and I have had to endure the state government attempts to deflect to the Howard Costello government the blame for water woes when we know that the state government is in charge of our water supplies. We've had to put up with condescending messages from the South Australian government about saving water, from a state government progressively forcing South Australians to abandon their gardens whilst it abandons the watering of our state. Without rain, water restrictions alone mean little. We know that water restrictions won't solve our state's water crisis, that water restrictions are like trying to solve the crisis from the end of a hose. But we've had stern messages about how state taxpayers must fund water cops on the beat, about how it's good to dob in your neighbour. Because whilst the state government tries to tell us it cares, it says we don't care enough to be responsible. In March this year, the South Australian government was lauding the success of water restrictions in South Australia. The state minister was daily telling South Australians that they had saved thousands of megalitres of water with drippers and hoses with a nozzle. Then suddenly something must have changed, because the state government slammed the people of South Australia, accusing us of using sprinklers for the maximum period allowed, whether our gardens needed it or not. The state government said that householders have been given a chance to prove they could responsibly use drip irrigation during Level 3 restrictions last summer and had failed. So what had changed in a matter of months? Well, we were told it hadn't rained, but were told little more. For that, the RAND government told us we were to have buckets and buckets only. And the empirical evidence for buckets? None bar that buckets are burdensome. In short, they're pretty hard work. So we got buckets and saved even more water, as the state government quietly continued to pocket increasing amounts by way of a property charge assessed independently of the amount of water used. People living in suburbs like Kilburn, Burnside, Dulwich, Unley and Ashford were burdened with carrying buckets of water to keep their gardens alive. Senior citizens and pensioners staggering about their gardens at night, watering plants with buckets of water they've saved, colleague, would be ludicrous if it weren't so tragically real. According to the state minister, forcing people to bucket water was apparently the result of South Australia's superb negotiations with the eastern states to release more water from the Murray to South Australia. When people started to question the quality of negotiating skills, shown by the South Australian government, it supposedly became the fault of the Prime Minister and Minister Turnbull. On 29 August this year, in the face of the RAND government's ongoing failure to secure South Australia's water supplies, the state opposition released their comprehensive 19-point plan to secure 
and waterproof South Australia. Opposition Leader Martin Hamilton Smith outlined initiatives to end water restriction, reduce South Australia's reliance on the River Murray, and secure South Australia's water supplies for generations. But a backlash against buckets continued to fuel public anger at state government dithering. We were told we'd best be grateful for buckets because the state government could ban buckets too. Responsible South Australians were offended. The community expressed its indi indignation, indignation colleagues, to Liberals, including Liberal candidate for Adelaide Tracy Marsh and including the member for Sturt, indeed, colleague, including the member for Sturt, the Honourable Christopher Pine, whose petition calling on state government, the state government to develop a comprehensive water infrastructure plan has since gathered more than 10,000 signatures. On 31 August this year, two days after the state opposition's outlining of its 19-point plan to waterproof the state, the state government still stood steadfast and strident. South Australian Water Minister announced that only rain would change the state government's policy. Ah, but less than a fortnight later, Labor Premier Mike Rann announced the breathtaking backflip. Drippers would again be allowed, and following the state Liberal lead, a desalination plant would be built to supply water to Adelaide. As commentator Mike Smithson noted in the Sunday Mail on September 16, Rattled Ran was forced into an early announcement, and I quote, The timing and delivery of this week's news that Adelaide will receive a desalination plant was bewildering, but one thing is certain. It's the right decision. Despite the government claiming that desalination has always been its idea, the simple fact is that the Liberals have led the charge for many months, he said. Not a South Australian Labor person in the chamber. But where are the state Labor government's details? Where are the plans? Where will the desal plant be sited? Premier Rand says the desal plant will supply 25 per cent of Adelaide's fresh water, will cost more than $1.4 billion and take up to five years to build. Well, it took WA two years. New South Wales says it will take 26 months to be up and running. So why five years? Where are the costings? You may well suggest, colleagues. Scant details suggest Adelaide will pay three times as much as Perth for its desalination plant, and water rates are tipped to rise by $300 annually, some six times Perth's annual rise of $43 per year. We can all see that water prices should and will go up. But the government must justify, the South Australian government must justify why about one third of everybody's water bill currently goes into general revenue and explain why the numbers add up about as well as the cost estimates on the North Terrace tram extension and the opening bridge at Port Adelaide. The RAN Labor government isn't really committed to the idea. They're probably still hoping they won't have to build it. Of course, a desal plant is part of the solution. Indeed, farmers and those who live along the Murray through the Riverland, the Murray lands and the lower lakes must be happy to see that in future Adelaide may not have to take 90 per cent of its water supply from the Murray like it currently does during very dry periods. But most amazing was that the Premier didn't need the Prime Minister's permission to change his policy. The state government's botched attempt to blame the Prime Minister for South Australia's water woes is ill-conceived by the state government's subsequent attempt to claim credit for a long overdue backflip <coughs> under community and Liberal Party pressure. But where are the RAN government's short-term plans to secure the state's water supplies, the short-term plans in advance of long-term plans being completed? We may well, we may well, colleague. Where are there realistic plans for more storm and wastewater recycling infrastructure? Which brings us to the federal election. To see the hallmarks of what would be a Rudd administration, look no further than the RAN administration and its withering and dithering dehydration of South Australia. 
Labor administrations lack the experience to govern responsibly. They lack the vision to plan for the future and the ability to generate resources to afford to build for the future. Where they do attempt the right initiatives, they echo Liberal initiatives. Labor administrations pay, play politics with issues, play politics with issues like water, because winning elections is more important than governing. And if they get to govern, they flounder because they don't know how to do it. Australians recognise that the job won't get done unless Liberals do it. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hutchins. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I intended to uh, later this week make a contribution. Uh, in relation to some historical events, but unfortunately, due to a number of circumstances, I am unable to at this stage to do that. But I do intend to at the next sitting of Parliament. Mr. Mr. President, uh, during the break, I read a book by a lady called Lynn Olson called Troublesome Young Men, The Rebels Who Brought Churchill to power in 1940 and helped save Britain. And as a result of that, I uh, inquired of the parliamentary library as about as to what was happening in the Australian Parliament, probably in that period between 1935 and 1939. I can't go into detail this evening. In, uh, as a result of uh, the shortage of time. But I do want to refer to specifically uh, the responses within the Australian Parliament in that period in relation to the persecution of Jews in uh, Germany. And I am particularly con disturbed by an article in The Australian Today by Victor Davis Hanson, which outlines again the uh, insipid anti-Semitism that uh, is about in the Western community, particularly amongst the intelligentsia and probably in my own uh, side of politics. Mr. President, it was a disturbing to look at that period within the responses in the Australian Parliament. And as I said, I will comment on them later when we come back. But it is also uh, concerning that here we are on the 17th of September 2007. Only 72 years ago, two days earlier, <clears throat> that the Nazis stripped German Jews of their rights with the Nuremberg race laws. And as a result of that, going down, the, down in the, the chronological order, on the 9th and 10th of November in 1938, there was an infamous event called Crystal Night, where there was a murder, harassment, <coughs> and other terrible things done to people who were of the Jewish faith. I inquired as to what the Australian Parliament was saying in that period. And I must say that I'm not very proud of the contribution of my own party in highlighting the events that occurred. The, and, and indeed, the non-Labor parties also have a, a bit to answer for. I, and, and I thank Ms. Janice, Ms. Janice Wilson from the Parliamentary Library for assisting me in this, and she can't be held accountable for my interpretation 
or the uh, use of documents that I uh, refer to. But only on the 17th and 18th of November 1938 did a Member of Parliament ask a question about the treatment of Jews in Germany. And he was a non-Labor Member of Parliament, a Mr Francis. To our credit on our side, the Labor Party, there was a, a very old Member of Parliament. I think he'd been born in 19, 1950 or so. 1850, I should say, Dr Maloney, the member for Mel Melbourne, who Arthur Corwell succeeded. And Dr Maloney made an impassioned speech on that day, on the 18th of November 1938, imploring all of us to treat people of the Jewish faith, or Jews, I suppose, if we want to call it that, I'll call them that, to be looked after because of the persecution that they were suffering in Germany and they were about to suffer in Poland. But there were no other instances. On the same day, on the 18th of November 1938, a Mr Hutchinson asked a question of the Prime Minister in relation to the treatment of Jews in Germany. And he was well aware, as I said, this is after the Crystal Night on the 8th, 9th and 10th of November, clearly um, highlighted in the press at that time. The only other time that the Australian Parliament mentioned in that period before the outbreak of war in 1939 was on the 17th of May 1939 by Senator Maclay from your own state, Mr President, South Australia, where he referred to in his speech as the Minister for Commerce, and I quote, also the organised ill-treatment of the Jews and the violent tone of public utterances and officially inspired press articles indicated the strong influence of extremists in the councils of the right. Now, as I said, Mr President, uh, I well intended to make a more uh, detailed uh, contribution in relation to this area because I believe that uh, we as members of parliament should always be conscious that at this in our, in our lifetime and our period here in parliament that these events may also be occurring at the same time and we should also comment on them. I must say, Mr President, uh, I should uh, also comment that uh, Sir Charles Ma, who was a member of the House of Representatives, on the 9th of May 1939, also referred to the atrocities being committed against Jews. And I must say to my uh, con dis concern that a member of the Labor Party thought they were no different. That's Mr. Jack Beasley, who was also known as Stabber Jack Beasley, a member of the New South Wales Labor Party, and he thought that they were no different to the way that the British were treating people in India and Palestine. I say this because, as I said, it's only 72 years ago that the Nazis passed these laws in Germany, and the Australian Parliament said very little about it, said very little about it. And at the moment, Mr. Acting Dep uh, Mr. Dep Mr. President, we have in today's Australian an article by, as I said earlier, Mr. Victor Davis Hanson, 
is, who is also outlining again to my uh, concern the insipid anti-Semitism that is uh, about. Mr Hansen uh, quotes the former Prime Minister of Turkey and his anti-Semitic comments. He quotes a former US senator in his anti-Semitic comments. He quotes a current member of the British, Labor, uh, British Parliament, a Labor person, Claire Shaw, on, his, on her comments, anti-Semitic comments. Let me finish on this, Mr. Acting, Mr President. This new face of anti-Semitism is so insidious because it is so well disguised, advanced by self-proclaimed diplomats and academics, and now embraced by the supposedly sophisticated left on university campuses. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hutchins. Senator Murray. Thank you, Mr. President. The motivation for my adjournment speech this evening is the release last week of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Family and Human Services report titled The Winnable War on Drugs. In line with uh, Prime Minister Howard's statements, the tenor of this report is uncompromising in its tough on drugs message. This approach is not necessarily welcomed by all. For instance, the peak body for alcohol and drug issues in Victoria, the Victorian Alcohol and Drug Association, issued a media release on the 14th of September stating that, and I quote, the report completely ignores the evidence of the vast majority of drug treatment providers and researchers who gave evidence to the inquiry. But that is not the purpose of my speech. The biggest reaction has been reserved for the astonishing recommendation to almost automatically take children from their parents and give them to strangers. This Victorian Alcohol and Drug Association media release also attacks this controversial proposal that young children of illicit drug-using parents be put up for adoption, claiming that, and I quote, implementing the report's recommendations would inevitably lead to the creation of a second stolen generation of Australian children. Recommendation five of the report states that when a child protection notification involves the use of illicit drugs by parents, any ch children aged naught to five years then become subject to adoption as a default care option. There seems to be at least three suppositions here. Firstly, that the existing situation in all states and territories allowing for the removal of children at high risk is unsatisfactory and insufficient. Secondly, that permanent adoption is better than placement in what might be temporary for foster care. Thirdly, that there are legions of suitable adopters out there. Ignored is the evidence that this disturbing recommendation could have disastrous outcomes for families and children so affected. Ignored is the evidence of how unhappy many adoptees have turned out to be with blemished adult lives as a result. This recommendation is unnecessarily punitive and very out of date and old fashioned in its highly judgmental approach. No one disputes that children at very high risk cannot be left with unsafe parents. All states and territories have laws allowing for this removal. No one disputes that adoption is an important mechanism for providing good homes for unwanted children. All states and territories have allowing, laws allowing for this too. But for adop adoption to be a default option that is automatic, that is undoubtedly going too far. There is no sign the members of this committee really understand the long-term social and economic problems emanating from children either forcibly taken from their families or voluntarily placed into out-of-home care. How many of them know of or have read the trilogy of national reports that attest to this? The 1997 Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission's Bringing Them Home report of the Aboriginal Stolen Generation. The 2001 Senate Community Affairs Child Migrant report, Lost Innocence Writing the Record. The 2004 Senate Community Affairs Forgotten Australians report on Australians who experienced institutional or out-of-home care as children. These are but three reports of many others and a plethora of research literature that clearly attest to the enduring problems of children being raised away from their families of origin. Many a submission to the Senate inquiries just mentioned revealed the trauma of being removed from their families. Removal for the most part was justified on the grounds of alcohol fueled family violence. Although many recalled memories of this violence and general neglect, 
The evidence of most was that they would have preferred to remain with their families as the bonds of family attachment were stronger than their dismay at the circumstances they were in. Having spent their childhoods in care, the greatest hardship for them was the sense of dislocation and loss of identity they felt. Many witnesses told of how the loss of contact with their parents, siblings and place of origin had had a lasting impact well into their adult lives. As adults, most have sought the information vital to reconnecting them to their families and to piecing together their childhoods and their familial connections. One former child migrant stated in a hearing that, and I quote, former child migrants have spent their entire lives feeling lost or separated and even abandoned. From my own point of view, I, I have lived my life with a hole at the centre of my being. End of quote. And a care leaver wrote in her submission that, and I quote, not only did I lose my identity, but I lost my mother, my father, brothers and a sister, my family home, my bedroom, my toys, my family photos, my friends, aunties, uncles, my hometown and connections, all blown away like points off the stock market, just as though it never existed. End of quote. These two quotes are but two of many, many more quotes that I could give, but they do reflect major findings of these inquiries. In fact, each of these reports incorporates whole chapters on the search for identity. I should mention here too that the irony is that this profound sense of dislocation felt by those raised away from their biological families has resulted in many resorting to illicit drug and excessive alcohol use as adults to quell the pain of their loss and identity confusion. This would be repeated for some adoptees should adoption become the default option for young children of illicit drug-using parents. So where is the logic in such a proposal? Why implement a measure that the evidence shows produces psychological problems for some that can itself lead to substance abuse and create a new generation of licit and illicit drug users? The evidence showed that there is a generational cycle that needs to be broken, but not in this way. Many alcohol and drug abusers to be targeted for losing their children to adoption were themselves taken away from their families as young kids. Empathy and understanding is what is required, working out how to change the cycle, not persecution and punishment of the children. This recommendation appears to be a low-cost solution made by economic rationalists. The parents are to be treated as criminals. The children are dragged before those who make judgments as, as that they are in moral danger. And here's the punishment. But wait, it turns out the kids have a value. There is a demand for kids. So here's the supply, problem over, end of story. Instead, what is needed is a huge long-term financial and policy commitment to help individuals and families to get themselves right, to end the intergenerational problems and address the causes, not the effects. Have a look again at the Senate report recommendations and the report itself. There are practical issues of feasibility too. Dr Alex Wodak, uh, President of the Australian uh, Drug Law Reform Foundation and Director of the St Vincent's Hospital Alcohol and Drug Service, is reported in the Canberra Times on the 15th of December, September as describing the proposed adoption measure as, and I quote, absolutely outrageous, end of quote. He stated, we have several hundred thousand people a year using heroin. We have about two and a half million Australians each year using cannabis. So we're going to find adoptive parents for these children? It's just ludicrous. This is just extremism. Apart from the fact it's wanton cruelty, this is stolen generation mark two, end of quote. Dr. Wodak's response cannot be ignored. It must not be ignored because there's ample evidence that shows early intervention with children can produce much better outcomes than this automatic adoption proposal. The government itself has paid attention to Dr Fiona Stanley's views on these matters from my home state of Western Australia and a former Australian of the Year. In this sense, the House of Representatives Family and Human Services Committee, Committee's Winnable War on Drugs report appears to disregard the fact that family-focused rehabilitation options can and do work. As I said earlier, I do acknowledge that in some instances there is no alternative but for children to be removed. Media reports of stories of the accidental death and ill treatment of children whose parents were users are indeed harrowing to read. But to go down the road of automatic adoption is just not the answer, nor is it practical or feasible. 
To conclude, I would like to quote from the editorial of the Canberra Times published last Saturday, the 15th September. It reads, and I quote, it is to be hoped that this demand for a rethink on drug rehabilitation is recognised for what it is, an unreasonably harsh and punitive approach that is more likely to drive drug users underground than to naltrexone clinics, and that the Minister for Families and Community Services, Mal Bruff, gives it the response it deserves. End of quote. There is hope a coalition government would let this report recommendation slide. There is even more hope that Labour will do better because Labour members of the committee have rejected many of the inquiry's conclusions in their dissenting report, including rejecting the view that it automatically taking children from their parents is a good idea. Should they form government after the coming federal election, I trust Labour will turn to the Senate committee reports for inspiration and not to this retrogressive suggestion by some coalition members of the House. Senator Agorston. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, senators may have heard recently the news by the Me Bureau of Meteorology highlighting that an early break to a possible La Nina or drought breaking event has not occurred. This again brings to the forefront the stark realities and impacts of our ever cl changing climate and weather variability. And it means that there will be, continue to be a drought across mo most of Australia. By way of their announcement, the Bureau has again emphasised the importance of northern Australia, where there is an abundance of water. Mr President, I have been a long-term advocate of the North being the new frontier for Australia. Having lived and associated with the North of Western Australia uh, for over three decades, I'm very much aware of the opportunities and, may I say, the limitations the North presents. During during the 80s and 90s, I attended several North Australian development conferences held under the auspices of the North Australian Development Council, which was set up jointly by the WA, Queensland and Northern Territory governments. In attending the NAD conferences, I was struck by the fact that the issues and challenges faced were much the same across the whole of the North of Australia, and that the North was and remains a very different place to the South. Accordingly, unlocking the potential of the North requires that solutions be appropriate to the local conditions and understanding that what may have, been, what may have worked in the South <coughs> may well not be suitable for the North. A good example of this is cotton farming. Cotton in the South is a summer crop, whereas the Ord River Agricultural Research Station has shown in the North, cotton is a winter crop when the temperatures are cooler and the amount of water in the fields can be controlled. There is no doubt that the North is going to be critical for the future of agriculture in dealing with the challenges of climate change and reduced rainfall in southern areas of Australia, in my opinion, Mr President. While today mining, gas and oil dominate the economic landscape in the north of Western Australia, we must prepare a secondary economy. Tourism was always regarded as the second string in the bow of economic development in the north. However, to, according to Mark Lewis of the WA Department of Agriculture, who is the manager of NRM and Industry Development Rangelands Agriculture in the West Australian Department, uh, the obvious agriculture is the obvious alternative industry, given that it has the highest multipliers of most sectors in terms of jobs and value added added and export income. In Lewis's view, agriculture can build on the back of and enhance and create additional tourism-related experiences. Over the years, he says, he has personally been aware there have been numerous high-profile concepts, studies and feasibilities espoused for the North, most of which have failed due to lack of local research and capacity. To this end, we must build on our local knowledge and our local skills and ensure that the wherewithal is there in local areas to carry these projects through. With this in mind, Mark Lewis is of the view we need to undertake a number of very obvious, simple and pragmatic steps. These steps will create the foundation planks for growth in the region. Firstly and clearly, as a fundamental plank, or Ord Stage 2 is a priority. Mark Lewis believes we must continue our dialogue with the Government of Western Australia and the Northern Territory 
which rather sadly has shown a rather disappointing lack of real interest in Ord Stage 2. The dialogue must be outcomes-based and achieve benefits for all Australians. Secondly, while the Ord tends to dominate discussion, Mr Lewis strongly believes we must focus on opportunities to the west of the Ord. Lewis's view is that we must define strategies for the sustainable development of the West Kimberley and Eastern Pilbara. There are many opportunities and obvious synergies between agriculture and mining to create sustainable communities in this area in the future. One of the benefits includes considering the opportunities the North presents in terms of reducing greenhouse gas. Mark gases. Mark Lewis believes that this is a sleeper and agriculture and the mining industry can provide some solutions both in terms of carbon sequestration and offsets through the use of biofuels, particularly biodiesels. Thirdly, Mr President, we must do whatever is humanly possible to ensure Indigenous North Australia assimilates and engages in the real economy that is Australia of 2007. Reliance on land rights and cultural autonomy in the past has clearly not worked <coughs> for the Indigenous people. Any literature on rural development, regional development or Indigenous development has, its, has at its core the need for education. Education, both conventional in terms of literacy and numeracy, as well as, most importantly, job skill education. Mr President, while long-term plans are being developed for issues like Ord Stage 2 uh, and broader Indigenous engagement, I believe we need to act in the short term and get some other projects underway. As I said earlier, we must not just focus on the Ord, but look beyond it to the other great river basins in the north. Significant potential also exists in the wider constituency of the Kimberleys and Eastern Pilbara and these areas deserve just as much attention as the Ord River catchment area. Mr Lewis advised me that he saw four key activities that the government should immediately address while the Northern Land and Water Task Force develops a long-term plan for the area. Mr Lewis gleaned these key strategic issues from local people currently working in the area and said he could see no point in reinventing the wheel when, issue, when these issues have already been identified through a rigorous consultation and technical review. Key opinion leaders in the North must understand the value of irrigated agriculture and the concomitant multipliers that it offers. This will be a key for understanding how irrigated agriculture will underpin regional economies and allow Indigenous Australia to be a part of the real Australian economy. It is also critical for these key opinion stakeholders to understand contemporary sustainable irrigated agriculture and how technologically advanced the fertigation systems are. Having been to and seen irrigated agriculture at world's be best practice standards in Carnarvon in Western Australia, a key action would be to ensure that all key opinion leaders from the North do likewise. One of the big issues in northern development is headworks, uh, and there's a need to create incentives to ameliorate the initial high upfront cap capital costs with bore fields, power and roads through regionally based headwork schemes. Paying off the cost of headworks over a long period, is al as already is the case in the Northern Territory, is also another way of substantially ameliorating their cost. Um, thirdly, and most obviously, market drivers need to be identified and connected to specific development opportunities. Mr Lewis says market pool must be the driver of any new development, and Austrad and our overseas offices will be a key, play a key role in identifying gaps in supply, working with the large importers and distributors in our major trading blocks and matching these up with our production windows and niche climate advantage will, he says, be instrumental in dictating what we grow. Fourthly and finally, government should be urged to not stop development while longer term plans are being put in place. Work is being done to identify eight to 12 
small scale sustainable pro pro projects. These, these precincts should be the subject of further investigation, could it, could, which could potentially add up, open up to 10 to 20,000 hectares across the north outside the Ord. Mr President, I am confident that the above works have been identified with sufficient rigour to warrant short-term investment and should be supported as soon as possible. Uh, to this end, I would encourage responsible ministers and agencies to work with local stakeholders on these activities. Mr President, we have the opportunity to be truly pioneering again. It is time for positive action and commitment. It is time, Mr President, for Northern Australia to achieve its potential as a new food bowl of here, here. Australia. Here, here, Sen Senator Wortley. Thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to speak on the issue of type 1 diabetes. As a member of the Parliamentary Diabetes Support Group, I met recently in Adelaide and again here in Parliament House with representatives of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, who brought me up to date on research developments and the latest statistics on this increasingly common disease. I also had the opportunity to join with my state colleagues in a bipartisan event, Kids in the House, where young children and teenagers had the opportunity to sit in the House of Assembly Chamber along with their parents and tell members of Parliament of their life living with juvenile diabetes. I have learned from speaking to the parents of these children that as a parent of a child with type 1 diabetes, there is no beginning or end to the day. Life is a constant, relentless, stressful, sleepless, unforgiving cycle of monitoring and management, watching and worrying. Easing up on this strict energy and emotion sapping regime can prove fatal. If a child's blood sugar level dips too low, he or she may lapse into a coma. If this happens during the night, they simply may not wake up. They must administer up to six insulin injections a day and check their child's blood sugar levels with a finger prick up to eight or more times every day. And it's not uncommon for a parent to have to check their children at 7 a.m. lunchtime, 4.30 p.m., pre-bed, midnight, 1.30 a.m., 3 a.m., and times in between. It never ever stops. There is no respite and no rest. This is the message that I was given. Monitoring a child's levels and watching for signs that their health is deteriorating is never ending, and there often is no choice but for a parent to become a full-time carer, even as children grow to ages at which they'd normally have more and more independence. During a birthday party, a child with type 1 diabetes is likely to need three finger pricks. One of the parents I met at the Kids in the House event was Lorraine, mother of five-year-old Thomas, a type 1 diabetic. She told us that a simple sleepover at grandparents' or friends' homes just isn't an option for most children and families living under the diabetes cloud. It is a devastating disease that does not discriminate. It cannot be controlled by diet or lifestyle. Lorraine and other parents I met with on that day wanted this point highlighted. It cannot be controlled by diet or lifestyle. The hope for these children, whose futures otherwise promise a shortened lifespan and may include severe health complications, such as organ failure and amputation, is to find a cure. Lorraine, who gave up a position as a corporate account manager for a telecommunications company to become full-time carer to Thomas, says a lack of public awareness of the disease is a big issue. While she and husband Douglas were familiar with type 1 diabetes because his twin brother was diagnosed at age 21, she knows it is a mystery to much of the community, including those who were newly diagnosed. Lorraine chairs a family forum, Parent Family Voice, that meets monthly. Established to keep families of children with juvenile diabetes informed, it provides information on daily living experiences within kindergartens and schools and acts as a support network for parents and children. It is often the case that children with diabetes look well and so the complexity and severity of the disease and the impact it has on families living with it may not be obvious. Lorraine said, I can't even begin to describe to you the worry that we as parents carry around with us every day and night 
There are no days off. Every day rolls into the next. Type 1 diabetes doesn't give a person or the family a choice to manage the disease. It demands it. The constant monitoring and adjusting of a person's sugar level governs every hour of every day. To maintain a constant and balanced sugar level is impossible for parents with type 1 diabetes, she said. Within the past few months, Thomas, who was di diagnosed at age two, had an episode that could be repeated any night. Lorraine had checked his sugar levels before going to bed, but later in the middle of the night checked him, him again on a feeling, on an instinct. He registered a reading of 2.2, dangerously low as a nighttime level. Had she not done this, Thomas most likely would have slipped into a coma. Thomas's twin sisters so far are not showing signs of the disease, but they need to be screened for it regularly, another source of fear, stress and worry for their parents. Lorraine said, I'm completely torn because I'm desperate to know that they're OK, but terrified to find out if they might get it. Mr President, from the time of diagnosis of juvenile diabetes, the life of the child and parents, especially in the early months and years, is a whirlwind of hospitals, doctors, dietitians, and diabetes educators. Every few hours, often more frequently, the, child, the child's blood sugar levels must be monitored, day and night. The parents must learn to measure the appropriate insulin dose up to six times in 24 hours and to manage a syringe or an insulin pen. Later, some children are fortunate enough to be suitable for and have access to an insulin pump at a cost of around $8,500. Not all families, however, are in a position to afford the cost of a pump, and so their child misses out on the health and social benefits that an insulin pump can bring. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. Parents plan ahead, manage the financial issues as best they can, source equipment and supplies, read the labels on food products incessantly to find the right balance of carbohydrates and other dietary requirements. They are constantly vigilant, checking their child for signs of low or high blood sugar levels. New concerns arise as time goes on, visiting family and friends, travel, starting at school, self-testing and self-administering. Adolescence brings new challenges, emotional and physical support, education and safe, effective self-care protocols are all paramount issues. This is the reality that a family of a child with type 1 diabetes faces, faces and there is to date no cure. The effects of the disease on quality of life are not only immediate but cumulative. Over time, Chronically high levels of blood glucose permanently damage blood vessels and the tissues and organs they supply. Affecting almost every organ in the body, diabetes can lead to serious complications including diabetic eye, kidney and nerve diseases and cardiovascular disease. The early onset of type 1 diabetes means that children and young people, those at the start of their lives, may face such serious complications while they are still in early adulthood. None of us can ever assume that this cannot happen to us or our families. In fact, the reverse is true. Some 80% of people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes have no family history of the disease. There are now 140,000 Australians living with type 1 diabetes. 8,665 of these range in age from newborn to 18 years. And this figure is expected to rise to 12,241 in three years, with five new diagnoses each day. A new report by the Australian Institute in Health and Welfare shows that the rate of new cases of type 1 diabetes in Australian children, already high relative to other countries, is increasing. Diabetes is now one of the most prevalent chronic diseases in Australia, representing an enormous health, social and financial burden for individuals with the disease, their families and the community as a whole. There is only one way for people with type 1 diabetes to achieve the quality of life and the lifespan that those who do not suffer this disease can reasonably expect, and that is a cure. And research is the key to finding a cure. The Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation is the world's leading non-profit contributor of funds to diabetes research and has been closely associated with almost every crucial step forward in diabetes research since 1970. 
Today, I have invited my South Australian federal parliamentary colleagues from all political parties to join together for the Foundation's 2007 Walk to Cure Diabetes, which will take place in Adelaide on Sunday, 14 October, from Wrigley Reserve, Glenelg, to North Brighton and back. Many South Australian state members of parliament have already indicated their commitment to participate. Similar events are planned for Perth, Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, and in regional areas on the same day and on Sunday, the 21st of October, in Canberra. Hundreds of South Australians are expected to join in the walk raising funds, some as individuals, some as teams, all dedicated to raising funds to support ongoing research. There is hope for the future with the extension of research into islet transplantation, hopefully leading to a pathway for a cure. Research and adequate funding for that research are crucial to finding the cause, which may lead to prevention and a much wanted cure for those that live their lives with type 1 diabetes. Senator Fair Brandy Wills. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise this evening to speak about an exciting initiative between Australia and Italy. Having had a long standing and active involvement in the Australian Italian community, I'm very pleased to speak on the Italian Australian Film Festival. As the first Australian woman of Italian origin elected to the Senate and the first person of Italian origin elected to the Senate from New South Wales, I'm particularly delighted to see activity between Australia and Italy in so many different areas. It is a vibrant relationship based especially on strong person-to-person -person ties, with first, second and third generation Australians of Italian origin making up about 10 per cent of our population. It is a relationship which has manifested itself across a diversity of ventures and enterprises. It is a relationship, of course, that I know well and one which is dear to my heart. In Italy, Australia is seen as a wonderful destination. And we here in Australia enjoy so many things Italian. Indeed, many things Italian are now a feature of our daily lives. This evening, I would like to speak about one such significant event this year. On 3 June, I had the pleasure of attending the inaugural Italian-Australian Film Festival Gala Dinner with special guest, the incomparable film icon, Sophia Loren. The event was held at the stunning Miramare Gardens at Terry Hills in the northern beaches of Sydney. It was a great success. The Italian-Australian Film Festival has been a showpiece of both Italian and Australian cultures. It is another example of the already strong connections between Italy and Australia. In September 2006, the festival directors Gabriella Mattacchioni and John Bomben travelled to the Venice Film Festival at the invitation of Cinecittà to present and launch Spettacolare 2007. The gala event, held at the Excelsior Hotel on the Lido, was attended by about 200 guests, including our then Australian Ambassador Peter Woolcott, Austrade Commissioner in Milan Tim Gauci, the director of Tiatanis Carlo Alberto Ballestrazzi, one of Italy's oldest and biggest production houses, and other notables in the film industry. As well as promoting Spettacolare, the occasion was used to showcase the beautiful Sunshine Coast in Queensland, where the festival was originally to have been held. For the film industry itself, the festival was an opportunity for significant networking between the Australian and overseas film industries and for sharing expertise and promoting the industry across wider markets. This outcome fits with the coalition government's overall goals of supporting our industry through the arts portfolio and the recent measures announced in the 2007-2008 budget. I would like to congratulate uh, Mrs Matacchioni and Mr Bomben as the main organisers of the festival. Their personal commitment, financial investment and passion for this project, believed to be the first of its kind between the two countries, ensured that despite the various hurdles, it was a great success. As indicated, one of the main highlights of the festival was the gala dinner with Sophia Loren. I was honoured to have been present at this event along with a number of my federal and state parliamentary colleagues, who I am sure, like me, found this a very memorable evening. What made the event particularly special was the decision by the organisers to not only praise Ms Loren for her outstanding career, 
but also use the opportunity to introduce her to the inspirational six-year-old burn survivor Sophie Delizio. The event was used to raise awareness of Burns' injuries and raise funds for the Day of Difference Foundation, which was established by Sophie's parents to assist promoting valuable research for paediatric burns. It was a particularly poignant moment when Ms Loren spoke to young Sophie and told her that she wanted to give her a very special gift, and that it was a gift that she wanted young Sophie to wear on her first date. Ms Loren then took off the beautiful earrings she was wearing and gave them to young Sophie. It was a magnificent and very generous gesture by Ms Loren. After the success of the festival and the undeniable generosity and commitment of the organisers, I was disheartened to learn that those behind this event had received undeserved criticism by a member of the Queensland bureaucracy. I understand that Mr Michael Denton, who is Chief Executive Officer of Queensland Events and then member of the Maroochee Tourism Industry Advisory Board, criticised the federal organisers in an interview on Queensland ABC Radio on 7 June 2007. I understand that Mr Denton made these comments in his capacity as CEO of Queensland Events, a body administered directly by the Queensland Premier through the Premier's department and which itself, coincidentally, was seeking to promote its ambitious plan for an annual film awards for the Asia-Pacific region. While the current Queensland Government has a less than impressive record when it comes to its management of the public sector, the conduct of the Premier's department raises real concerns. I am advised that Mr Denton intimated in his interview and on other occasions that the Italian Australian Film Festival received significant amounts of public funding to assist in organising a film festival event on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. I, inform, I am informed by Mrs Matacchioni that the organisation did not receive funding from the Queensland Government for the festival. Indeed, I also understand that funding given for the festival from the Federal Government was reimbursed to the Commonwealth when the event regrettably had to be relocated to Sydney. Mr Denton's comments, while speaking in his capacity as Chief Executive Officer of Queensland Events, have unnecessarily damaged the reputation of the festival and its organisers. Shame. Thank you, Senator Parry. Indeed, I understand that legal action has been undertaken by the festival organisers regarding these comments. I am also very concerned that at no stage were the organisers of the festival afforded a right of reply by the ABC. Indeed, the ABC failed to even contact the organisers for any comments. Can I also take the opportunity to comment on the appalling behaviour of another component of the ABC, namely the chaser? At Ms Lorraine's press conference in Sydney on 1 June 2007, Andrew Hansen disrupted the, conf the press conference by asking 10 very inappropriate questions of Ms Lorraine, designed deliberately to embarrass her. At the gala dinner that I attended, Ms Loren expressed to me her absolute displeasure at the conduct of Mr Hansen. As usual, the chaser simply don't care who they offend and the effect that this may have. In this case, they had no regard for the potential embarrassment to the organisers and supporters of the Italian-Australian Film Festival. Rest assured that I intend to raise this matter again in another forum. But I would like to go on and look at what is being proposed in the future for Spettacolare. The directors of the festival are currently in negotiations with major corporate sponsors and partners, both in Australia and in the European Union. They are also having discussions with various levels of governments in both Italy and Australia to deliver the 2008 event. I am advised that this should include a visit to Australia by Isabella Rossellini with a personal photographic exhibition and a retrospective of her father's films, a concert performance and various other trade and cultural activities. It is anticipated that the event will take place in Sydney in early September 2008. The aim is to create spettacolare as an annual trade and cultural exchange between Australia 
and Italy in particular, and Europe and then Asia. The hope of the organisers is that within the next two to three years, Spettacolari will be able to tour to other major Australian capital cities and eventually return to its home base at the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. I would like to conclude by congratulating the organisers and supporters for the efforts in Spettacolare 2007, and I wish them all the very best for a successful Spettacolare in 2008 in Sydney. Thank you. Senator Barnett. Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, I rise tonight to place on record my strong support for the pulp mill project in northern Tasmania, subject to strict environmental conditions. Tonight I wish to speak about this project and the process to approve the project and to make some suggestions on a way forward. <clears throat> I believe a lack of confidence in the state government's approval process has led to a lack of confidence in the pulp mill project, and this is regrettable. However, there is a way forward, and like the Prime Minister, the Hon. John Howard, I'm hopeful and optimistic that the pulp mill can be approved and deliver many benefits for Tasmania. I support value-adding and downstream processing, a pulp mill and then a paper mill. This should be our future. Continuing to export raw wood chips from Tasmania is an undesirable waste of our resources. It is not a clever strategy. The wood chip export industry started in Tasmania in 1973 and was supposed to be a temporary industry while we developed value-adding industries. Here we are, 34 years later. It's time we stopped exporting an estimated 5 million tonnes of wood chips each year. I recall a meeting in my office some four and a half years ago, soon after I became a senator. I was meeting with Barry Chipman and others from Timber Communities Australia, urging them to get on and to support the establishment of a pulp mill in Tasmania. This pulp mill is actually the third attempt by the Tasmanian community to build a pulp mill, the first being Wesley Vale in 1988-89, then a proposal by the Taiwan Pulp and Paper Company in 1992-93, and now the Guns proposal. The first attempt failed amid the politics of the environment. Uh, the second proposal was, withdraw was withdrawn on purely economic grounds. During the Wesley Vale saga, I was senior adviser to the then uh, Tasmanian Premier Robin Gray and saw the politics of the controversy first hand. <coughs> the state Labor government and Premier Paul Lennon in particular, through his ham-fisted approach to the approval process, has in my view nearly lost this pulp mill project to Tasmania. The state Labor government has compromised the state's proper approval processes in the most cavalier fashion with rules made up or broken as they went along. Its actions have been foolhardy at best, but I would describe them as ham-fisted. And they've resulted in the dramatic resignation of two heads of the Resource Planning and Development Commission, that was the independent assessment body established to oversee the approval process. Both heads, uh, Julian Green and Mr Justif Justice uh, Wright, both angrily resigned, citing political interference and pressure from the Lennon Labor government. Guns withdrew from the RPDC process on the 14th of March 2007, and on the 20th of March uh, 2007, Premier Paul Lennon introduced the Pulp Mill Assessment Bill, thus avoiding his own agreed method of independent assessment. <coughs> from the Australian government perspective, the proposed mill remained a controlled action and therefore still required assessment and approval under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, the EPBC Act. And the Australian government has undertaken a full and rigorous assessment of matters that relate to the guns pulp mill under that act, independent of any state assessment. The development cannot proceed unless these approvals are obtained. And it was on the 16th of August that Minister Turnbull invited comment, public comment on his department's draft approval and conditions. And then on the 29th of August, Minister Turnbull decided under the EPBC Act to specify 30 business days from this date for a decision. And then uh, the next day, Minister Turnbull announced a scientific panel headed by Australian Government Chief Scientist Dr Jim Peacock, who would consider the draft approval and public comments and report with recommendations regarding approval. That report is due later this week, I understand. Interestingly, uh, on the 9th of August this year, the Federal Court dismissed challenges to the federal assessment process from the Wilderness Society, 
and a group called Investors for the Future. And this further confirms the vigour and appropriateness of the federal approval process compared to the state approval process. As I've said, the $1.7 billion pulp mill project will have the capacity to produce 800,000 tonnes of air-dried bleached craft pulp per annum, generating annual export revenue in Tasmania exceeding $350 million. Directly and indirectly, the project is expected to generate up to 8,000 jobs per uh, during construction and up to 1,500 jobs once the mill is operational. In 2005, um, I visited Sweden, the home of 44-odd pulp mills. Um, knowing of the guns pulp mill uh, planned for Tasmania, I met with both the forestry and environment committees of their parliament. Both committees confirmed there were no significant issues with pulp mills in their or their establishment in Sweden. I'm confident that our federal approval processes will ensure proper scrutiny, and I'm hopeful of a positive decision as soon as possible and preferably before the election is called. Now, we can go further and there's always room for improvement, and the compromised approval process at a state level requires solutions at a national level so that proponents of major developments are not deterred by sovereign risk concerns from presenting pro uh, projects for assessment in the future. We need to rebuild and restore public confidence in the approval process for not only major projects in Tasmania but projects of national significance. So accordingly, I've so accordingly I make three suggestions for the future. Firstly, at the state level, a tough and thoroughly independent uh, environmental protection agency, an environmental watchdog proposed by the Tasmanian Liberal Opposition Leader, the Honourable Will Hodgman and also promised, also promised by the Tasmanian Labor government at the 2006 election, but so far not implemented despite Mr Hodgman's constant reminders. This agency would give comfort to the community where there is concern about a development polluting the environment. The community would have more confidence in the guns pulp mill if they had confidence in the monitoring of its operations once constructed, and the state Liberals' teams the state Liberal team's new EPA would strike a more sensible balance between development and protecting our natural environment by upgrading the identification and policing of environmental breaches, if any. Secondly, at the federal level, I propose a formalised independent objective assessment process for projects of national significance. It is true that most states, to my knowledge, have an independent objective assessment process for projects of state significance. This is a proposal for an uh, independent objective assessment of projects of national significance. And I might add that uh, COAG has done some work on this already last year on the 14th of July at the COAG meeting and again this year on the 13th of April uh, 2007. COAG committed to reduce the regulatory burden across all three levels of government and to address and to address the environmental assessment and approvals processes. COAG agreed to develop a pro proposal in consultation with states and territories for a more harmonised and efficient system of environmental assessment and approval as soon as possible. COAG supports the work of the major project facilitator, and already this Australian government-funded entity has assisted 32 projects worth $41.7 billion and delivering around 11,280 jobs if they proceed as planned. The projects include the Visi Industries' $450 million expansion of its Tumut pulp mill. <clears throat> so we need to go further, either with or without COAG support. The nation needs an approval process whereby the Australian government is able to declare a project of, project, a project of national significance, so that for projects of a certain size, such as the Guns pulp mill, the approval process is undertaken independently and objectively within agreed timelines. I believe such a reform would go some way to avoiding the Wesley Vale and Tamar pulp mill controversies that have dogged my state over the last 20 odd years. To remain a buoyant and competitive economy on the world stage, Australia cannot afford to be regarded as a nation where environment approval processes vary markedly between eight state and territory jurisdictions and industry sovereign risk is always at stake. Such a process would include rigid time frames so that the proponents would be able to plan and budget for the approval process and not fear that their plans may be tied up in courts or, tri or tribunals for years. Special parliamentary legislation would be required to alter time frames or any part of the assessment process. Is this heavy-handed? No. If a project is big enough, if it's 
costs runs into billions of dollars, then the nation has a role to play in ensuring its proper assessment and monitoring. Thirdly and finally, we, we need a comprehensive education and information campaign on the benefits of the mill, but also how, when and where it will be monitored. The structures and initiatives in place to achieve this and the timeline involved, rebuilding confidence in both the mill and the process will be critical. Public affairs management of the project, uh, informing and educating the public on the mill development and the process has been um, not up to scratch, unfortunately. So we can still do better. These are suggestions for consideration. Um, before I call Senator Cormann, you may wish to seek leave to speak for more than 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to talk for more than 10 minutes. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I, I, <laughs> I call Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Today, at this late hour, I would like to speak about the importance to the Australian economy of a modern and flexible workplace relations system. A workplace relations system that helps deliver more jobs and better paid jobs. And a workplace relations system that is particularly important to the ongoing success of the resources sector in the building and construction industry in Western Australia. The resources sector in Western Australia has led the charge when it came to implementing workplace reform. In fact, that is because they knew that if it wanted to take advantage of increasing world demand and world prices for our resources, we had to improve our productivity, we had to reduce our levels of industrial disputation, and we had to develop a better relationship between employers and their workers. Mr. President, the resources sector in Western Australia has been able to benefit from modern, flexible workplace arrangements since 1993 when the court state government first introduced individual workplace agreements. And of course, since winning government in 1996, the Howard government has successfully reformed workplace relations nationally through a series of significant reforms like the introduction of Australian workplace agreements. And thank goodness we did, because when Labor won government in Western Australia in 2001, they had to deliver on a promise. They had to deliver on a promise they had made to the majority shareholders of the Australian Labor Party. Without flinching, the incoming Gallup Labor government did everything they could to hand control of workplaces back to the union heavies, to the Kevin Reynolds, the Joe McDonalds and all of their cohorts. The result? Well, for a start, an immediate 300 per cent increase in the take-up of Australian workplace agreements by workers in the West Australian resources sector alone. And the result today, and more importantly, a thriving resources sector in Western Australia driving our economy and, in fact, from Western Australia driving much of the success of the national economy. An and with the result today of unemployment at 3.1 per cent in Western Australia, with the result of strong wages growth, 21.5 per cent growth in real wages since 1996, compare that to the decrease of 1.8 per cent on the Labor and with the result of industrial disputes at the lowest level since records were first kept. With that sort of record, you'd think that anyone would want to keep the reforms that brought this about, would in fact want to strengthen and develop those reforms further. What does Labor want to do? They want to abolish Australian workplace agreements and they want to abolish Shame. the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Shame. Okay. After public outcry, they now say they will only abolish the Commission over time. There are, of course, different ways to skin a cat. Uh, they will now do it from within. That's right. They're now saying that they won't delete the name until 2010. But undermine it from within, abolish it, they will, make no mistakes. Now, Mr. President, as a West Australian, I have heard all of this before. The parallels are, in fact, very disconcerting, and they should worry the Australian people. In 2001, the West Australian Labor Party, pushed along by the vested interests of a union movement in decline, a union bureaucracy fighting for relevance with workers and for their survival, run on exactly that same agenda. They run on an agenda to abolish individual workplace agreements and write for this, on an agenda to abolish the West Australian Construction and Building Industry Task Force, which was set up by Graham Keirith, the then minister, as a problem solver in the workplace helping to protect employers from union intimidation and threats. 
Labor and WA back in 2000, 2001 gave the unions a wink and a nod. Help us get in. Do what needs to be done to help us win. Be quiet and maybe attack us from time to time so we can look tough. And we'll sort it all out in government, which is, of course, exactly what happened. And sorting it out for them, they did. They delivered on both. They abolished individual workplace agreements and they abolished the construction and building industry task force. The result? Union thugs running amok across building and construction sites in Perth. The people of Western Australia would well remember, the people in the remainder of Australia, and I think that that is one of our challenges, may well not, which may in fact in part explain the support for the Howard government's workplace relations reforms in Western Australia. It was a huge issue in Western Australia between 2001 and 2003. Have a read of some of the stories in the West Australian. On 23 February 2001, less than two weeks after the state election which Labor won, an article titled, It's War on Perth's Building Sites, and I quote, War is being waged on Perth's construction sites. Bosses and workers claim that carloads of up to 30 union heavies at a time have been doing the rounds of sites, closing them and intimidating workers. At least five sites were visited this week. The latest, a West Perth site where access was blocked from 6 a.m. yesterday, glue poured into gate locks and construction stopped. At the non-unionised Blue Water apartment site in South Perth on Tuesday, workers and project manager Jerry Hansen said about 20 unionists went onto the site, tore down a flag, erected their own flag and intimidated workers. Workers at the Blue Water site spoken to by the West Australian yesterday said the visit was not made on the grounds of safety or worker representation, but intimidation. Claims included no ticket, no start threats, demand that workers sign union-based pattern enterprise bargaining agreements using safety breaches as an industrial weapon and strike action without consultation with workers. And of course, despite all of that, Mr Kobelki, the, the then new relevant Labor State Minister, confirmed that Labor's pre-election pledge to disband the construction and building industry task force would go ahead. I believe that even the Gallup Labor government was embarrassed by the extent to which union heavies like Kevin Reynolds and Joe MacDonald ran roughshod over non-union workers and employers in WI at the time. They didn't quite know how to handle it, what to do about it and how to stop it, but privately embarrassed they would have been, I'm sure. Later, the CFMEU uh, Assistant Secretary Joe MacDonald would be telling a Royal Commission that, yeah, of course, he would shut down a work site just because he found non-union workers there. So much for the freedom of association, which of course includes the right not to associate. So much for complying with the law. Shop fitters at the Florid Forum Redevelopment are reported to have been forced to pay CFMEU memberships for all their workers. They also had to pay for at least one of the CFMEU safety libraries, whether they were needed or not, whether they turned up or not. Who paid for that at the end of the line? Well, ultimately, the everyday Western Australian consumer. No. Later in 2001, the West Australian ran another story titled Building Dispute Falls on Gallup. And in it, Kevin Reynolds is quoted as saying that the CFMEU would hold back affiliation fees owed to the Labor Party until it produced its industrial relations reforms. And of course, it wasn't long before Kevin Reynolds had to pay up because the Labor State government had delivered. The government was sitting back while business and workers across WI were threatened and intimidated by unions. Again, on 22 June 2002, the West Australian reported how the CFMEU would use fear, intimidation and coercion to get its way. At 22nd of June 2002 in the West Australian, and I quote, a WI building union used fear, intimidation and coercion to get its way. Lawyers for the coal inquiry have submitted. In January, the CFMEU threatened to stop refurbishment work at the Waka ground to convince workers from a non-unionised demolition company on the site to join its ranks. The Commission Council said the union had operated in an atmosphere of fear and intimidation in order to compel union membership. The consequences of continued harassment and intimidation on the site at the Waka could have been devastating for the Waka and WI. Too big a delay to the project might have put at risk WI's hosting of the England Test match in November and its $10 million spin-off for the West Australian economy. And who saved the day? Who fixed up the mess? Have a guess. 
Tony Abbott as the then Federal Minister for Workplace Relations and the Howard government, who first set up the Coal Royal Commission into the building and construction industry. Tony Abbott and Kevin Andrews and the Howard government, who ultimately set up the Australian Building and Construction Commission. And Joe Hockey, who is standing up for a strong, fair and flexible workplace relations system. That is what pulled the unions in Western Australia back into line. I bet that privately the Gallup Labor government was relieved when the Australian Building and Construction Commission came onto the scene. Somebody else was there to fix up the mess, to stand up to the union movement, because they couldn't. All of them, as compulsory members of the union movement, beholden to the vested interests of the union movement, couldn't do the job. They couldn't do what was right by the people of Western Australia. Which, of course, brings us to the next federal election. What the Australian people need to consider at that election is should Labor win, there is nowhere left to hide. With Labor in government coast to coast, there would be nowhere to hide when it comes to those sorts of economy-destroying activities. People like Joe Macdonald are on the public record in Western Australia are salivating at the prospect of a rut Labor victory in a few months' time. And allegedly, they already have already used those as threats on Perth building sites. In the scenario where Labor wins, they quite possibly, with the union-friendly and union-funded Greens movement controlling the balance of power in the Senate, will abolish Australian workplace agreements, and they will, in time, abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission, which has been so successful in keeping union thuggery in check. It would have a devastating effect, not only on the national economy, but would put a stake through the heart of the West Australian resource-based economy. Which brings us to the union labour pantomime. Mr. President, labour and the senior union bosses will play up Mr. President, let me start that again. Labor and senior union bosses will play out a little game in front of the Australian people over the next few weeks. In fact, it has already begun. The aim of the game is to make us believe that union hardheads like Kevin Reynolds disagree with Labor on their workplace relations policies. They will try and make us believe that Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard are standing up to the union movement. Only last week, Kevin Reynolds was quoted in the West Australian attacking Julia Gillard. Senators should have a read. It will make you laugh. Page four of the West Australian last Tuesday. Upping the ante in his attack on the federal Labor leadership, Mr Reynolds left hundreds of builders at a public forum stunned when he said that Mrs Gillard, that Mrs. Gillard's relationship with the unionists was just one of many secrets that would be revealed about Labor's inner circle. Mr Reynolds has made it clear he does not support Labor's leadership team partly because it would retain the Federal Government's Australian Building and Construction Commission at least until 2010." End of quote. Now, why do I know that this is a charade? Why do I know that it's all made up to make us believe that, Kevin, that the Kevin running for PM is standing up to the Kevin who will be running him as PM? Well, because it's part of a well-used, well-established formula. They've done it before, followed exactly the same modus operandi. Mr. President, I take you back to a couple of weeks prior to the 2001 state election in Western Australia. And I read to you an article in the West Australian of 25 January 2001, about two weeks, two weeks before the state election in Western Australia. And here, here is what Kevin Reynolds said then, Contro and I quote, controversial union boss Kevin Reynolds yesterday attacked opposition leader Jeff Gallup, saying Dr Gallup may not know what to do if he became Premier, and quote, we will see if he is like the dog that catches the car when he does uh, win. He might not know what to do with it. Kevin Reynolds is quoted as saying. Sound familiar? Yeah. Have heard things like that said about, uh, you know, by Kevin Reynolds about the current federal Labor leadership team? Let's go back to history. What happened afterwards in Western Australia? Jeff Gallup and the Labor state government delivered on all of the vested interest demands of the union bureaucracy, lock, stock and barrel. They abolished individual workplace agreements. They abolished the Construction and Building Industry Task Force, which, has, which, had successfully, which had been successful in keeping union thuggery in check. They gave no support to employers and non-union workers faced with appalling union thuggery. And of course, the federal government was forced to step in to save those employers and those workers, but more importantly, to save the thriving Western Australian economy from being suffocated. Mr. President, I say it again. Should Labor win at the next election, there will be nowhere to hide when it comes to Labor policies on workplace relations. Nowhere to hide when the Labor government will move to prop up the union bureaucracy ahead of promoting economic growth and development. And of course, to make absolutely sure 
an incoming Labor government would do the right thing, they're sending all of their top union bureaucrats into this parliament after the next election. Even if it means walking all over their comrades. Take IMWU National Secretary Doug Cameron, for example, who is expected to replace Senator Campbell. Former ICTU Secretary Greg Combat, who will replace Comrade Kelly Hoare in Charlton. IWU National Secretary Bill Shorten, and the list goes on. The union heavies are on their way to take over the Labour side in this parliament, joining, of course, the 70 per cent of members of the alternative government that are former union bureaucrats already. They will make sure that the federal, a future federal Labour government uh, will do what is required for the union movement. Through you, Mr President, I repeat this message to the people of Australia. Make no mistake, those top-level union bureaucrats will make sure that an incoming federal Labour government will deliver to the union movement. <coughs> even if it is to the detriment of your jobs and the ongoing strength of our economy. With coast-to-coast -coast Labor, the opportunity is just too good. The fact is that Labor in Australia has not yet done the hard yards. It has not yet done the hard yards when it comes to reforming its structural relations with the union industry. And it shows. Tony Blair had to do those hard yards before the British people were prepared to give Labor another go in government because it is quite frankly inappropriate and out of date that by virtue of the Labour Party constitution, unions still have majority control of the Australian Labour Party organisation, controlling its policies and controlling its pre-selections. It is inappropriate and out of date that Labour members of Parliament are forced to join a union. It is absolutely incredible that 70 per cent of the alternative government of Australia are former union bureaucrats. I often ask people across Western Australia, whose interests do you think an incoming Australian government will be focused on considering that it's made up by 70 per cent of former union bureaucrats. When in doubt, on those decisions hanging in the balance between the vested interests of a union movement, which is fighting for its survival, and your interest, between the vested interests of the union movement and the national interest, where do you think decisions by such an Australian government would go? Mr President, I put it to the Australian Labor Party that they have a responsibility to the Australian people to seriously review their structural relationship with the union movement. And until they have done so, it is unsafe for the Australian people to give them their confidence. The Australian people at the next election ought to consider very carefully what is in their interest and in the national interest when it comes to voting at the next election. The Howard-led coalition government has not only a strong record, it has a plan for the future. The alternative has 12 years of promises to their union leaders to pay back. The Senate stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.